Dear conference participants and guests, today at this conference we are celebrating the 91st birthday of Regina Azara and alongside it the contribution of women writers in Latvia and the Baltics and Eastern Europe. The pandemic denied the possibility to organize this conference a year ago as it was planned but two institutions that undertook the work the Institute of Literature, Folklore and Art of the University of Latvia and the National Library of Latvia were not ready to give up. I would like to remind to all of you that both institutions are located in the same building, jointly preserving cultural values of national significance and also contributing research to the international scholarly community. Today's event results from cooperation between three institutions. The third one, the Ministry of Culture of the Republic of Latvia, plays an important role in this project. Without its support, we would certainly not be able to gather on such a scale today. Thank you. Although the conference is held remotely, we are in a reach of a hand to everyone here, in Latvia and beyond. Live broadcast is provided not only by the organizers of the conference, but also by our informative supporters, Delphi, Satori, Punctum, Domuzime, Joaklis, Teatra Vesnesis, Kino Raksti, and Latvian literature. Thank you sincerely for your support. Distance not only separates, but also unites people. Let it be the guiding principle for all of us exploring literature, theater and cinema, and of course the legacy of Regina Azar. On behalf of the conference organizers, I have the honor to address the heads of all three institutions to honor the opening ceremony. It is my honor to introduce the Minister of Culture of the Republic of Latvia, Nauris Pontolis. Varētie konferences dalībnieki un klausītāji, latviešu prozas granddāma, prozas ragana, prozas mūķene, šie gan citu gan pašas piešķirtie apzīmējumi tiec izteikt un formulēt to, kas latviešu literatūrā ir Regīna Ezera. Dear participants and listeners, the grand dame, the witch, the nun of Latvian prose, these names assigned to her by herself and by others are mere attempts to express, to formulate what Regina Azara truly means for Latvian literature. Ja vecāk dod jau vārdā Regina, iezīmēt kā baldniece, karaliene, Regina Azara pirms skolas vecumā, kā zināms, vēl īsti neprasdam latviešu valodu, kļūt par vienu no izcilākajām latviešu valodas kopējām un bagātinātājām, par meisteri, kur prozas ietekmes teoriju stiepa stālu pāri gan viņas dzīves laikam, gan arī telpai, kurā tā tika radīta. Even her given name, Regina, marks her out as a ruler, a reigning queen, as we know, Regina Azara did not even speak proper Latvian before starting school, yet she went on to become one of the most impressive cultivators of and contributors to the Latvian language, a master whose prose covers territories far beyond her own time and the place it was created in. Budama prozes vodnētas Azara iekšēja palikdama brīva, Vienlaikas, kā pati formulējas, ir bijusi arī allažu pazemīga un padevīga kalpone viņas majestātei dzīvei un viņa majestātei darbā. Being the queen of prose, while maintaining her inner freedom, she was also, as she put it herself at all times, a humble and devoted servant to her majesty life and his highness work. Šodienas konferencē izvēlētā tēma apliecina, ka mērogs un konteksts, kurā var un vajag skatīt Regīnas Ezeras Daļradi, prasa plašu tvērumu, un šīs plašākais tvērums dos iespēju ieraudzīt jaunas, vēl neapzinātas rakursas viņas daļradē, un labāk saskatīt raksnītas lielam arī plašākā, veselā reģiona, Austrumeiropas kontekstā un samērojumā. 
The topic of today's conference is a testimony to the vast scope and contextual range that can and must be considered when approaching Regina Azar, Azar's body of work. And this vast scope might give us an opportunity to notice new yet unexplored aspects of her writings and to better access the writer's significance in a wider context and reference system, namely that of the entire region of Eastern Europe. Taču visplašākās teorijas, ko spēj skartu un pārvaldīt literatūru, kā zinām, spēšas nevis uz āru, bet uz iekšu. Cilvēka dabā un pasaulē viņa dvēseles un zemapziņas dziļumos, kur zem neievērojams, pat šķietami labklājīgas virspuses, nereti zemdegās grūzi nepateikts un aizturēts brīžām iznīts no šjūtu spēks. However, the greatest territories that can be reached and governed by literature, as we know, are not the ones spanning the outside world, but the ones within, in human nature and culture, in the depths of our soul and subconscious. There, under unremarkable and seemingly prosperous surface, often smolders a silent, restrained, at times destructive force of human emotion. Un šīs iekšējās Zemdegas savā romānā Zemdegas mums ir meistarīgi atklājusi tieši Regīna Azara ar šo darbu ieņemdama arī godam pilnīto vietu Latvijas kultūras kanonā. And it is precisely Regīna Azara, who so masterfully has described to us this inner smolder in her novel Zemdegas, with which she uh, earned her rightful place in Latvijas cultural canon. Prakšnēc pat ir teikusi, ka šodienas provincē nav mazāk kaislību un jūtu, liktenīgas mīlestības un atriebīgas greizsirdības, šaubu un neprāta, nesautīgumu un plēsonības, cildenumu un varaskārs kā visos iepriekšējos gadsimtos. The writer herself once stated that in today's province passions and emotions, fatal love, vengeful jealousy, doubt and madness, Selflessness and predation, honor and lust for power are as prevalent as in any other century. Tikai ne no augzimušām ģimenēm, bet no sohoza un PMK, no SCO un patērētāju biedrības un lai šo šķietam necilos neievērojamos cilvēks padarītu nemirstīgs ir vajadzīgs tik ļoti maz, ir vajadzīgs vienīgi Šekspīrs. Not only among nobility, but also among sovkhoz laborers, workers in mobile mechanized columns, intercohoz organizations and consumers unions, and rendering these seemingly plain and unremarkable people immortal requires so little. It requires only Shakespeare. Un šodienas kontekstā te var droši piebilst mums latviešiem Regīna Eze. Viņas darba veiksmīgi turpina apliecināt lielā kritiķa laika, in today's context, we can see similarly say, we Latvians need Regina Azar. Her works continue to successfully justify the high appraisal of the greatest critic of all time. Šodien turp pa 20 gadus kopš rakstnētas dēlsies mužībā, mēs redzam, ka viņas darba klātbūt un kultūras procesos, kā arī ietekmu uz lasītāju, nav mazinājusies. On this day, nearly 20 years after the passing of the great writer, it is clear that the presence of her works in our cultural life and her impact on the reader was not veined. Varbūt pat tieši otrādi, šodienas nelīdz sarotajā samilzušo kolīzīju pasaulē vēl palielinājusies, jo daudz no rakstnēs skartajām tēmām arī tai paudzēja, kas nākas jau labu laiku pēc viņas, ļauj labāk saprast šodien aktuālos procesus, vardarbības, nodevības, mēlu radītas traumas, vientulību. Possibly it has even increased since in the current and stable world of growing conflict, many of the subjects discussed in her writing can help following generations long after her to better understand the issues so pressing in society, such as trauma and loneliness, caused by violence, betrayal and lies. Arī filma un teātra izrāžu varoņos pārtapušie ezaras darbi un radītie tēli joprojām uzrunās, karot arī šodienas cilvēku pasaules izjūtu 
pandemii s psychologickou bláku z Hatea Pasole. The characters of her works adapted for film and theater also remain appealing and relevant when considering the current state of our perception of the world altered by the psychological side effects of the pandemic. Regina Cezar sastātais mantojums ir patiesa auglīgs un rosinošs. Tas joprojām kvēlo izplata radošu impulsu dzirkstils un uzplaiksnī mūsdienu aktīvajā radošajā sabiedrībā, kā to labi redzam šobrīd. Regina Azar's legacy is truly fruitful and inspiring. It still glows, spreading sparks of creative impulse and shines brightly from within our contemporary creative community, as we can see at this very moment. Nebūt nekā formāla nodama rakstnētas apaļai jubilējai, ir adušies jauni, nozīmīgi literāri un mākslas dārbi, ir iznācis Regina Azar's prozas, iedvesmot šodienas pēc Azar's paaudžu autoru radīs sāstu krājums Re Regīna Ezera, tika sarīkots viņai veltītas punktu un festivāls ar performanciem, koncertiem, lekcijām un diskusijām, teātri iestudē pēc Ezeras darbiem veidotas izrādes. It is not merely a formal obligation to mark the writer's significant anniversary that has provoked the creation of new important works of literature and art. Regīna Azara has inspired the recently published collection of stories Re Regīna Azara, written by authors representing post-Azara generations. Performances, concerts, lectures and discussions were dedicated to her at the Punktum Festival. Theatres haven't ceased putting on plays based on Azara works. Nākāt arī jauna tūkojuma svešvalodās, kas pavēr mūsu izcilās prozēģis darbiem plašāk ceļu ne tikai Austromēropas telpā, kur tie jau pieejam un pazīstam, bet arī rietumos. Un tas viss paplašina prozes valdnētas regīnas teritorijas un uz rakstnēs simtgadu, kas zina aktuāli kļūst startautiska konference Regīna Ezera un Rietumēropas līdzi. New translations are opening even wider the doors for our excellent prose author, not only in Eastern Europe, where her works are already accessible and recognized by readers, but also in the Western world. All these events contribute to the expansion of the prose queen Regina's domain, and it, is, and it just might that her 100th birthday will be celebrated with an international conference titled Regina Azara and Western European Literature. Taču šodien lai visiem izdodas piedzīvot iedvesmojošu un avlī konferenci, kas atklāja jaunas aspektus Regīnas Ezeras mantojumā. But today, may everyone have an inspiring and fruit-bearing conference that allows us to uncover new facets of Regīna Ezeras legacy. Rakstnēs turpina valdīt un vest gan latviešu lasītājs, gan lasītājs citās zemēs pašas radītajā cilvēku psiholoģisko un fantasmagorisko zemdegu pasaulē, ar saviem darbiem padarot mūsu saprotošākus, empātiskākus un līdzsietīgākus šajā grūti izprotamajā un pretrunu pilnajā reālajā pasaulē. She continues to rule and guide readers in Latvia and abroad through the smoldering world of human psychology and fantasy with her writings urging us to become more understanding, empathic and compassionate. Thank you. Uh, please join me in welcoming the head of Institute of Literature, Folklore and Art of the University of Latvia, Eva Eglāja Kristsone. The floor is yours. Please turn on the sound. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, thank you, Janis. Mm. Dear Minister, dear Director of the National Library of Latvia, dear conference organizers and participants, for the Institute of Literature, Folklore and Art of the University of Latvia, this is a significant and much anticipated conference, which I assume, due to it taking place online, will gather a broad and geographically limitless viewership. Regina Azar is a crucial figure in the history of Latvian literature and its contemporary developments. What I would describe as her magic shines forth to this day from the theatre performances and cinema, from the writings of her successors, 
leaving unique marks not only in Latvian women's writing. And of course, magic will never stop shining from Ezra's best works. Ezra's stories, novellas, novels, and diaries, while making use of details particular to her era, are timeless in their deep and vibrant depictions of interpersonal relationships and nature. As the queen of Latvian prose, she is as notable a research subject as any other remarkable Baltic and Eastern European writer. I am delighted to see the immense diversity of topics covered in this conference. By the promising keynote speakers, colleagues from Estonia and Lithuania, and every single scholar with a unique research perspective who will, no doubt, ensure that these two days are full of excitement. All this was made possible thanks to the organizing committee. My good colleagues, Karl Svertin, Jan Suezolinc, Artis Ostups, and Divar Steinbergs, remained determined throughout these past two years, carefully working on the program, program and put together and promoted the conference alongside our partners at the National Library of Latvia, represented by Anda Baklan. Partly deliberately, Partly by accident, the Institute has, over the last five years, become a host of national and international conferences dedicated to women writers. Andre Neibor, Gamonta Kroma, Velta Snicker, and Regi Nazar. It could be now called a tradition, uh, which was provided uh, challenges, satisfaction, and motivation for future initiatives. I hope that the speakers and listeners can approach this event with venturous curiosity, empathy, professionalism, and a sense of humor. For these are the values Regina Azar has always represented for me. I sincerely hope you enjoy these two days of debate and virtual networking. Thank you for your participation. Thank you, Eva. I kindly invite the head of the National Library of Latvia, Andris Vilks, to close our welcome addresses. Dear Mr. Minister, dear Eva Eglaya, dear distinguished participants, among all scientific and cultural institutions, national libraries are unique uh, for their universal appeal. They collect and safeguard the entire of published sources, whether they be scientific, artistic, historical, or social artifacts. For this reason, national libraries usually project several, sometimes mutually contradictory identities. Science and literature are two worlds that occasionally meet, but mostly remain distant from one other. another. Science strives for precision, great clarity, and objective truth, while literature is allowed to be unpredictable, aimless, and subjective. Nonetheless, there are several aspects that these different fields do share. For instance, just like science, literature also welcomes research and discovery. In their works, writers are able to explore and describe the mechanisms underlying human psyche and social systems. Writers are engineers and architects of language capable of inv inv inventing new languages and forms of com uh, communication. Like science, literature generates knowledge and understanding necessary to exist within extremely complex structures, namely civilization and cultures. In her essays, Regina Azara describes her written work as research, the study of human thoughts, uh, worldviews, and emotions. She writes, contemporary outline of the human inner world is a task that requires a new approach on the path of exploration errors are to be expected. That path is not traversable without trial and error. 
and uh, unsettled issues, difficulties, and new discoveries. Ezer is known in Latvian literature as an author who has produced impeccable, detailed, precise, and modern descriptions of the internal world of human emotions. One could say that her artistic subjectivity is manifestly scientific in nature. Moreover, she is known to be one of the most uh, profilic innovators in prose. Ezra is both one of the creators of the Latvian novel writing tradition and a disruptor and reformer of the novel genre. This force of creation seems particularly admirable given the fact that Ezra became a writer in a, a time and place where art had to follow the aesthetic doctrine of social realism. Soviet literature has no shortage of strained identity right, uh, writers, uh, untruthful, moralizing, and boring examples of writing. It is full of white spots and of awareness. However, despite censorship and self-censorship, Soviet Latvia was also able to garner great works of literature. Regi Nazar undoubtedly is one of the brightest examples of this. Evaluating Soviet literary legacy is no easy task. We cannot look at the literary works created during this period merely from the aesthetic perspective. Invitable the writer's relationship with political power most must be considered. Besides, it is rarely appropriate to apply a simplistic analysis by merely distinguishing the supporters of the regime from the dissidents. As well as journalism of the 60s and 70s features material, material proof of the author boss voicing loyalty to Soviet ideals and attempt, attempting to cry, uh, criticize the dogma of the social realism doctrine. Possibly as a, as a most consistent ideological conviction is that she never failed carving her own path. I will conclude my speech with two quotes from Regi Nazar's autobiographical work title uh, were titled Some uh, Truths, A Few Lies. Uh, quotation. I have not yet ceased to be surprised when I see poetry surface from within prose. When I hatches like the moon peeling back the skyline, comes forth out of a lover, loft like a tear, shoots up like a jet from a, a gazer as Emotions come to a boil and overflow. I has influ it, it has influenced me, poisoned me. I'm finished. I try to avoid sin. I don't always succeed, but there be sin. Big deal. Sin, it is so sweet after all, but maybe it, is, it isn't even sin. And second morning, tranquility rolls up near, near empty, no fuss, like an ogre, virzgale, intercity bus. I wish you a successful conference full of new, uh, full of new insights. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And now I uh, give the floor to my colleague, Artis Ostops to open the first plenary session. Good morning, everyone. It is my great pleasure to introduce our first keynote speaker of the day, Professor Sanya Bakun from University of Essex, United Kingdom. Sanya Bakun's expertise is international modernism, and her research interests include theory of comparative arts, world literature, psychoanalysis, and women's and gender studies. In 2014, Oxford University Press published her monograph, 
Modernism and Melancholia, Writing as Counter Morning. Sanya Bachon is also a co editor of multiple books on modernism, avant garde, violence, gender, and ideology, as well as an author of many scholarly articles in great journals. The title of her keynote talk today is Cassandra's Anew, Women's Writing and Strategies of Resistance. And as I have been told, she will also mention the work of Regina Azer in her talk. Without further ado, please welcome Sanya Bachun. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Artis, and, and thank you to all. Um, I hope you can see see and hear me well. Uh, maybe a nod can <laughs> confirm that. Thank you. Um, now, um, first of all, um, thank you very much. I'd like to start with, with greeting everyone, saying good morning to everyone. La Brit. Uh, unfortunately, that's about the only word I know in Latvian, but I'm very hopeful I'll learn more over the course of next two days. Uh, this is a great opportunity and a great pleasure for me, and I would like to thank the Institute of Literature, Folklore and Art of the University of Latvia and the National Library of Latvia for honoring me with this invitation and the Ministry of Culture of Latvia for supporting it. So, as I said, a great pleasure to be with you today, albeit in digital form. Um, I was looking forward to discovering Latvia and Riga in person, but the pandemic conspired against that wish. However, as many speakers have already pointed out, the digital format also has its um, secret benefits. And, and the key one of these is that it makes access easier and therefore democratizes and widens the audience, um, including those audiences that cannot uh, plug in at the moment when the talk is delivered, but can do so later. Um, and I'm particularly keen to greet those audiences as well, because I know that many of them could be child carers, as I am, working people who have other work obligations at the moment, um, and um, other people who simply cannot join in directly. So I greet both those who are with us at this moment synchronously and those who will join us later. And what follows, I will take you on a journey through women's writing, a woman's writing or women's writing. Um, there will be a constant shift between singularity and plurality here. And I would like to take you on a journey through Eastern European women's writing in particular, loosely focalized through a specific mythic female figure, that of Cassandra. En route, I may say things that are very familiar to you or things that are very unknown to you. And I hope the blend of the two will keep you interested um, even in this um, digital format. So here we go. Cassandra, the fairest and wisest of Priam's daughters and one of the rare female oracles or prophetic witches of whom we have an extensive, if tantalizingly scattered account is said to have had her ears purified by Apollo to understand the sounds of nature and learn about future omens. Her name in Greek, Cassandra, means she who entangles man. And it is literally this capacity that causes her tragic fate, a myth upon which generations of storytellers, writers, artists, and recently filmmakers have expanded. On the occasion of an unfortunate nightly sojourn in Apollo's temple, Cassandra rejected the zealous god's advances, whereupon Apollo not so much invalidated as rescinded his gift, leaving Cassandra with the tragic legacy of a gift revoked. The fate of one who has the ability and desire to foretell and to tell us the languages of the birds, but whose prophecies albeit true, are disbelieved. As various Greek myths reiterate, Cassandra's plaintive and violent cries foretelling political and private calamities ranging from the fall of Troy to the killing of Agamemnon were ignored by her compatriots and their enemies alike, by her own family and by other women. 
she came to be regarded as deranged, or else she might have indeed sunk into madness faced with that continual disbelief. And aptly, contemporary psychology has designated a comparable neurotic state, the Cassandra effect. The myth of Cassandra opens itself to an extraordinary variety of interpretations. Less romantic and more violent than the tale of Helen of Troy, the myth of Cassandra is first a story about the attempts to conquer the female body and about the consequences of that violent conquest, of a series of suitors who slay each other, of a fanatical and vengeful god, of psychological violence and mockery, of being imprisoned by one's own father and being raped by an unpitting enemy, of serving as a currency in the settling of post-battle accounts, of forced emigration and sexual captivity, of the final murder of a woman and her children by another woman, all of which the myth insists with inexorable determination, Cassandra is allotted the tragic fate to foresee herself. As such, the tale is a variation on a particularly popular pattern of mythic fabulation, um, the wide diffusion of which anthropologists suggest serves a discursive corroboration of a more or less global move from the matriarchate to the patriarchate. It is a story of a mythic heroine's insubordination to a male divine and or its secular representatives and the tragic cost she must pay for this deed. It is noteworthy though, that Cassandra's story differs from the general template, insofar as disquietingly, no representative of patriarchal power is redeemed in the course of the story. In all accounts about her, including those that attempt to attribute to Cassandra those of fickleness, Cassandra emerges as a victim of patriarchy, and the victim endowed, surprisingly, with the virtues of dignity and defiance. For this reason, she was a particularly apt figure to be reappropriated by 20th century feminists who saw in the mythic heroine a paragon of femininity's disruptive power. But there are other significations that make this particular myth of lasting interest for both artists and scholars. A dual mediator between the divinities and the humans, Cassandra is in fact a knowing, if ultimately ineffectual, conveyor of bird speech to humans, birds being understood as transmitters of divine prophecies and those guarantees of the link of the balance between the congregation of animals and the congregation of humans. Her tale then could be seen as a mythic correlative of the human failure to establish a meaningful link between themselves and divinities but also between the nature they inhabit and the culture they create. A kind of miscommunication that provides incentive to, in particular, the recent production of female authors globally, and that, as you well know, Ezra was very keen to address. Does the story of Cassandra's doomed prophecies can also be seen as marking one of those politically charged moments in which the purported dichotomy of nature and culture inscribed itself in our imaginary and which got further attached problematically to the binary of the female nature and the male principles. Furthermore, while there are no specific accounts of the poetic merit of Cassandra's prophesizing, although mythic accounts do attribute to her speech rare expressiveness, rare embodied expressiveness, and while she is probably speaking more an interpreter of other speech, um, so the speech of those others, like birds, um, uh, maybe we could call her a scholar with the gift of particularly disruptive enunciation of the others. So she's more properly speaking an, an interpreter than a creatrice herself. And although that might be true, the myth of Cassandra has most frequently been invoked in discussions and representations concerning female visionary power and female creativity, those bewitching qualities that Ezra professedly uh, embodied in her own prose. 
Such interpretation of Cassandra is indebted to a particular challenge posed by both Aeschylus's contraposition in Agamemnon of the chorus speech, so rational speech of unproblematic temporality, the voice of male elders, and Cassandra's speech, which is mantic, pictorial, almost impenetrably figurative, uh, indiscriminately fusing temporalities. So there's a strong um, juxtaposition if you if you look up, as I always recommend, never enough reading of, of ancient Greek literature. Um, if you look up Agamemnon, you will see these very strong contrapositions of the choral speech and Cassandra's speech. And then also the chorus's incessant effort to establish a rhetoric of dialogue between the discourses so as to understand that fate that Cassandra prophesizes because the chorus actually knows better they know that they need to listen to that female voice so in mediating what Cassandra foresees the Aeschylus's chorus attempts to impose a rationalist male discourse and the associated type of hermeneutics upon the prophetess's words but it is hard. Sometimes the meanings of the words lead us for a long, long time, especially if they are very expressive. They're hard to get to. So in her function as the embodiment of the other speech and as a violated female body speaking subject, this dismissed prophetess has also become a feminist icon of numerous female writers and artists worldwide who um, so in her fate something of their own. And tales of this and other Sibyls have repeatedly been reappropriated as a tale of the female artist as visionary, their fate being seen as paradigmatic of the position of the female artist in the chiefly male organized official culture. And I'll have more to say about that later. Finally, Cassandra is also remembered as a doomed political agent whose ardent, perduring warnings are greeted not only with public defamation, but also with the oppressive censoring mechanisms of a skeptical, blind power. Reflecting on her own refabulation of Cassandra's tale in the context of the Cold War, the Eastern German writer Christa Wolff mused that Cassandra must have loved Troy more than her own life when she dared to prophesy the, the downfall of her own home city to her fellow countrymen. So she must have loved her country, country state, uh, more than her own life, because she dared to prophesy knowing that she won't be believed. Wolf, I think, is perceptive. For the myth of Cassandra is also an extended allegory on political social meanings attached to femininity, nationhood, censorship and political and artistic voice, and the role of artists in any society, I would add. So how have Eastern European women writers of the 20th and 21st centuries responded to those readings, and more generally the meanings and dynamics they impart? Now, the first thing I like to note is the difference in their positionality in comparison to their Western peers. Mid to late 20th century Eastern European women, women writers often found themselves both sympathizing with and genuinely not understanding the calls to action of their Western peers. Notably, Anglo-American women writers' demands for equal pay for equal work, access to all professions, abortion rights, and right to divorce at no detriment to wife. Having acquired all these rights early in the course of the 20th century, Eastern European women writers tended to have less propagandistic tone to their feminist pursuits. They were, as a rule, more appreciative of the more nuanced strand of French feminism, which looked at the hidden hierarchies and patterns of dominance and sexism in everyday life, including those that belied the surface equality in select professions, including creative writing itself. Many, like Regina Ezra herself, turn these interests into concerns with the specific position of a female writer or a female creator in a male-dominated intellectual, academic and creative industries. They highlighted that this position belied the surface equality and that 
for deep reasons that have to do with the depreciation of female intellect and of the alternative affect or emotion driven ways of cognizing and expressing the world that are often although somewhat stereotypically associated with femininity that for all these reasons their position as female writers amounts to that of a Cassandra allowed to speak but doomed for her words not to be taken seriously. I find it indicative that if one takes quantitative data cumulatively across the spectrum of Eastern European socialist countries in 1960, there were more female professionals in mining industry than professional female writers. This is by quantitative data. The same data tells us that by contrast, female copy editors deployed in that fundamental support role for writers and journalists but denied their own voice outnumbered their male counterparts by almost a double the writing profession where they could make some inroads were those heavily regimented fields of journalism and in particular what was considered its minor genre namely children's magazines journalism and I'm pointing out the 1960 as a year because it is in this context that Regina Shamretto, with the pen name Regina Ezera, started her career. Second to these uh, for Eastern European women writers was the thematic concern with the position of a woman as a carer, most often a child carer. I should remind you of Ezra's positionality as a working single mother of three and that the theme of motherhood in all its glories and challenges dominates her fiction. I think that if young Ezra were with us today, she surely won't be able, wouldn't be able to join us um, um, directly, uh, synchronously as it were, because she would be ushering her children to school or, or to the nursery. So, it is um, to those mothers, working mothers, um, that I dedicate this little aside. So, woman is a carer, I said, a child carer, but also carer for elderly, disabled, weak, for those under-recognized or under-supported by society. And I would say a carer for society as such. It is this last property resonating again with the story of Cassandra that became an important embodied positionality for female writers in Eastern Europe. They were the carers for the continuous well-being of society, a care that implied raising their voice against what they perceived as injustice or inequality, and a care that implied thinking about the humanistic and environmentalist future of society in ways that allied their goal, elided their goal-driven counterparts. Symbolic practices like art production are a means to express the nomos, that set of social narratives and interactions that, according to Robert Cover, locates and constitutes an illegal or political system. And art production gives observable, emotionally compelling form to the demands of nomos. The arts thus establish a particular rapport with justice-related practices in society, a relationship that is one of both interdependence and opposition, as well as one of supplementarity. For art may draw attention to inequities committed by laws or states' exclusions, overt or covert, or it can, when the legislators are keen to listen, help law, help state prosper. As carers for society, Eastern European women writers, like their counterparts in the West, saw their particular role in serving, I quote, and you know whom, Her Majesty, life. So serving Her Majesty, life, and relaying the psychological textures of intimate experience that often escape anthropologically abstracting records of their male counterparts. I know that my colleague Sandra Meshkova will address these in, in the next lecture. More often than not, Eastern European women writers follow Cassandra in interpreting, I quote, the speech of birds, I quote from Aeschylus D. 
So interpreting the speech of birds implies highlighting environmentalist and ecological concerns and the fundamental interpenetration of nature and human culture and precarious balances that characterize it. As there was among the more astute interpreters of this kind in her short fiction collection, Dragon's Egg. And I, I believe we'll hear some papers on that topic. I'm looking forward to it. Eastern European women writers also treated themselves as vigilant keepers of oral historical memory. Most often, as in Ezra's, there were three of them, or more recently, uh, Russian Elena Chizhova's uh, The Time of Women, most often across generations of women. Um, and, and for some reason, it is always invariably three generations of women. And there's a whole question why that's three generations, but generations of women. And they also saw themselves as privileged recorders of society's highs and lows, including the achievements and pitfalls of the socialist project in which they participated themselves. As the socialist states transformed one by one in the 1990s, with the degrees of negotiation and trauma attached to this transformation spanning from civil wars to peaceful signing of agreements, female writers found themselves in yet another role memory keepers in another way, crucial to the negotiation of transition realities. The label transition, as you know, is generally attached to societies that transit from a totalitarian regime or a conflict to a more pluralistic type of governance and a peaceful and just society. The questions of justice, of just society, figure prominently in transitional periods, and they are integrally linked to the society's dual effort to bring justice to the past through redistribution and recognition, and to ensure the continued practices of fairness in the future. This is the field of transitional justice, and I have often maintained that women writers have a particularly important role to play in that field, whether they have willfully subscribed to such efforts or their writings were summoned for such efforts without their explicit wish or intent. This is because peace building and just society building implies a particularly charged relationship with the past and necessitate attempts at finding the path between too much memory and too much forgetting. Um, this is from Mino, a um, scholar of law. So finding the path between too much memory and too much forgetting is what I would say a really good force field for a woman writer. It is in identifying and traversing that path that the function of the arts is most visible. And it is in that function that female writing, so closely connected to intimate realities and oral history, is an excellent witness. Thus used, literary practices and artworks by Eastern European female writers of 20th and 21st centuries have both assisted recognition of past injustices, memorialized them, or contributed to psychological reparation and testified to the very social challenges of transition, measuring satisfaction and evaluating the transitional processes themselves. Now, all of this social function brings to the surface the significant question of form in which such corrective utterances may be expressed. While, in general, Eastern European women writers were appreciative and adoptive of the French feminism's call to feminine language, l'écriture féminine, and they were appreciative of formal raptures, theirs is very often a delicate formal intervention, which one learns to detect and appreciate over the course of time. And I'd like to reiterate this, a delicate formal intervention, because I think it describes very well a kind of formal innovation that Ezra, over the course of decades, pursued. Eastern European women writers' innovative strategies most often circle around the relaying of psychological realities through a language that mimics processing of reality in our mind, and in particular processing of traumatic reality. Theirs is a patient, stubborn exploration of the concatenation of words and phrases that create literary reality for us, prophetess-like, as Azera was bound to do. 
To this aim, they often also experiment with focalization of the narrative and bouncing against each other two focalizations or three focalizations and verbalization of the same event or condition, often from male and female perspectives. Again, a persistent trait in Ezra's writing. Eastern European female writers frequently recourse, as Ezra does, to metatextuality, probing their own female language as it comes into being in process and their own accomplishments as a writer. They look back and forth, often through rapid moves from narrative frames within an autobiographical or semi or quasi autobiographical framework, as Ezra, I understand, does in her late fiction, and writers like uh, Yugoslav Croatian Dubravka Ugrešić or Latvian writer Anita Liepa have made their signature traits. There's also an interest in intertextuality including bouncing their writings in tandem or against the male canonical Eastern European writers like Dostoevsky or um, generally um, male counterparts. Shakespeare is a particularly interesting uh, interlocutor for many of them. They often resurrect in intertextual spirit female mythic figures like Cassandra or Medea from global literary history heritage and often displace them in new realities um, as, as Krista Wolf does. Or they bury them in the palimpsestic accretion of literary discourses. So you have to unveil one after another those, those uh, aspects of those uh, or layers of those palimpsests and when you get, then you get the bottom line, um, uh, uh, an unoccluded female figure from literary heritage. Finally, they tend to experiment with the genre and mode of utterance themselves, pursuing genre blends of fiction and journalism, as in uh, Croatian Slavenka Drakulic or Georgian writer Anna Kordzaja Samadashvili's prose. They often weaponize satire, as Ezra herself did more than once, confessional writing, as Romanian Nora Yuga does in The 60-Year-Old Woman and the Young Man, they borrow structural components and figures from fairy tales, both Ezra and Ugrašić have done that to great effects. They recourse to children's literature to tell the truth for adults, like Estonian Ellen Mead, and irreverently fuse prose and poetry in a surreal and bewitching performance, as Ezra does in Smolder. Such formal explorations require a particularly attuned ear, I argue in conclusion. We are yet to learn, as readers, male and female, how to read women's writing. We are yet to learn how to appreciate the nuances of what is said, the craftsmanship and craftiness of the utterance, and the specific ways in which female writers have negotiated their place in literary history, or history as such. Cassandra's words may have not been listened to at the time, and her poetic speech may have been illegible to the assembled and passing by audiences. But she endures as an icon of what an alternative record and understanding of history may look like, and a perennial warning that we should listen to it. So with the invitation to listen, and to listen carefully to the words of a female artist, of an oracle. It is my pleasure to contribute to the opening of this conference on the work of Regina Ezra and Eastern European literature. Thank you. Thank you very much. <clears throat> uh, are we now proceeding to the next keynote? Yes. It is my honor to introduce the next keynote speaker of this plenary session. Uh, Sandra Meshkova is associate professor at Daugopils University, Latvia. She teaches courses related to literary theory, text interpretation, and the history of British and American literature. Her research interests are related to the spheres of autobiography and gender studies, comparative literature in the context of North American, British, and Latvian literature. 
Sandra Meshkova is the author of more than 80 publications in scholarly journals, research paper, paper collections, collective monographs, and author of two research monographs, uh, Subjects and Texts, or an English Subject and Text in 2009, and uh, Anita Liepa Dzivis Raksti, Anita Liepa, uh, Writing of Life in 2017. The title of her keynote speech today is Texture of Experience in Regina Azar's Early Prose Fiction. Please join me in welcoming Sandra Meshkova. Hello, dear colleagues, conference participants and distinguished guests. I'm really greatly honored to participate in this forum. It's also a great pleasure and a uh, um, wonderful opportunity to exchange ideas with uh, acclaimed scholars, experts in different fields that still are focused on Regina Azarus writing, women's writing, and uh, also this regional context of uh, East Europe, its literature and culture. And uh, my great gratitude to the conference organizers for making this possible, uh, for arranging and uh, uh, collecting you know, such very interesting uh, conference program addressing uh, so many scholars also from different countries so that uh, hopefully, uh, and I'm very sure of it, this forum will be very, very interesting. Uh, I'm also very greatly impressed by the previous uh, speaker, Sanya Bachun, uh, who provided not only a very broad picture, but a very deep dimension um, for considering women's writing in general. And uh, actually, it's very inspiring uh, to think about Regi and Azara's texts in uh, this connection to uh, women writer as a possible prophetess, uh, as a voice that uh, should be listened to, uh, a voice which could be warning against certain things uh, and also inspiring, inspiring and probably showing the way. Yeah. So, and I'm sure that really uh, such ideas uh, will be exchanged and appear and be discussed in uh, these two days. Uh, my presentation uh, focuses on Regina Azara's text. I read uh, early period writing uh, by her and uh, actually was really surprised in a pleasant way that um, so many interesting things concerning modernist technique, uh, concerning uh, very deep insights into this texture of human experience are present already in her uh, first collections of stories and not definitely in her novel Akka. So I will share my presentation. Uh, I will have quite a lot of uh, quotations. That's why it's better that they appear on the screen. And uh, I could start by um, saying a very obvious thing that uh, Regin Ezer is a veritable classic of Latvian literature of probably we could say all times and surely we'll get much proof of this statement in these two days. Her name will definitely remain in Latvian culture canon, not only in the direct sense of the word, as her novel Zemdegas Smoldering Fires is included in the official Latvian culture canon, but she will remain there as a writer who developed and diversified new tendencies in her contemporary Latvian prose fiction, nowadays termed as silent modernism, to use the term by Jura de Sprindite. Regineser belonged to the literary establishment. She was a member of Latvian Soviet Writers' Union, received several prestigious prizes of the Soviet period, yet this was not connected to ideological engagement. Nora Ikstena, a distinguished present-day prose fiction writer, in her book on Regina Azara's life and writing, Asamiba Regina, being with Regina, I quote in my translation writes, she could not have been an obedient first rank writer because her inquisitive spirit, talent, and obsession with language 
guided her to the depths of human existence and censorship could not reach so deep down. She was reproached for excessive psychologism and let alone, unquote. This is approved by awarding Azara the Order of the Three Stars, the highest award of independent Latvia in 1995, soon after the gaining of independence. A key to Regina Azara's success has been formulated by the writer's daughter, Aya Valodze, uh, stating that uh, her mother uses words to create a world. As Aya Valodze is also a prose fiction writer, then um, we can also take it as a uh, writer's uh, idea about another writer. And actually, then this is a very high praise. The author has produced 28 books, winning special acclaim by her novels, not actually by all her books, yeah, but especially starting with her uh, novel Akka, and then the following ones, and also short prose story collections. Uh, Azra's works have been translated into Russian, German, French, English, Lithuanian, Swedish, Italian, and also other languages. Regin Azar started publishing short prose fiction in periodicals in 1955, and in the 1960s she became a professional writer and a member of the Writers Union. Her last book was published after her death, so her writing spans half a century, and, uh, in, uh, and that happened in one of the most complicated periods of Latvian historical cultural tradition. As is the case with a number of highly acclaimed Latvian writers and poets whose early period of writing relates to the late 1950s, 1960s, works produced in these decades are nowadays treated as controversial or prone to reconsideration, reconsideration in the light of current debates concerning the trend of socialist realism. <clears throat> However, Azara's early published works have not become an object of this debate. Neither have they attracted much of present day critics and scholars attention, yet they are worth studying, especially in terms of the development of the writer's technique and growth of her mastership. So we will consider certain aspects of the writer's technique whereby she produces the effect of the rich texture of human experience in short story collections, Daugava Stasti, the stories of the Daugava, Aistak Gauvi Sudeni Aistak, the Gauvi water flows away, flows away, and novel Akka, the well. These are not very first works by the writer, and her contemporary critics noted that Azar's writing skills have greatly progressed over the first decade since the 1950s, mid-1950s. Yet the major turning point in her writing was marked by the novel Zemdegas, and that allows for considering the preceding period as an early formative stage. It has been broadly discussed that the time of mid-1960s in Latvian literature is marked by the growth of psychological trend in prose fiction. Uh, it's possible to read about it also in English in the collection Back to Baltic Memory that was published in 2008. And it, it was also um, noted by the uh, reviewers um, uh, of Azara, uh, Azara's works, uh, her contemporary uh, reviewers and critics, uh, also uh, some writers among them, uh, that the role of external events is reduced to minimum. And the writer's focus is on the inner world of characters, their feelings and experiences that are almost invisible in their external expressions. Reviewers refer to Azara's own statement that the depth of literature is mostly about its psychological depth. There is no problem in literature that could be regarded outside the prism of a literary character. And I quote uh, Regina Azara's statement, not to construct a hero as he needs to be, but depict him as he is, with all contradictions and doubts, agony and happiness, because literature for it to reach human heart and that is the specific objective of verbal art, must first and foremost be human." Unquote. Uh, critics also connect the psychological inclination of Azara's works to certain features of her technique, the specific compositional models of her story collections, the lyrical structure of her prose fiction, the significance of description, especially description of nature, echoing the state of mind and feelings of characters, 
the use of detail and expressivity of language. However, excessive attention to formal features in the late 1960s and 1970s was not welcome, as the canon of socialist realism, even in its soft version, would prioritize the depiction of conflicts stereotyped according to Marxist-Leninist ideology, so for example, class conflict, and the discussion of ideas and measuring them according to the ideological standards set by the Communist Party and circulated by official literary and critical nomenclature. Hence, the formal features were not discussed as such, but in a balanced relation to the ideas and thematic issues of the literary works. With a decreasing monopoly of the canonized framework of literary criticism and proliferation of critical contexts since the mid-1980s, the formal issues gained more and more attention, yet those were mostly the mature works by Azara that were studied from those new perspectives, leaving the writer's early texts in their shadow. In this presentation, I would like to focus on three aspects that reveal affinity of Azara's texts with modernist prose fiction, making them so interesting in the context of Latvian literature of that time. The sonorous component in description, multiplicity of narrative perspectives, and the complex temporal dimension of narrative. And here I mention the texts in which I will be considering these issues. The story, uh, Stories of the Daugava, as a second published collection, comprises four stories, Autumn Song, Shadow, Ice Floats, First Planted Tree, uh, written with a certain time distance. And these years uh, are also indicated after each text. The collection has an elaborate composition connecting all stories in a continuum regarding the place, the action is set in the vicinity of a small town on the bank of the river Daugava. And the time, the action in a subsequent story continues that of the previous one. For example, uh, the story Ice Floats depicts the life of a widow and her son after revealing the causes and conditions of the husband and father's death in the preceding story Shadow. Another way of connecting the text is by means of characters. A secondary character in one story becomes the protagonist in the subsequent one and vice versa. In this way, Azara creates a mini version of Faulknery and Jokna Patova in a province of Latvia of the 1950s and 60s, bringing out the themes of interconnectedness of human lives, the complex interactions of human and his her environment, the ambiguity of human experience, that will be elaborated into deeper and even more complex variations. Each story depicts a crucial time in the main character's lives, delving into dramatic collisions conditioned by complex social and psychological factors. Now, uh, let's start with the uh, first aspect of the sonorous picture uh, in the narrative. In the first story of the collection, uh, Daugava Stasti, uh, autumn song, it is already the title that highlights the sonorous aspect of the narrative that is one of the landmarks of Azara's prose fiction. The story starts with a scene of a, the protagonist who is a resin collector in the forest returning home from his late night round. Uh, and I quote uh, in my translation, this is descended from the bicycle and listened. Trees were rustling around. He could even recognize their voices. Birch trees whistled, asps whispered, and from time to time a maple would clap its yellow leaf hands. Uh, interrupt quote. The sonorous picture is combined with the colors. And I continue quoting. Darkness was hiding under trees. Just above the forest, night had placed a huge glimmering dome with twinkling autumn stars. Pale shades of color. Serene slumberous rustle. Symphony of Forest Colors and Sonorous Night, end quote. Against the background of this lively scene of the nightly forest referred to as symphony, an intruding noise is heard. I continue quoting. Unexpectedly, a new unfitting sound broke into it, a child's cry. This is listened with astonishment and even fright. Looked at his wristwatch. The hands of the watch gleamed, showing five minutes to 11. A dark autumn night, the very heart of the forest. No, he must have mistaken it. 
whence could a child happen to be here? But as if responding to his doubt, the voice grew louder. It seemed to call and summon a small piteous voice." End quote. The description of the sounds and colors of the nightly forest introduces the scene of Dizis meeting the daughter of his beloved woman, Anita, about whose existence he has been unaware. He finds the child lost in the forest, takes her to his hut where she sleeps overnight, and in the morning they find the girl's home. The encounter inevitably leads to learning the truth silenced so far by Anita, confusion following it, and parting of the lovers who had been planning to get married. Thus, the scene sets in motion the action representing a drama of a love affair. As discussed by Mike Ball concerning description in narrative, traditionally description has been treated as interruption of the flow of narrative in terms of decelerating the time of discourse and the time of reading. But Ball argues that for description to be generative of narrativity. This is well exemplified in realist narrative where the environment, milieu, conditions of action are presented in close connection to the processes proceeding in them and particular incidents within those processes. Being a resin collector and working in the forest, this is a man of nature who has met his woman, wishes to follow the natural course of events, but the sudden incident in his life destroys the resigned harmony, like the loud and piteous cries of the girl destroyed the initial harmony of sound and the nightly, in the nightly forest. The breaking up between Didis and Anita is revealed in several episodes based on the juxtaposition of speech and silence. First, it was Anita who kept silent about her child. When the lovers meet after the truth is revealed, Didis leaves in silence. As Anita bursts out with her story, explanations and excuses for not having told everything from the start, Didis fails to react and his speech fails to express what he has been thinking and feeling in recent days. In between, there is an episode when Anita secretly comes to the hut in the forest where Didis stays overnight when making late rounds. She is at a loss how to make things right, imagines talking to Didis, tries writing a letter to him, and by accident drops a kerosene lamp and the hut catches fire. I quote, Anita imagined this as being here, hearing her voice, and she was telling everything. He was listening patiently, he was not leaving, and all will be well, nothing bad had happened, just a nasty dream. Dizzy, honey, she said to the dark walls of the hut. She shuddered from her own voice. It sounded so strange when there was nobody to listen, unquote. As revealed in the following scenes, Anita's attempts at talking the situation over fails, silence prevails, leading to the breakup of lovers. In the episode of their last meeting, the melody of the forest restores itself through silence contrasted to the joyful shouts of the girl as they wait for the bus to arrive and take mother and daughter away. I quote, Sarmita ran away joyfully shouting, rustling the fallen leaves. Didis and Anita stood looking at each other. It seemed easier when Sarmita was chattering here. Words were not needed then. Now there were no words. Silence again. No wind whip around. But the half bare tree was dropping one leaf after another. They fell from branch to branch, softly rustling, and then drifted down to the ground with light buzz. It sounded like music, tender, soft, and sad. The autumn was singing its song." Unquote. What cannot be said between people, the silent undercurrent that at some point blows up the scaffolding holding together two persons, male and female, two diverse generators of illusions, dreams, projections, is thematized in this story through the poetics of sound and silence. According to Mika Ball, description institutes the subject-object split in the narrative, detailing the focalizing subject's perception of the object and elements constituting it. This function of description is very important in the novel Akka, the Well, and the sonorous picture plays an important role in it. The novel depicts an encounter of a Dr. Rudolfs who has come from Riga to spend his vacation in the countryside, resting by the lake, fishing, and Laura, mother of two children, whose husband is in prison for unintended murder. 
During Rudolf's summer vacation, they meet several times. The reason is a boat that Rudolf occasionally borrows for fishing. They fall for each other, but Laura finds it hard to give in to her feelings and finally rejects Rudolf's advances. The opening episode of the novel shows Rudolf's coming to the homestead to Omarini to ask for a boat. He comes at sunset and first meeting no one, looks around the homestead, which seems very old and deserted, more like a museum that has no residents, only things and objects owned by them long time ago. The impression of desolation vividly described in the opening of the scene is enhanced by the silence. Quote, only distant sounds, more distinct or muted, reach the place. On the other shore of the lake, somebody was hooting, Cows were bellowing in desire for their shed, but there was a, but here even a dog did not run to meet Rudolph's. He stopped trying to discern voices or any other sign of life, yet nothing could be heard around him. Tomarini seemed deserted, unquote. As Rudolph moves around the house and into the garden, the scene comes to life by way of sounds. First, it is the beating of an age-old wall clock. Then he hears children's voices laughing and shouting, Finally, the sound of saw leads him to the shed where he meets Laura. Uh, quote, Suddenly, the silence was broken by shrieks of a saw. Rudolph's cast a look around. The sounds came so far as he could judge from the shed. For some reason, Rudolph was certain that, uh, that the one sawing would be a man who would be most appropriate for settling the deal he had arriving to Tuomarini. But he realized that it was a woman, unquote. The composition of the opening scene of the novel very specifically positions the subject-object split and the dispersion of objects in space. The character focalizer, which is Rudolph's, both observes the homestead and its surroundings and moves around it in search for a human object, somebody who could lend him a boat, an object which he will further move on the lake fishing and resting. Thus, the object is clearly positioned as a double object, human and material, and an object of desire, male desire for a female supplier of his needs. And it should be noted that the gender of a boat in Latvian is also feminine. Rudolf's remains the main focalizer throughout the novel, and the narrative generally flows, uh, follows his gaze, observing Laura, her looks, her action, her interactions with other characters, mainly her two children, her reactions to him. In some scenes, he seems to get closer to fulfilling the desire of capturing or possessing the object, or its attention at least, yet it always escapes. And in the final scene of the novel, Rudolf holds Laura in his arms, feeling her complete estrangement. The object, Laura, lake with fish, the homestead Tuomarini, remains ambiguous like a riddle that is not guessed or a quest which remains unresolved. I quote, her body in Rudolf's arms seemed like it was dead. They were very close and very distant. Rudolf wanted to object, to contradict, say that, but he realized that all words had grown trite. Trite, cheap, helpless, feeble. He was overwhelmed by deep sadness. He sunk into it like in a bog, while his hands were still stroking Laura's hair and Laura's shoulders, as if trying to hold something that was hopelessly slipping away from him and that he could not keep without breaking some essential core in Laura. He was standing on the shore for a long time. The last window went out, houses sunk into the dark of the night. The moon, shrunken and pale, was sifting blue dead light, and Rudolf thought how strangely it had changed everything. Tomarini against the sky looked like black debris, unquote. The final scene is introduced by a description of the coming night where the visual register creates a ghastly, irreal effect, but the sonorous register represents real sounds connecting to reality. And these uh, respective phrases are underlined. Maybe I will not read the whole quotation, but we see that night came with noise all around here and there was rustle and swish, Amid flows, he could hear waves washing against the shore and knocking the rim of the boat. Sand gritted under the bottom of the boat as he jumped out through the chain around the trunk of the willow, still scratched against the live bark, and he started mounting the shore. Mild, melodious tune, as if made by an old instrument, reached him coming from above. 
he realized that it was wind playing in the air, the sound growing louder in the breeze. The shadow thrown by the shed was like a huge pit. He sneaked across it. Laura was standing in the open doorway, unquote. The splitting between fantasy and reality marked by the visual and sonorous registers of imagery hints to Rudolf's state of mind as he is reaching for the object of his desire, but in reality, it is unattainable. The complexity, ambiguity, and volatility of the object are conveyed by the nexus of Laura, Homestead, Lake, reflected in several scenes closely observed by Rudolf's. Scenes of Laura bathing in the lake, Laura going uphill to the house, Laura standing in the doorway, drawing water from the well. Dispersing the object across the space focalized by the observing character represents his subjective vision as centered around his desire. Whereas the sonorous picture, sounds of nature, sounds made by actions of Rudolphs and other characters, brings in the dimension of reality, thus building a fine and complex multidimensional vision of the world. Now I pass over to narrative perspective. As concerns that, uh, Regina Azar's early works under study reveal its variations from that of the observing and reflecting hero in early stages to braiding multiple perspectives in the novel Aka, the well. Introducing a perspective of an onlooking hero in Latvian literature of the 1960s in general was an important move away from the doctrine of activism and active hero cherished by socialist realism. Expanding the character's vision of the surrounding reality happened along with the growth of psychologism in literature, which was, as mentioned before, so much emphasized by Azara. The observing hero prevails in the story of the Daugava. In the story Shadow, uh, Didzis, the protagonist of the first story of the collection discussed above, becomes a witness of the destruction of Oscars, his dormitory roommate, who has given in to the power of money, neglecting his wife and little son, moonlighting and engaging in illegal trade. Now, in the Soviet uh, times, uh, this moonlighting was usually condemned. Uh, it was not encouraged, though very often practiced, in order to make some extra money. The drama of Oscar's estrangement and untimely death by getting drowned in the Daugava is intensified by revealing the devotion and suffering of his wife Ilga, who has lived through the slow torture of alienation from her husband, witnessed his gradual degradation, and finally, when he seems to have achieved his goal, built a house, loses him. The climax of this drama appears in the scene when watching Ilga, Dedzis has an insight that she still loves her husband, despite all suffering he has caused her. And again, I will not quote, quote but uh, we see how uh, this is described exactly uh, following uh, Dedzis' gaze and uh, Ilga vanishing from this gaze, uh, finally approaching the railway station. Uh, Dizzy's understanding of Oscar's drama is limited. It is supplemented by Ilga telling about the lifelong dream of Oscar's parents for their own house, as well as dialogues where Oscar answers his mate's questions about the reason for his excessive efforts and refusal to lead an ordinary life instead of plodding towards fulfilling a dream, as it turns out, of several generations. At a time of communal flats, factory dormitories, long lines to wait for the free residential space granted by the socialist state, the theme of possessing one's own place, preferably house, but at least an apartment, was no doubt topical. The recent radical turn from private ownership to collective that happened in Latvia along with the return of the Soviet regime at the end of the Second World War needed to be discussed in the right ideological framework that of condemning the possessive strivings of some irresponsible anti-Soviet elements, I quote this very current phrase at that time, and confirming the worth of the collective property, collective life, collective space and practices. Instead of monologically condemning the possessive strivings and thus propagating the ideological positioning imposed by the Soviet false consciousness, Azara's text invites to read Oscar's story as dramatic, bringing into it a subjective dimension represented by the onlooking focalizer Didzis, Oscar's wife Ilga, and Oscar's himself, 
who functions as a focalizer in just one scene of the story, the scene shortly before his death. The scene starts with Oscars in his new house, lighting the stove. And uh, uh, the description creates an excess of the character's environment and his state of mind, suggestive of the thin verge between the external austerity and the light burning inside, yet opened and closed at his imposing and, as will, as will be revealed next, destructive will. The only feature clearly revealed in Oscar's perception as he goes out to fetch some water is alienation. And I will quote the second uh, fragment. Today is the October festival. There is a social in the forestry club on the other bank of the Daugava in the Kolkhoz community center. The dark November night is unusually loud, restless. The song died away in a distance, merged with the lapping of water, fizzled out. Yet Oscars was still standing there, unexpectedly feeling lonely." Unquote. It is noteworthy that even focalized by Oscars, the scene does not reveal why exactly he returned to the Daugava after extinguishing the fire in the stove and leaving the dog inside the house. In next scene, this is on his way past Oscar's house. He shouts for help, and when he comes with others to help, it is too late. They find Oscar's dead body in the water. The arrangement of narrative perspectives is exquisite. The limited vision of an onlooking character shows the top of the iceberg, Oscar's life as witnessed by people around him. The external focalizer establishes suggestive links between the external and internal experience of reality, whereas the single scene focalized by the protagonist reveals the core feature of his existence, alienation, that is both the cause of his death and the effect of his whole life. A similar arrangement of narrative perspectives is observed in the novel, The Well. Rudolf's perspective is focused on Laura and her surroundings, Laura's perspective focuses on her family, mostly her daughter, absent husband who is in prison, her mother-in-law and sister-in-law, and externally focalized scenes in the homestead Gubas where Rudolf is staying show an aged couple Putrami whose, whose small talk reveals important information about Tuomarini, where Laura lives, and the dramatic events of the past surrounding this homestead. Uh, Braiding uh, these uh, perspectives uh, forms a multidimensional narrative, revealing a Faulknerian picture of complex human interactions in their past and present dimensions. Simultaneously, several stories are told and several themes developed. The central story of Rudolf spending his vacation by the lake and falling in love with the woman he meets there relates to a story of Laura a mother of two children whose husband Richards is imprisoned for having accidentally killed a man while hunting in drunkenness. That in turn is related to a story of Alvin, Laura's mother-in-law, who had been a maid in Tuomarini before the Second World War, got pregnant by the would-be master of the house and had to leave it in disgrace. Returning to the half-ruined house after the war with a small son, Richards, whose sister was born from a former farmhand, Rainis, and who was murdered by Richards' father. This further relates to a story of Via, Alvina's daughter, a young woman who hates Tumarini, does not love her stepbrother, Richards, a rash drunkard, and tries to persuade Laura that she deserves a better life with a better man. So each of these storylines contains a drama or even tragedy, they belong to the past. Narration about the events in the present foregrounds Rudolf's observations of Laura's life as it happens in its external surface manifestations. Laura doing some household chores, going to her work in the nearby town and returning home, communicating with her little son and daughter. The limited vision of an onlooking character is supplemented by Laura's memories and insights as well as projections as she observes her daughter and mother-in-law whose silent rumination seems to Laura connected to Richards, the son and father who is present in his letters so much expected by both his mother and his daughter. The circle of each character focalizer leading to another, Rudolf's leading to Laura, Laura's leading to Alvin and Zyga, closes upon Laura's husband, absent but so distinctly present at the same time. 
The static quality of the narration achieved in this way creates the effect of impossibility for a change, impossibility to reach reciprocity, verbalized by Laura in the final scene of the novel. And I quote, why are we all unhappy? Laura passionately said in despair, with reproach addressed to somebody unknown. Why? Unquote. And I pass over to temporality. The temporal structure of the novel, The Well, is similar to that of a modernist narrative described by Paul Ricoeur in his time and narrative on the basis of Virginia Woolf's Mrs. Dalloway. I quote, as the narrative is pulled ahead by everything that happens, however small it may be in the narrated time, it is the same time pulled back, backwards, delayed, so to speak, by ample excursions into the past, which constitutes so many events in thought interpolated in long sequences between the brief spurts of action." Unquote. The effect of the intricate use of anachronies is that the total interval of the narrative, despite its relative brevity, seems rich with an implied immensity. All active events have happened in the past and appear in memory scenes and ellipses, focalized by Laura and her mother-in-law, Alvine. Alvin is returned to the ruined house she had to leave in disgrace when pregnant. Dramatic post-war years and the murder of Alvin's husband, Laura's life with Alvin's son Richards and the event leading to his imprisonment, also Rudolph's divorce from his wife and estrangement from his son. The present time of the narrative, the narrated time, is framed by Rudolph's coming to Tuomarini for the boat and meeting Laura, and their only and final embrace before parting. Long scenes focalized by Rudolph's observing Tuomarini and Laura and his introspections in, into his own past create the static effect of the slow and inconspicuous present, which like a top of the iceberg hides the dramas of the past that though unseen continue affecting the character's life. A similar model of the interrelatedness of the past and present appears uh, in the earlier work by Regina Azar, a collection of stories, The Gaoya Water Flows Away, Flows Away, published four years before the novel The Well. Like in the previously discussed stories of the Daugava action, in all stories of the collection is set near the river Gaoya, yet they are not otherwise interrelated in this collection. Both rivers are very special in Latvian cultural geography. The Daugava is the major river running through the center of Latvia, whereas the Gauja is surrounded by a romantic air and is associated with love and beautiful landscapes. Several stories in this collection depict a man meeting a woman he once loved and, heals and still loves, but the situation makes it clear that they won't stay together. The focalizer in these stories is the male protagonist who intentionally or incidentally comes to the woman's place, observes her, how she has changed, still remaining attractive. During the talk accompanied by the protagonist's memories, it is made clear how they were related and the woman by her body language, silence or hints informs the protagonist that he needs to leave. In several stories, the past dimension is related to the war, bringing in the historical time and its determining impact. The story Rita Osma at dawn demonstrates all the above mentioned features. It is set during the war under the Nazi occupation. In small hours, a man brings the newborn infant found by the railroad to the house of a woman he once loved, but who married his mate and has two children, one of them also a baby, so she can share milk between both infants. She remembers Martinch, but is worried about her husband, who is hiding in forest. Martinch knows that he was killed, the husband was killed in fusillade, but cannot tell it to Eva, so she remains with hope that one night her husband may come back. The story ends with a foreshadowing of Eva awaiting her husband. Martinch hoping that Eva, her children and infant will survive and have enough food. As one part of what is foreshadowed will never come true, the other part concerning their survival may also be doubted. And this gives a dramatic quality to the story along with certain fatality as Martinch leaves the house realizing that Eva would not welcome him back even under these dire circumstances. Another important aspect of temporality that emerges as central in the story collection is the phenomenological one, 
depicting the flow of time, juxtaposing instant and duration, bringing out its potential of building existential themes like passage of life, sense of fulfillment of life related to the sense of happiness as experienced in time. This is highlighted by using the book jacket, which wraps the book cover. On its inside flaps, there appears a text that conceptually wraps the whole book and very straightforwardly announces the theme of happiness, relating it to the experience of the passage of time using metaphors of wind and river that relate to representing the paradox of instantaneous events and their accumulation in movement, process, passage, paradox of sensation and experience. A version of this epigraph appears in the story Gaui Sakvarelis, the Gaui watercolor. The protagonist here is a young girl, Kaia, which means Gal in Latvian, who takes a swim in the Gaui and meets young man Arvids, who will soon be called up for service in the army, and gives her a kitten as a token for his wish that she would wait for his return after three years of service. The opening scene of Kaya bathing in the river repeats with some variation many images and notions from the epigraph. The white hot sand, birds crying, flow of the river and objects carried by its stream, longing. Giving into the flow of time like floating with the stream is juxtaposed to the daily events that follow, getting dressed, returning home, talking to Arvids and mother, cooking soup, feeding the, the kitten. Beyond the surface of daily routine, events that follow each other in the customary sequence, making small advances, exchanges and returns, there is the overwhelming sense of the flowing time, which is not yet recognized as passing by the young girl, as for her all lies ahead, anticipation of love, a relationship to be, budding womanhood. Gaia is so taken with this promising richness and generosity of time, of life, that even her mother is tempted to look into it. I quote, Kaya is singing without words, swaying lightly from side to side like a birch in the wind. And this strange melody, not recognized by the mother, suddenly suggests to her something light, familiar, and just slightly forgotten in the passage of these long years. Kaya is looking through the window. And all at once, the mother wants to know what her daughter sees there. She comes closer. She is standing behind Kaya's back and looking over her shoulder. But there is really nothing outside, nothing worth watching without turning eyes away, nothing that wouldn't have been seen a hundred and thousand times before. Down there among the dark oaks flow the waters of the Gaia and white light summer clouds are floating in their blueness." Unquote. Mother and daughter standing close to each other by the window, mother behind the daughter's back, see the same and a totally different scene, a watercolor painted for each by her own time. With this wonderful tableau, I wish to round up. And uh, I would like to cite uh, Iman Slantsmanis, an artist and art historian, former director of Rundala Palace Museum, and a person who is very important and very popular and very renowned in Latvian cultural context, a uh, figure of intellectual. Uh, and these are words that he said in his document in a documentary by Laima Jurgina uh, about uh, the generation of the 1960s, 1970s. Yeah, that is his experience and experience of many from the, um, many people of that generation. Uh, all that communism is just one uh, made up pure bluff where everybody plays that role. Yet it made it possible to get distanced from some cheap and simplistic things offered by the current trends in art developing around in the West. And it allowed for each of us to search for one's own way. It is very hard to be oneself, especially if there are so many opportunities, so much information around. At that time, the new way was searched in oneself, not on the basis of what is around. Regine Azara, since the early stage of her writing, demonstrates growth of a writer with her own distinguished voice, cultivated through repetition and variation, manifested in psychological veracity and brilliant findings of literary expression. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for your 
for your presentation. Uh, before we uh, start uh, the uh, section of discussions and questions, uh, I just want to uh, remind all the followers, uh, online followers, um, that time to time uh, on the uh, right corner of the screen, uh, you can find the QR code and it's actually for the questions. So you can scan it and, um, and you can write your questions on Slido and then we uh, can ask them to our speakers. Uh, so as you see on the screen at the moment, there's also a QR code. So please, you're kindly welcome to <coughs> ask your questions uh, to our keynote speakers as well. And uh, yes, uh, Artis, uh, could you? Yeah. yeah. Uh, I could start off the discussion uh, with my own questions, if I may. Uh, my first question goes to uh, Sanya Bachun and uh, what would be the role of Cassandrian narrative today in Eastern Europe? Uh, I imagine that it would still involve uh, the function of keeping memory of the past, but maybe there are also some other challenges. Challenges. Thank you. Thank you very much for that question, Artis. Um, it's a very pointed question. Uh, one of the things that um, I... Um, know about Cassandra, uh, and we know very many things mediated through many mediators now, is that she's looking backwards as well as forward. Um, and I find the resonances uh, of that in Ezra's prose and in Sandra's kind real representation of it uh, really strong. So that at each point in time, that expressive utterance looks back captures what has happened, captures in particular the traumatic aspects or embodied aspects of what has happened, but also looks forward to the future. Um, and, and, you know, sometimes for Cassandra, it's mostly warnings, but these warnings are born of genuine care for the well-being of society. And, and for that reason, as I uh, pointed out in my, in my address, we should listen to them. So um, the role of Cassandra narrative would be really in soliciting the knowledge about the future. Now, what is also accompanying that is a complex expression. And um, in her close reading, Sandra has pointed out how complex that can actually get in a female writer um, or a female artist. And part of our challenge is really to uh, have patience as readers, as recipients of that utterance, to understand what's behind it and, and to get those lessons for the future. So there's past, there is future, but I would also say there is present. So, so when, when you have a Cassandra narrative, it is very much about seeing where we are at the moment. Are we amounting to the big noble ideas that we have for us as human beings, that we have for our environment. Um, are we listening to every single voice in our environment um, democratically? Um, and, and I'm here thinking about human and non-human voices. So, um, so that, that is the message for the present. So combining these three in a Cassandra narrative to me sounds as uh, a challenge for the listeners, but also uh, one that we must embrace. Uh, we are facing so many um, external and internal challenges um, nowadays. Um, and I think that listening to those, um, those voices can really help us navigate these turbulent times. So, yeah, thank you. Thank you. Uh, and my second question goes to Sandra Meshkova. Um, could you briefly reiterate uh, what seems modernistic about Azar's early <laughs> prose and how it compares to other Latvian female, female writers of the same time? Yeah, thank you. And this is a really very dense question, I would say. I'm not sure <laughs> I need to make a, maybe uh, more presentations need to be made on this, but not, yeah. Uh, generally, uh, maybe I will comment uh, around yeah, this question. Uh, I was thinking about this modernism and its connectedness to realism, yeah, modernism, realism, in the context of Latvian literature in general, 
which has been much investigated recently. Yeah, the, the, there are books published and, and articles about, let's say, this early 20th century period. Uh, but actually, this can also be compared to, let's say, American literature, where realism entered later, yeah, and it had shorter span of uh, this 19th century development. Uh, and uh, through and, and probably similar tendencies can be observed in Russian realism. Yeah, when Dostoevsky, for example, yeah, when we take him, so he's labeled by realist uh, as a realist writer and as a modernist writer also, which means that exactly through the psychologism, yeah, uh, through uh, going deeper into the uh, representation of you not know, maybe first character, then already a certain. A type of thinking, maybe, yeah, consciousness, we could say that, that is already this modernist feature, right? Then here, realism uh, makes this passage into modernism or connection, passage or connection, then it depends on the writer, probably. And in uh, Azara's case, happens, there happens exactly the same thing, yeah, when uh, she starts maybe as a realist writer in these very first texts. And then exactly due to her interest in psychologism, and maybe it's not only interest, maybe it's also her strategy, yeah, her strategy, which exactly like Nora Ixtana very well observes, yeah, the strategy allows her to escape censorship, yeah, and escape these schemes of uh, socialist realism, yeah, she doesn't pay any tribute to them in these texts. Uh, uh, and, and this is how realism then flows into modernism and uh, no, th th that is this basis. Yeah? And of course, these features, you know, what is modern? It's a very, very broad question, right? Is it about only techniques? I would start with, you know, I don't know how, how long I could talk, but uh, I would start with modernist conception of time, modernist conception of reality, yeah? subjective dimension of reality that there is no single reality perception possible. And here we have this contrast, mimetic approach of realism, yeah, which searches for reality and its representation in text or in art. And then modernism, which evades it, yeah, which, which, uh, uh, which is searching these subjective dimensions like Virginia Woolf. Yeah? Um, when she braids several characters, uh, no, she, she has these several focalizers, yeah, and she braids these perspectives, creating exactly this uh, multidimensional, multidimensional vision of, of reality. Uh, and then this uh, surface, yeah, or uh, reality as such, reality per se, that needs to be um, needs to be recreated by the reader, yeah, if the reader wishes to do it. No like that. Thank you for the question. Uh, sure. Uh, Sanya has a question uh, as well to Sandra, so you're very welcome to, to ask it. Thank you. Um, so um, um, as I was uh, listening to Sandra very insightfully invoking Virginia Woolf, um, I was really struck by the correspondences in the treatment of time and space um, and, and really highlighting that shift that brings realism into, um, into modernism uh, that Auerbach, among others, was also keen on exploring. So what is that happens to realism or realist mode in modernism? Is that the overturning of the realist mode or continuities? And um, uh, being a Wolfian scholar, I just happen to have some curiosities on me, um, which is a knowledge that the first Latvian translation that appeared in journal Daugava, of all, uh, appeared in 1930, the first Latvian translation of Virginia Woolf's prose appeared in 1934. Um, and that is the section time passes from the waves. And I find that absolutely fascinating. Um, I mean, I don't know how on earth will I get to that, that particular journal in 1934, but I find it fascinating because you would, for instance, have to wait until 1978, I believe, to have a first translation of, of Wolf's prose, and that was essays in Russian um, and in many other languages. Um, and I find there is more than coincidence in having that translation there, that there is something about that section, about the treatment of time in that section in Virginia Woolf that speaks to writers like Ezra. Um, um, and 
maybe, maybe not knowing that, maybe someone will address that later in the conference, Ezra read that translation, engaged with that translation. So my question really to Sandra is, do we know anything about Ezra and Wolf in particular? Because that, that sounds as a such, such a potent link to me. Yes, so thank you, thank you very much. Oh, <laughs> uh, definitely they can be, uh, they should be compared. I'm, I'm not sure that, uh, I, I'm sorry, maybe I, I have missed something. Yeah, I haven't really you know, <laughs> followed absolutely all new developments in, in Latvian uh, literary scholarship. Um, I, I believe that somebody might have taken it up, but uh, no, it, it hasn't been like, um, it, it hasn't resonated very widely. Yeah? But, but this would be a very, very interesting topic to investigate. Exactly. Um, uh, just because, uh, yeah, this experience, yeah, this uh, no, human experience, how, how it is, um, it seems like Azara wants or tries to capture, you know, like she, um, it was mentioned by uh, the Minister of Culture yeah, in his address that uh, Azara, uh, Latvian was not her kind of na native language, yeah, that she learned it as a foreign language. And uh, this has been stated by, by many scholars that um, Azara kind of learned, she practiced so much. Yeah, there is this uh, statement about her um, um, no day without line, without writing a line. She, like, like Virginia Woolf, she very extensively relied on notes, on making notes, on writing even, I, I'm not sure if it's diary, yeah, if it could be called diary, but notes, everyday notes when she wrote down whatever, you know, what, what, what she was doing, what happened, what she thought, what somebody said, uh, some uh, conversation that she heard maybe uh, in, somewhere in the public transport or um, not talking to, to the uh, taxi driver, for example. Yeah? And Nora Ixtena in her book uh, quotes, you know, provides these quotes from Ezra's diaries, but that is of course a very, very valuable material to investigate. And so this is probably uh, what, what makes her similar to Virginia Woolf, you know, capturing these moments of being, yeah? moments of being. Uh, how to capture, now I no, don't remember that quote from, from Wolf exactly, but how in this cotton reel, yeah, maybe you can help me, yeah, the, what kind of surrounds reality, how exactly to delve into it, yeah, how to extract what makes it, yeah, what makes it, and th this is so much about time, exactly, experience of time. Oh, yes, <laughs> so th that would be a very, very interesting comparison to make. Th thank you for this idea. Mm. Yes. And we have one question from our viewers. Uh, Johanna Ross asks to um, uh, Sanya Bachun, could you elaborate on the observation that the technique of switching vocalization stands out among Eastern European women writers? What are some examples and what do you think is the effect of this, this technique in these works? Thank you very much for that question. Um, so this is um, something that I've observed being used more often or more readily by, the, by Eastern European uh, writers than uh, their counterparts in the 50s, 60s, and the 1970s, um, uh, but also today. Um, so you could think of Ezra, Ezra deployed it to relay male and female perspectives. And we touched upon um, that um, um, recently. Um, writer who was very skillful um, in using these um, would be, um, who is very skillful, apologies for, in using these, would be Dubravka Ugrešić. She's a diasporic former Yugoslav writer. Um, and, and in a nutshell, for the wider audience, vocalization is not necessarily just the voice, but, but the, the person through whose eyes we see um, the narrative unfolding. And very often the focalization, the visual focalization of the narrative is accompanied by the shift in voice. So you adopt the voice of that person. Um, uh, at the risk of, of repeating Virginia Woolf's name too much, uh, it, it is inaugurated by modernist techniques of, uh, for instance, in Virginia Woolf's um, uh, to the lighthouse, there's a famous scene where she switches from the perspective of one to another to the third. 
but what I think um, histor- um, Eastern European writers, women writers are doing more often is using that for appointed social critique, um, highlighting those aspects that are unseen um, and then casting uh, casting these focalizations on the same condition or the same event. So you see what passing of a kitten might mean for, for a girl who's doing that, as well as someone who's receiving it. And you can say it is simply about augmenting reality, creating that richer and denser world, but they often use that also to comment on reality, on social reality outside. Um, so I hope that answers your question. Thank you. Thank you. I would uh, address a question to Sandra. We know that in, in Regi Nazar, in her later novels, uh, somehow enters her own novels um, as a character, as, there's a character author. Could you maybe elaborate more on which is the turning point uh, uh, starting from this uh, early, early works uh, when she starts to do that? Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I think this has been uh, discussed. Yeah, now I, I'm sorry, I, I won't. Maybe even by by several, right? By by, by several uh, critics, scholars, that this is not Spasmanisnitsis. Yes, and then uh, maybe here uh, also we can say that. So there is this realist modernist line in her writing, which um, culminates in a way in Akka, yeah, in the well. So th- that's why no, I would say that really this um, this novel kind of you know, marks the culminating point for, for her searches in, in this early stage of her writing. And then in parallel, she starts this postmodernist, self-reflexive, yeah, self-reflexive line, which actually then leads to uh, feminist insights, yeah, exactly through the self-reflexivity. But you no, know, also, of course, irony and and you know, through Zendergas then leading. Uh, further on, uh, so th- these two, um, no, yeah, two simultaneously developed lines. And that's very also very interesting. So she kind of covers the whole field in a way. Yeah, um, she like um, by experimenting by. Uh, no, of course, uh, I, I was constantly thinking. Uh, I haven't maybe done research. This could be also a very good idea. Uh, to regard uh, Azara in the context of uh, European literature more. Yeah, this has been like Bronislav Stabons, for example. Yeah, he 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 gives some uh, insights into this. But this could be really investigated, like Faulkner, for example, because Faulkner, Hemingway, uh, Maupassant, yeah, these and more writers they are mentioned by by Azara as uh, having inspired her, which means that, of course, uh, reading in Russian, probably, again, I'm sorry, <laughs> but probably this was the way how, how um, in journal publications in Russian, yeah, this is by, uh, mentioned by Zanda Gutman also very recently in her book that uh, these Russian um, journals, Novy Mir, Inestrana Literatura, they were very, very important in this Thaw and post Thaw period, because they published uh, not these world literature <laughs> texts, yeah, and this was the way how throughout the Soviet Union and those who knew Russian, they uh, they they got into uh, no, no knowledge, yeah, and uh, experience of these texts, which means that of course under the influence also uh, of of these writers, but uh, very much uh, experimenting herself, it seems. So, yeah, that she was developing also this self-referential, self-reflexive, yeah, self-reflexive, ironic line, which then leads further to very interesting experiments. Thank you. I still, we have uh, still time for one last uh, question. Uh, Artis, do we have some questions from, uh, from our followers? <coughs> Unfortunately, no, we don't have any <laughs> incoming questions. Um, but if we need still one question, I would uh, ask uh, uh, Sanya Bachun. Uh, you mentioned, uh, you, you touched upon also, uh, you, you, touched, you touched upon form and uh, that Cassandra narratives have specific form and you mentioned such characteristics as poetic and uh, 
yeah, what, what could be other characteristics of, of Cassandra nar narrative in, in formal terms? Uh, thank you. Thank you for that question, Artis. Uh, well, I think we've collectively assembled them already. Um, and uh, I appreciate Sandra's drawing in postmodernism as well, um, especially when it comes to um, the writers writing in the second half of the 20th century and 21st century. Uh, but I can sort of summarize them and potentially add to them. A Cassandra narrative, if it reinterprets the speech of birds, as we are told, uh, a Cassandra narrative would feature um, a more fluid discussion of the boundaries between humans and non-humans, um, as we have seen in Azura's fiction as well, um, either with hum non-humans being companion species to humans and, and working or interacting with them in narratives or as serving as metonymies to non-humans. Um, and uh, that would be one aspect of it, uh, trying to uh, actively uh, extend into the spaces and environments, natural environment in particular. Um, another aspect of that would be that bewitching talk um, uh, where uh, the craftiness of the sentence is actually born out of a, a really, really concerted effort to, to master language. Um, without wanting to expand too much, uh, I would say that the effort to master language Freudianly understood is always an effort premised upon loss or premised upon an attempt to conquer loss. And as such, it is a really deeply personal effort. And when we speak about writers such as Ezra or Joseph Conrad, who adopt and decide to write in a language that was not um, the first tongue they acquired, um, that becomes this almost obsessive pursuit of language, and that bespeaks Cassandra narrative very well, uh, because Cassandra narrative is, of course, premised on understanding that however much you try to um, express, however much you try to articulate uh, and make others hear it, you will never get to that perfect articulation. And I think in, there's both that is a real modernist streak in, in, in the writing Cassandra narrative insofar as it aims towards perfect articulation whilst being aware of, of its impossibility. But then there are also in Cassandra narratives very many features that are postmodernist, like metatextuality um, and intertextuality, the palimpsestic nature of it, because it is born. On, on the actual reality, including the reality of the writer's own engagement. Um, I have also highlighted the borrowing of genres, a bit insouciant attitude towards genres, trying to, to break the boundaries because what, what is preeminent is the effort to articulate rather than conforming to genre boundaries. So there's often fairy tale like quality um, or um, you know, poetry switches between poetry and prose or, or, or a fusion of poetry and prose. Um, and in some cases, um, blends of fiction and journalism, so, so which yields a very the opposite of that discourse, something that is almost more austere. Um, than than poetic, um, so I hope I hope that that gives a, a holistic answer to a question. But I think the 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 intent on language is the key formal feature here, um, and the, the the need loss premised need to perfect language and to convey what you're trying to convey whilst being aware that you're never absolutely perfect in it. That there is always a slippage between objects and and words. Um, that, that is, I would say, one of the crucial aspects, formal aspects of such narratives. Thank you. Thank you. It's also interesting that we can see all of these th features uh, at work in Azure's texts. And so if we don't have any more questions incoming from our viewers, maybe Janis could explain what happens next. Yes. Thank you, Samia. Thank you, Sandra, both of you for, for exciting presentations, thus opening this conference. And, and um, I just want to thank you once again for participating. And um, I hope we'll have a, uh, it's a great introduction to the conference actually. And the next panel, uh, 
uh, will be uh, uh, a, a woman's writing in Baltics and will have participants from the scholars from all three Baltic countries. And I think it will be great um, continuation uh, uh, of the conference. So we meet uh, 20 past 12, we have a break now. And thank you, thank you, thank you again, once again for, for participating and for your presentations. Good afternoon, everyone. I feel truly honored to chair uh, the International Baltic Panel of the uh, conference devoted to Regina Azera. Actually, all Baltic countries are present. <laughs> That's really good. And uh, I would like to um, uh, ask the followers uh, use all the digital uh, means of asking questions. Uh, you can use a QR code. Uh, you can you can post your questions uh, in the chat if you are following on Facebook, and also use a slide option. And uh, I will I, I will perform uh, uh, those questions to the presenters um, in the discussion, which will follow the, all, all the presentations. Uh, please do uh, mention the um, to whom you are addressing the, the question. And now um, the first to speak is Eva Eglai Kristone from the. Institute of Literature, Folklore and Art, University of Latvia. She is the director of our institute and she will be dealing with autobiographical narratives as part of women's literary history. Eva, the screen is yours. Thank you, Datsa. Okay, I will share my screen firstly. Um, um, so I hope it is a full screen. Um, okay, the first thing I want to say is that um, uh, this conference uh, is an opportunity to say out loud and to articulate the intention and desire that the speakers of this panel cherish already for some time to write a history of Baltic women's writing. Uh, when thinking about women's writing, there are individual studies in each Baltic country covering a particular period, movement, genre, or also. Some aspects are analyzed in comparison, but there is no focused attempt to look at the process of women's writing from the middle of the 19th century to contemporary literature in a unified way, looking at regional similarities and differences. The history of Baltic women's writing is the first impulse for my report, which is now more of a research setting than in-depth uh, analysis. Thanks to a number of projects, we have started to work more and more uh, intensely uh, on this idea, mostly individually um, or in some groups at the moment. But I hope that the wishes that have been exp expressed out loud I will come to sooner and we will start work on a common concept in the nearest future. Uh, the second reason which comes out of my individual research and my position in literary and cultural studies, women's writing must be seen in a broader context. Mm, and one of the most fruitful directions would be to integrate autobiographical texts as a basis um, uh, features in the work and using the autobiographical text as a basis, but also looking at them as an autonomous part of writing. And this approach is, of course, used in analysis and studies of both European and American women's writing. I just want to remind that uh, women's uh, autobiographical writing seldom are taken seriously as a focus of study before the 70s of the uh, 20th century. Um, was not deemed appropriately complex for academic dissertations, criticism, or the literary canon. 
And this interest in women's autobiographical practices as both a, an articulation of women's life experience and a source of articulating feminist theory has grown over several decades and was acknowledged uh, as a field around the uh, 80s. And the third reason, of course, is uh, Regi Nazar, uh, one of the Latvian women writers who often has used autobiographical motifs in her novels and short stories, uh, written diaries, <coughs> um, and played with herself uh, as an authorial figure presenting her own texts. Um, I share the view of the researchers, and they are mostly women researchers, uh, who believe that the recovery of women's autobiographies, diaries, and memoirs forces us to reconsider the role of women in history, literature, and culture. Moreover, this recovery um, insists that we rethink the ways in which we talk about historical periods, literary genres, and our assumptions about what counts as literature and how we should read, interpret, and value it. Um, women's diaries and memoirs are vital to readers and scholars because they preserve what has been lost to us for many years, the histories and voices uh, that reside in the everyday. If we wish to understand the legacy of women's voices in literature, how women have represented themselves in writing, and the changing roles of women in history and culture, we must read their texts. And I mean all the texts. Women writers' works have been lost through the shifting aesthetic values of male-dominated publishing practices and canonization processes, or because their writings were never intended for publication. As a well-known example of autobiographical writing, uh, memoirs have rarely raised objection when placed under the umbrella of uh, literature. But the diaries have been more challenging to deal with, as they have been perceived as too personal and fragmentary texts to be considered literary. Um, let us briefly look at the Baltic, Baltic situation. Um, autobiographical writing arrived uh, rel relatively lately in Latvia and Estonia compared to other uh, Europe. Um, but of course, fiction, fiction's beginning is uh, late as well. Um, as elsewhere, for many decades, not much attention was paid uh, to non-fiction autobiographical texts as, as a part of literary culture. The first heyday of memoirs began in Baltic states in the 30s of the 20th century. Estonian literary scholar and critic Ruth Hinrichus, in her article on the, on the development of Estonian autobiographical writing from the 18th century until the Second World War, mentions that there were few women writers by the end of the uh, 30s, uh, but their memoirs attracted attention. For example, Estonian journalist, writer, and feminist Lily Sulborg was one of the first uh, autobiography writers, as well as as uh, Marta Lepp, who was a legendary female revolutionary, and Mari Ramat was the founder of the Estonian women's national defense movement. Uh, some autobiographical literature was published in Latvia at the same time, uh, including uh, extracts from the writer's diary of women's rights uh, activist uh, Ivan de Kaya, and, uh, uh, and uh, also autobiographical novel by the poet and playwright Aspasi. While speaking about Kaya's diary, Latvian culture critics also uh, acknowledge that the uh, autobiographical genre is still underdeveloped. Under develop, under and uh, as you can see, this review highlights another aspect that appears in relation to the publication of diaries uh, quite frequently. Uh, principal objections to the publication of such diaries uh, while all the persons mentioned are still alive, but I will not explore this aspect further. 
over the last few decades, the number of publishing of published um, autobiographical documents have grown year by year. And at the beginning of uh, at the beginning of the 21st century, there is even a flood of memory literature, um, autobiographical literature, including diaries. Um, Latvian literary scholar Sandra Meshkova, whose brilliant presentation we just had, has written on peculiarities of Latvian women's autobiographical writing in the 90s of the 20th century. Estonian life writing scholar Lena Kurvet Kausar and Ruth Hinrikus have explored Estonian life writing of the, um, of the beginning of the 21st century. Um, mm, but my attention attracted the tendency to publish women diaries in every Baltic country in the last decades. These are diaries from different periods um, and by different authors of various degree uh, of recognition. Diaries written by uh, well-known writers and diaries written by an ordinary uh, women. Looking not only at the local, but also international context, we can admit that the diary enjoys huge popularity um, in the publishing world. So why is this? Because it satisfies the need for authenticity, authenticity or because when filters through a writer's viewpoint, uh, everyday life suddenly acquires structure and transparency that you would never see uh, so yourself. Uh, these are just some questions we can ask ourselves, but I will give you a small visual glimpse into the diaries published in the Baltic States over the last uh, decades, and I would like to add my thanks to Lithuanian colleague Gied and uh, Estonian colleague Gellemari for their help in uh, identifying uh, diaries. Um, this year and last year, several long-awaited diaries have been published in Latvia, such as an impressive, uh, impressive volume of diaries by the Latvian philosopher and pioneer of academic aesthetics, uh, Milda Palevice, and the diary of the poet Visma Belshevica, the diary of the theater critic uh, Lilia Zena and uh, others. In Lithuania and Estonia, too, there are diaries. Um, of prominent translator or choreographer, uh, as well as those of lesser known women. And since the turn of the century, diaries uh, have been published from the interwar period and even uh, into uh, from the 19th century. And diaries covering, for example, World War II, uh, World War I, such as the diaries of Lithuanian educator, writer, and activist Gabriela Petkevicaita Bite, and also diaries uh, covering World War II and, um, and, and experience in Siberia, deportations. And of course, the Holocaust diaries are also important. Uh, not only, uh, but, uh, but of course, not only autobiographical narrative of Jewish uh, women is part of the Baltic women's narrative, but also the diaries of uh, Baltic German women, Russian uh, or even Polish and other nationalities. Um, it can thus be argued that the diaries already published cover the entire history of the Baltic uh, countries since the end of the 19th century. Up to the diaries of the pandemic, uh, several of them have been published in both Latvia and Estonia. Um, and I will also mention two diaries that are popular and have been republished uh, um, in Estonia. These are, uh, oh, somehow it um, goes back, okay, now it goes first. Um, yeah, these are diaries. Um, of Ella Douglas, who was the wife of the writer Friedebert Douglas, and then um, again, and then diaries of the Finnish Estonian uh, also Aino Kallas. Mm, um, and, and these diaries are like republished many times. 
And uh, I would like also to mention just a few suggestive examples for research. For example, in the connection with the uh, aforementioned Aino Kallas. Um, Aino Kallas and uh, Margaret of Grosswald, uh, which is a Latvian, for some years uh, they wrote di their diaries uh, in uh, London. And they both uh, have met at joint events uh, of the Latvian and Estonian embassies. Margareta was a secretary at the Latvian embassy and wrote diary in English, uh, which is not published yet. And I know was the wife of the Estonian ambassador uh, in, uh, in London. And they refer to each other in their diaries and create their own geographical, emotional and textual ma mapping of London. And um, this is one of the research ideas for the near future. And then there is also diaries that are not just personal, um, that are uh, already shared uh, when they are written. Um, for example, the unpublished uh, uh, diary of uh, a Latvian um, uh, translator, Maria Stalbova, um, which she regularly gave to her future husband, uh, the quite well-known decadent poet Victor Seglitis to read or the diary of uh, the Estonian poet Mari Unde. Uh, she kept this diary together with her husband Artur Atson. And when you look at the diaries published in the Baltic states, there is a sense that they need to be uh, talked about, that they need to be included in the study of women's writing, that they um, push the boundaries and the uh, multivocality uh, of narratives. Okay, and these are the published diaries, but my interest uh, is also, but uh, as you can already see, these are not only published diaries, but also unpublished diaries, uh, which is also um, part of my um, uh, research interest. Because these uh, unpublished uh, diaries still are still waiting for their readers in archives, museums, and private archives. And, um, um, and I think that um, this is a very good initiative uh, started uh, at the Institute, which I'm uh, representing, uh, that we have this uh, uh, collection, um, again, again, this uh, autobiographic, uh, a collection of autobiographical um, documents, um, and um, and I just counted that there are uh, 194 documents in this collection, and uh, 61 of uh, these documents are women's life stories, uh, primarily uh, diaries. So uh, there's um, so much to do with these uh, unpublished diaries, as you can see. Uh, and not only in uh, Latvia, so I suppose. Mm. Okay, let's move forward. So uh, these elements, private, gendered, uh, autobiographical and daily, uh, these elements also form the basis for four questions that have occupied and continue to occupy diary scholarship today. Uh, what does it mean to say the diary is public or private? Is the diary a remarkably female form of life writing? What does dailiness uh, uh, mean for literary value? And can the combination of daily personal writing adapt to uh, autobiography? Mm, these questions pose more than just possible uh, ways into diary discourse and ways to join the conversation. And uh, how scholars take up these questions and work to answer them is all about the kind of space they want to claim for the diary. Mm, do I understand correctly that I have two minutes? That's it. You have four minutes. Four minutes. Oh, that's good. Okay, then uh, let's move forward. And um, almost every diary explains why is it uh, being uh, written. And there is one example uh, from Milda Palevich, uh, diary, uh, just you can read and I, I want to comment more on that. And um, mm, what makes the diary more challenging to read and categorize than other genres or kinds of texts are the same qualities that mark the diary, a distinct kind of uh, writing. The fact that the diary is uh, 
immediate rather than reflective, open rather than closed, and that the diary is daily. And these qualities mean that the diary resists traditional approaches uh, to reading. And the difficulties in reading diaries is compounded also by the fact that uh, mainly, uh, as I mentioned already, uh, but since then in 19th century, um, diary keeping has primarily been associated with the female domestic space and uh, here comes the question of ordinary diary versus uh, literary diary and um, of course this ordinary writing uh, is challenging but um, but it's at the same time it is also um, Mm, so nice that it has uh, survived um, and it gives us the incredible opportunity to read what is uh, so often um, so ordinary as to, as to remain unread, unrecorded and unsaved. Uh, so therefore ordinary writing becomes a highly productive site for investigating how both writing and culture get made every day. And, um, and then just shortly that uh, of course uh, there instead of the kind of these uh, ordinary diaries and there is these uh, uh, literary diaries and of course uh, such diaries as uh, Regi Nazar diary or Gundagarepshe Aino Kallas or Petkevich uh, Aitabite these tend toward the literary um, because they have um, more like there are more metaphors or self-reflection or extraordinary events or yeah. Uh, but one of the important points is that diaries written by women writers who have already made name for themselves become part of so-called literature much more easily because the author is already a writer. But if uh, the same author were to offer the diary uh, her diary as her first literary work, um, uh, I doubt there will be hardly be any response to publishing. Um, maybe today it's different. And uh, just um, look at them. Uh, okay, these are some statements. Um, uh, if you think about Azara Diary, um, she has recorded almost every moment of every day uh, life in this uh, diary book. Um, but the strange thing is that although the moments are recorded and with amazing precision, uh, the hour and even the minute of each entry is noted, the most important thing is not indi uh, indicated. There is no date, no year. And it is hard to say um, whether the diary uh, entries have a more poetic splendor of, or subtle irony, uh, as you can read uh, in her, also in her introduction, which is meant for the readers. Uh, uh, um, but the variety, variety of moods and attitudes uh, is astonishing, uh, and the writer's ability to see the ordinary and discover the extraordinary, uh, yet timeless, uh, seems limitless. Uh, and diary as the most personal genre uh, of autobiography, uh, um, offering the hope of observing the writer as a human being at close quarters, of penetrating into an intimate room and into spaces that are not accessible to visitors, usually close to, or usually, uh, yeah, and, and in the case of writers also, they, um, illusory hope of getting closer to the creative juices of the creative uh, world. So to sum up, the status of uh, autobiography has changed dramatically in the last decades, both within and outside the, the acad uh, academy. And women's uh, autobiography is now a privileged site for thinking about issues of writing at the intersection of feminist, postcolonial, and postmodern critical theories. <clears throat> and the diary as a form of writing has so long been uh, unseen, feminized, and privatized that the fact that there are any women's diaries left from the past to read is astonishing in and uh, of itself. Uh, so let alone the fact that a scholarly field has uh, risen up around the diary. Um, so uh, I'm still considering uh, 
all the goals and outcomes of this recovery process, um, which means questioning a process that has led to the validation and publication of the words and voices of so many forgotten women. Thank you. Thank you, Eva. Uh, thank you for your interesting paper and also for being so careful with time. And now uh, the next speaker is uh, our colleague Solveika Daugirdaite from our sister institute in Venus, which is Institute of Lithuanian Literature and Folklore. And she will be speaking about women writers and the literary canon. Solveika, the screen is yours. Dear colleagues, nice to see you on screen. I apologize for uh, the expression of my face because right now the bright sun shines in, directly into my eyes and I, I have no ways to escape it. It seems that we have something in common to evaluate a new women's writings and to look for ways to make them more visible. One of the challenges of the feminist criticism in the West in the 70s and 80s was to bring women's lost traditions and texts back to literary history. While still working on it, it became clear that women's literary history could not simply be rewritten, including forgotten names or replacing names of male authors with names of women authors. Shortly after Elaine Showalter published in 1977, for a literature of their own British women novelists from Bronte to Lessing, in which she singled out stages of women's writing as feminine, feminist, and female. Toril Moy, in her sexual textual politics, criticized Showalter supporting, for supporting traditional academic aesthetic values and, among other issues, for relying on solely on women authors who started commercial writing at the beginning of 19th century in, the, in England. While women were writing fiction and nonfiction for different purposes for hundreds of years. Around that time, the research of literary canon intensified, questioning premises for its formation as gender and politically biased, and so reflecting die uh, DWIM dead white European males. At the same time, the boundaries of documentary and fiction literature disappeared. The hierarchy of genres changed, and the so called elite literature took over the features of popular literature. The post Soviet revision of the literary canon of Lithuanian literature, in particular, was an attempt to replace the work of authors loyal to the Soviet regime with those of authors who were on the periphery for ideological region, reasons without taking into consideration male bias of the Soviet and emigre culture. The current high school program in Lithuania includes 36 mandatory authors spanning from the 16th century and only three of whom are women. In 2015, I participated at the conference on the 150th anniversary of Aspasia and even published an article entitled To Whom We Can Refer Us to Lithuanian Aspasia and Rhinos. The main idea of, of which was that we Lithuanians, unfortunately, have no such an iconic couple of equal literary personality. And now, at Regina Ezerask Centenary Conference, I am about to say again that, again, unfortunately, we don't have such a successful or an iconic writer of the Soviet period. And it is not a feeling of inferiority or and why. I just want to say that literature can and does develop in different ways in different directions. Nevertheless, if we draw a parallel between a Latvian and Lithuanian literatures, Lithuanian literature has its own generation of writers who were born in 1930. They came from they came to literature during Khrushchev saw in the mid 50s and dominated as the first generation of pure Soviet writers. 
poets Algimantas Baltakis, Alfonsas Maldonis, and Justinas Marcinkiewiczus, who, is, who was also a playwright. Women writers who belong to this generation were mainly also poems. And here we face a specific hierarchy of the Soviet literature. Prose, especially the novel, was considered the most important achievement of literature. In Soviet Lithuania, women wrote very few novels, and even those who would now consider knows, and even now, uh, and even those we would now consider novels were then called long short stories or cycles of short stories. The Laur Nevichute and Vidmante Yuzukaitite, born in late 40s, are examples of what such an understimation could be. In early 80s, then more and more women debuted in prose and criticism identified women's prose as a phenomenon. The prose men's speech in the press flushed, I quote Leonidas Yetzinavichus, that literary work is a masculine activity connected with all kinds of ordeals which steer the artist's soul and which are invisible and incomprehensible in the eyes of others. And that serious literary work is often connected with the sacrifice of personal happiness, so unavailable for, men, for, for women. Those were the reasons that, according to male writer, preventing women from prose writing. On the other hand, writing, like any other strong self-expression, even in the Soviet pseudo-egalitarian society, really meant a challenge, a transition of certain psychological and social boundaries drawn for women. That is why example of Ezra's type productive and well-recognized author could be a role model for, uh, for young women. And now I will turn to Lithuanian literary history in a hope to encourage thinking how uh, literatures written in difficult lang in different languages contribute to universal uh, women's writing. So what do we have in Lithuania? Sure, we have Jamaica, also born in the mid 19th century. Uh, she was a role model for women writers in different times and circumstances. She was valued for her realistic style and left wing political views during Soviet times. But young and ambitious writings were fascinating her uh, personality, her self sufficiency, perseverance, acerbity, courage to stand out from um, the social norms that bound uh, older women in traditional society. Bita Vilimaita started published story, publishing stories about Jamaica in the mid 60s and continued writing for more than 20 years. With Mante Yasukaitita's play was staged at Chole Drama Theatre in 1987. However, the popularity of Javenta during the Soviet era is far from equal to its popularity over the last decade. The Scarf's youth was finally appreciated as her style and the chosen identity in solidarity with the peasants. Another style icon, Frida Kahlo, appeared on the wall next to the monument to Jamaica, and the square became a ground for feminist festivals. So, Vega, uh, I'm sorry to interrupt you. Haven't you forgot to use your PowerPoint? So, I, I see there is Jamaica's, Jamaica's portrait in, in your slides. So. Jamaita, who was an, an advocate of women's rights in literary works, now is recognized as the first Lithuanian feminist. As such, she is also a hero of plays. She sings blues, urging women not to restrict their sexuality in spite of their age. The young author, Elena Gasulite, next, uh, published a book. Uh, please, next slide. Um, published a book about uh, 10 most important Lithuanian and Lithuanian-born women, such an, as an anarchist Emma Goldman. And that was Gasulite writes, I quote, next. Why do we even today, even from texts that claim that to, to present this woman supposedly, please next, uh, next slide, please. We have lost the slideshow. Okay, okay. 
Why do we even today, even from the text that claim to present this woman supposedly modern and new, get to know only that she loved and smoked and that, and that not she was anti-clerical and anti-capitalist? Of course, it's much easier to sell cigars and romantic letters in the headlines of articles, but I think there is still a fear here. The ghost of controversial question breathes in the back. If Jamaita allowed herself to criticize the interwar Lithuanian government, what kind of classic of literature she is? Maybe she didn't love her homeland and at all. This month uh, marks 100 years since her death, but she is alive and noisy, discovered by young generation of feminists. Next. Well-known writer and Sigita, Sigita Sparulskis draws a parallel between Jamaita and the modern uh, woman. Her heroine is a housewife, former actress, invited to play Jamaita's character, together like Ibsen Smora, wanting to break free from her respectable husband. I would say that young feminists nowadays go further than playwright Sparulskis. Also, the law allows to divorce a husband. It may not allow for, re for revision or updating of classical text. This was confirmed by a group of feminist artists who organized a performance in the parking lot under the monument to Vincent Kudirka in Vilnius. Next slide. A lawsuit was filed over a performance by a painter, a poet, Vilma Fiocla Pure, and her colleagues. It was called Under Kudirka or at request of the patriarchs at our wish. Kudirka, next slide, please. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Thank you. Kudirka is an author of a poem called Totishka Gesme, national song from the very end of the 19th century, which later became an anthem of, an anthem of the Lithuanian Republic. This woman sang the edited text, changing male images with female ones. Thus the lines, Lithuania, our far, far, fatherland, the land of great heroes, was, was substituted by words, Lithuania, our motherland, land of great mothers, and so on. Following a national com nationalist complaint, an attempt was made to prosecute the desecration of state symbols. The women were um, se several times were questioned by police, and although they were not tried, this case sparkled fear, which was proper, probably um, was the real goal of the nationalists. Next slide, please. The management of the Pamenkalnis Gallery that belongs to uh, the artists union has decided not to display a feminist interpretation of the Lithuanian coat of arms in the exhibition, ensuring itself against possible sanctions of, for the secretion of state symbols. While the artist's idea was just to um, uh, say that uh, if we have a woman president, then Dala Gribovskaite, uh, why should we still use uh, male symbols? And also, if to look more carefully, it can be noticed that the legs of um, a, 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 a warrior, a woman warrior, are not shaved. Perception and recognition, next slide, please, of Aldona Lobita significance is one of the significant changes in the hierarchy of literature. Lobita was well known a children's writer, although in Soviet times as well as now, uh, children's literature is considered a periphery of the main literary processes. However, the greatest difference between Lobita and other Soviet writers is that after 1990, her importance did not diminish, unlike that of many Soviet classics, but increased because of several publications of her letters and other documents. Next slides, please. These publications consolidated the recognition of the equality of the epistolary genre and fiction, as well as the recognition of Lobite as an, as an observer and critic of the Soviet Lithuanian culture. 
since open and public criticism of both social and cultural life in the Soviet era was not possible. Next slide, please. Lobita's letters are a source for cultural historians that presents clearly, though not publicly, articulated opinions that do not correspond to those published by public channels to, of, of that time. She was a well-known patroness of young artists and authors, famous for her special witness and was a hospi hospitable hostess. Uh, change the slide, please. Next and, 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 and next. Th there are the books uh, published in recent years devoted to Lobite. Um, she, next slide, please. She was able to, to, every to turn every si life situation, turn, to turn every life situation into a funny story like presented in um, this uh, excerpt from her um, interview where she explains why she loves uh, graphomaniacs uh, very much. Uh, one of the dramatic examples of the devaluation of women's work is the case of emigre poet, prose writer, director, and actress Berute Pukelevichute. Next slide, please. When she published her first collection of poems, Matuges, in Toronto in 1952, she was criticized in the press and mocked in real life uh, for overly eroticized and even obscene poems. Here's one of her poems. I will read it in Lithuanian. Uh, you will follow its literal translation if you wish. Next slide, please. Aš esu vilkė lūšis ir žalsvoji gyvatė. Aš esu alkana, mano pirštai yra žnyplės. Vakarais aš matau tolimus, gaisrus ir laukinių arklių šešėlius. O kai pritvinkusi naktis į mažai buoti, susirenku į sterblę mėlių nužaibus. Aš esu nerami. Next slide, please. Vidur vasario audroje ateina mano mylimasis. Mano persirpė lupos plyšta pusiau kaip vaisius. Mano krūtis yra baltos paukštės raudonais parnais. Aš jas laikau abiem rankom, nes jos gali išskristi. Mano sanariai ištirpsta kaip sniegas ir mano iščius kaip aukso kielikas prisipildo saldaus ir karšto vyno. Aš esu palaiminta tarp moterų. Dabar aš vaikštau tyliai ir esu atsivėrusi kaip žaizda. The harshly criticized poet switched to prose which, although interesting, especially the memoirs about her retreat from Lithuania, the end of the war and her life in DP camps, did not equal her poetry. However, next slide, please. There was a positive side of this uh, sad story. She received a new edition of, her lecture, of, of this collection in Lithuania, where she lived since 1998, suffering from depression that haunted her for life. She wrote a short memoir explaining the circumstances of her personal life and showing how the private life and public aspects of a woman's life intertwine. Here she explained that in Montreal, she lived briefly with a prose writer and with a prose and playwright Antana Schema, who at that time was writing his most important work, Baltadro Bulle, White Shroud, now available in English, translated by Carla Grodis, Lithuanian Canadian, Canadian, my first teacher in gender studies at Vilnius University in 1991. When Pukele... oh my God, two minutes, two minutes. Okay, okay. Uh, I'm, I'm finishing. Uh, when Pukelevichute published her first novel, Septini Lapi, Shkema accused her of plagiarism in the press. Uh, for the new ed edition, she wrote a glimpse at Matuges after 44 years. I skipped the quote. In conclusion, I would like to say that the place of women writers is changing along with the notion of good, valuable literature and the notion that only the so-called big names are important. The post-Soviet revision of the canon 
was hasty and it takes time and our efforts to make it more favorable to women and other underrated groups. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you, Zorbega, for, for the very interesting presentation. Uh, and sorry for the technical problems we sorry, had. Sir. Yeah, and this is why we probably uh, finish a bit later our, our panel. But the next speaker is our guest from Estonia, Ella Marie Talive. She is a researcher at uh, Under and Tugla Literature Center and also Tallinn University. And she will be speaking of um, environmental writer in Estonian literature. Thank you. And I will start sharing. Uh, can you see the slides all right? Yeah, it's full screen, it's okay. Um, thank you so much for um, the possibility to talk here about the Estonian literature. And thank you so much for the fabulous uh, keynotes and previous presentations. And uh, I will speak today about a very important Estonian writer, Aina Pervik. Um, she's one of the most influential authors of modern Estonian children's literature. And uh, she's actually only one year younger than uh, Regina Ezera. She was born in uh, 1932 into a family of a medical attendant train, trained in the Tsarist army and later at the University of Tartu. And the first memories of Aino Pervik are from a central prison of Tallinn, Watare, possible to visit today by the seaside of Tallinn uh, because uh, his father was a prison doctor. And one of the childhood memories were the waves uh, crashing against the prison hospital windows in a storm. Uh, later, her father worked as a doctor in Järvakandi glass factory and then as a country doctor. And Pervik grew up in the middle of Estonia, leaving uh, Tallinn only for to complete secondary education. Uh, she studied Finno-Ugric philology at the University of Tartu, graduating in 1955, and worked after that uh, as an editor of children's and young adult literature at the Estonian State Publishing House and of children's programs at the Estonian Television Studio. Since 1967, she has been a freelance writer and translator from Hungarian. She has written over 60 children books which have been translated and often adapted for theater and film. And she's considered the bravest children's writer in contemporary Estonia, as uh, she takes on very difficult themes like immigration, cultural conflict, corruption, the loss of cultural identity. And um, as I read from the um, uh, Estonian uh, writers, lexicon critics have called her style particularly feminine. I would like to add here a question mark, uh, just asking uh, what does feminine here mean? But I am not going to answer that today. The issues uh, she has written to children about, are, for example, um, the preservation of ecological balance, the clash of different cultures, the finding of one's identity, uh, war, freedom, fatality. The author frequently addresses acute problems that children face in today's world. Her style is concise. Berwick has never exaggerated with words. Her children's literature is concrete and clear, and yet somehow supportive and e equipped always with heartfelt humor, despite uh, dealing with very serious issues. Her last book up to now is The Kite Be Friends, about a kite uh, breaking free from the cord and discovering that there are many different creatures in the world who might think quite differently uh, from this kite. And uh, last year, Aino Bervik published a charming little collection of memoirs, which address often um, events from her childhood. And uh, you might know, and I think this is her uh, up to now most popular book, uh, Arabella, the pirate's daughter, 
which was made into a film and has been translated into Latvian. Uh, Aino Berviku was married to, to Eno Raud. Eno Raud is a number classic of Estonian children's literature, and all their three children have published books by now as well. And Piret Raud is an illustrator and author, and now the most translated children's author in Estonia. Uh, Eno Raud uh, has published more than 50 books for children. You might know the Free Jolly Fellows, uh, Axi Trallisi. Uh, three slightly eccentric fellows uh, and the dog go on a journey together uh, into the nature. And this is a kind of book about the natural balance of things. Uh, Raud and Pervik met while working both in a publishing house. And in the 1960s, the newly married couple traveled together in Karelia. And the journey resulted in a travel kind of uh, book uh, written together. Um, and uh, I would like to point it out as a beginning of environmental friendly books we both have written. The only fictional char character in a book is a protagonist, an Estonian schoolboy, Rain, who goes to visit uh, his relatives in Karelia. Uh, I will go back to Pervik's lovely little laconic memory book and ask what is the context of Pervik's writing. Um, here are some quotations on the slide from this book, uh, translated by Adam Cullen uh, for the Estonian Literary Magazine. Uh, first of all, uh, her background is the Estonian children's literature of the interwar period, especially from the end of the 1930s, as she mentions in her memoirs. Certain titles referring to a book telling children about nature, animals and plants, and her favorite one was about ants by Estonian uh, women of uh, Irma Trubald. Uh, secondly, the world she describes in her memoirs, uh, in brief, I would say, this was somehow a very safe, tiny universe, partly provided by her parents and partly just by um, a very lucky chance. For example, the family had just moved before the 1941 deportation, and this saved the family from the deporters, as they could not find them. Uh, third, uh, as one of the quotations here show, the Second World War was a part of a little girl's world long before it affected the life of a daughter of a country doctor in the woods of, uh, Middle, Est of uh, Middle Estonia. Uh, I would like to do a parallel here with the life story of Regina Ezera. In Pervik's memoirs, it, had, it has been repeatedly said that her playmates were deported or, or left Estonia in different years for different reasons, and her best playmate uh, left for Germany. Uh, allusions to children, people, creatures who have to leave their homeland in the shadows of the war appear here and there in Pervik's books. And I would say that uh, her point of view is always that of someone who has not lived through something like this directly and is therefore able to offer someone else uh, reassurance and shelter. And maybe uh, she expects others to do the same, as children literature has still an educational aspect. Pervik has said in an interview that in her eyes, the children's book uh, should be understandable and, and interesting for a child, but should also contain words that he or she probably doesn't know yet. The meaning uh, should be clear from a context, and in extreme cases, the child can ask someone. After all, we learn to talk in the same way, but by guessing from the context. And which I particularly like. Uh, is her opinion that one of the tasks of children books like literature is to explain the world on a basis of modern thinking. So there can't be just uh, classics of children's literature published, but uh, there must uh, always be the contemporary authors writing about the contemporary world. Uh, for example, in 2002, Berwick published The Dragons in a Foreign Land, 
illustrated by Piret Raud. And this is a story on war and refugee life in a foreign country in the form of a fairy tale. The main characters are a pleasant and good natured family of dragons. And this is like both combining contemporary and historical problems, I would say. Uh, Pervik uh, became a writer in 1960s. To be a children's writer in Soviet Estonia meant the chance to be free from ideological oppression to some extent, but also the chance to make a living as a writer. And the 1960s and 70s of a period that Pervik herself has considered to be the peak of Estonian children literature. The 60s were the time of some relief and free atmosphere, and this uh, also extended to children literature, where it was a bit more allowed. Uh, in the 50s, Naxidralit or Kungsmoor would have uh, been out of question. And uh, in Soviet children literature, the literary fairy tales were not favored. But cen the central character of Pervik's memoirs, at least it seems to me so, uh, is Aino Pervik's father, a country doctor. He seems to me to be somehow a prototype or basis of some important characters in Pervik's work. I mentioned already Arabella, the pirate's daughter, and uh, there is a character called Hassan. In the film, his name uh, was changed, changed to Adu, uh, as Moscow did not allow Islamic names back then. Uh, he is a healer and a very pacifist character, but still able to fight for his beliefs if necessary. Uh, and from here, I finally turn to Pervik's character, Kungsmoor, as she reminds me a bit of Hassan, although as a character, she's, she's totally different. Um, in 1973 appeared a story, Kungsmoor, as a book. Uh, it was um, as excerpt, excerpts uh, published or, already in the children's journal, Taheke. And this book uh, became very popular, and soon the author wrote the sequel, Kungsmoor and Captain Trum. Kungsmoor is a witch. She's living uh, in a little cottage uh, on a very small island in the middle of a sea. She treats people with uh, medicinal herbs, uh, and she can also foresee accidents. Uh, for, ex for example, she prevents uh, storms by flying to the spot uh, with a balloon. However, one day she fails to stop the storm and the result is a shipwreck. And she saves the captain, this is Captain Trum, and uh, they develop uh, a relationship. And this brings more adventures to Kungsmoor's life. Uh, both of her books were made into puppet films and have been translated into several languages. Uh, Kungsmoor is said to be the most feminine character in Estonian children's lit literature. And here maybe I quite agree as having qualities uh, or an appearance traditionally associated with women. Definitely not something characteristic to a Soviet uh, woman. She's vain, childish, needs much attention, cannot stand losing. She's often not taken seriously, but well, <laughs> still in the middle of it all, she never leaves a person or an animal or a bird in need without help. Mm. Who is actually Kungsmoor? It does not sound uh, very Estonian, and I'm pretty sure that many readers have treated it just as a name of a main hero of a book. Uh, devoid of meaning. This is not the case. Uh, Kungsmoor is being translated into Latvian and just now by Maima Grimberga to be published in 2022, uh, when Aino Bervik will have her 19th birthday. And uh, this is a good opportunity to explain the meaning of the word. Uh, Kungsmoor in Latvian will be Burmemme, uh, Maima Grinberga said that uh, she has created this uh, derivation combining Bur, a reference both to witchcraft and letters or alphabet, 
and meme, a word uh, used to refer to grandmothers or even mothers, but historically it has also a connection to healers in folklore. In Estonian, there is a slight difference. Um, in the 20th century, this word has not been recorded from Estonian dialects. Uh, Berwick found it uh, from one dictionary, dictionary by Andrus Sareste, who had borrowed it from the dictionary of Ferdinand Johan Wiedemann, which was the richest dictionary of Estonian words for a long time. Um, Wiedemann claimed that the word originated from southern Estonia and uh, meant an old woman sorcerer. Um, the last part of the word, more, meaning an old lady, is a loan uh, into Estonian from Swedish or coastal Swedish or Finnish Swedish. It's um, mother. Uh, in Estonian, it means an old lady. But the first part, kunks, might probably be just a mistake or, or pronunciation or transcription. Um, I would say that maybe Kuntimor or Kuntimor would be the right form. And yet um, the word itself, whether there is a language error or not, is a perfect uh, uh, name for a person bearing this name. It refers to a kind of um, edgy, unexpected, wild character with this K and uh, Kungsmoor has a real name as well, a very soft Emeline, but only Captain Trum uh, uses it as a kind of pet name. But uh, it also refers like uh, this character is a kind of error or unusual person. Mm. And uh, I would once again go back to the context of Kungsmoor, uh, just to... Um, Remind, environmental issues are often very important in Bervik's book. Uh, mostly we are in the background. The dragon refugees are blamed for forest fires and floods. And in another book, two animal characters have to escape from the forest, uh, which has been cut down into the city. Uh, and I have read uh, one Bervik's novel for the adults. Uh, and uh, there comes up a passage about uh, the plague of their time, the fear of nuclear disaster. And here is one artwork from Estonian artist who visited Central Asia in 1960s. And maybe this is a reference to the nuclear test site there. But Bervik's writing for children makes me think of two concepts. One is uh, the Anthropocene, a concept uh, introduced in this century about the world which has already the traces of human action. And another thing which is uh, to me very important, um, the eco-stress or eco-anxiety. Uh, nowadays parallel would be climate anxiety, which is a fear of impending environmental doom. Uh, and although very mildly, and maybe even without the author's um, uh, intention, Kungsmoor as a character adventures in a world that has been massively influenced by humans. She draws attention to industrial pollution, consumerism, overconsumption, the clash of nature and civilization. And the central event of the second uh, book is um, Another accident involving a ship, which uh, results in an oil spill. And um, the 1960s and 1970s were first decades of great oil disasters of the North Sea. Uh, one example is uh, a Torrey Canyon accident in England. And I even asked Aino Bervik uh, if it was a background of uh, writing Kungsmoor or describing this event in a book. But the author answered that uh, she was more worried about uh, such accidents inside the Soviet Union, uh, especially the oil spills of the Caspian Sea. And uh, as you know, um, in, in Soviet newspapers or news, uh, such uh, things did not appear. Uh, she had heard uh, about this 
these worries from her uh, Azerbaijan colleagues, uh, Azerbaijan uh, writers. And uh, uh, here I would say the genre of children's literature was in this case the only possibility to express the concerns not to be talked in public. Uh, uh, although, for example, uh, the Caspian Sea oil spill and fire of 1954 is uh, still the world's largest ever marine oil fires. Uh, so, uh, actually, the background uh, behind Kungsmoor somehow seems to me very gloomy. Mm. But Bervik has added uh, to me uh, in her email that she did not uh, write about the oil spill um, as the first thing, but uh, rather to understand why Kungsmoor, the witch, did not want to write a book about uh, her witchcraft to prevent her knowledge from falling into the hands of outsiders who might use it to cause accidents. Hello, Marie, one minute. One minute, yes. And to conclude, is um, Kungsmoor a children's book at all? Pervik suggests that the major environmental disasters are, are a result of carelessness. Um, and uh, as a proper children's book, it has a rather happy end. Kungsmoor and Captain Trum keep peace on their island. And um, here is the illustration. Kungsmoor is cleaning the sea from the oil with the help of a rake. And uh, um, she is uh, something between a witch and an eco friendly person. And the end of the book is a, an attempt to find a way of life that is ecologically balanced. I would end here. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, Ella Marie for your presentation. And now we are moving to the last presentation of this panel, uh, uh, which will be given by Zita Kaka, my colleague at the Institute of Literature, Folklore and Art, University of Latvia. And she will be speaking about moods, affects, feelings, and bodies, and about its subjectivities in women, women's prose of the 1970s and 80s. Welcome, Zita. Well, thank you, Dotsa. Uh, I will share my screen. Can you see it? Can you hear me also? Yeah, that's okay. okay. It's fine. Uh, uh, I want to start saying that this paper is a part of a larger ongoing postdoctoral research project embodied geography's history of Latvian women's writing that proposes a comprehensive research on Latvian women writers writing prose fiction and focusing on a particular aspect, female embodiment and exploring spatial interconnections that link women writers, their material worlds and literary texts. And as the effective turn has come to characterize much recent work in feminist studies, it also offers a useful framework um, to foreground and address the complexity and diversity of women's social, cultural, political and embodied uh, experiences um, for my project. And paying attention to moods, affects, feelings and bodies is one of the possibilities how to explore Latvian women's writing from the end of the 19th century until the first decades of the 21st century. And in today's paper, I will be looking at representations of uh, the late uh, Soviet womanhood uh, through close reading of two novels, Tseti Liadiner's novel, A Man from Sheherzad, Tsovaks no Sheherzad, published in 1971, and Regina Azar's novel, Betrayal, Nodvi, published in 1984. Both novels involve female main characters uh, and reveal difficulties that women encounter trying to combine everyday life and family obligations with their creative aspirations. The main female characters are strongly grounded in the quotidian existence and for various reasons they also feel dissatisfied with their life. While in Soviet studies the issue of the non-division of labor at home and the topic of the woman's double burden and this crisis of masculinity have been explored, this paper is motivated by my interest in the intersections of the bodily affective and the discursive layers of being in the world that allows to observe female subjectivity and the full unfolding of the crisis of 
the heteronormative family as a social practice. The post-World War II Latvian literature faced ideological restrictions, and at least until the mid-1950s, the heavily censored prescribed model of um, um, socialist realism significantly impeded the free cultural expression. The 1960s witnessed an emergence of a new generation of prose writers, and the Regin Azara was among those uh, new generation of writers. And literature of 70s and 80s is characterized by an emphasis on a subject-centered perspective and individual is in the focus of the literary works. And during the 70s and 80s, there's also more space for female authors and female characters in Latvian literature. Well, there's not so much direct description as to exactly how female characters think and feel about their bodies. There are much more indirect affective implications. For example, the feeling of not fitting in, the loneliness, anxiety, and isolation that manifest as bodily sensations. In Latvian fiction of the 70s and 80s, we find the crisis of the heteronormative family. Marriageable men are a rare commodity and extramarital relationships are normality. However, for women who tend towards emancipation and seek fulfillment in professional activities, yearnings for love and the search for a reliable partner remain the central focus of their lives. Lauren Berlant uh, calls cruel optimism a paradoxical position of desiring and maintaining an investment in the very object that prohibits one from flourishing, the impossible and thus potentially damaging cultural dreams. What it creates is the tension between harsh reality and the individual's aspirations to happiness. Sara Ahmed, like Lauren Berlant, is skeptical about this kind of optimism. In her book, The Promise of Happiness, Ahmed explores connections between affect, subjectivity, and citizenship. And one of the central questions is, what does it mean to be worthy of happiness? What does happiness do? And what certain actions are associated with happiness and why certain people are associated with attaining happiness and who gets excluded? Happiness is often foreclosed for people who do not fit in the normative framework. Ahmed's response to the question is to show how specific acts of deviation get attached to particular identities that are seen to cause unhappiness. These identities seen as unhappiness causes serve to threaten the harmonious status of the social order. Thus the promise of happiness, a moral imperative to provide individual and social correctives in order to restore the natural goodness of normative family, community, state, or nation. Motivated by Lauren Berlant's studies of cruel optimism and Sara Ahmed's research into happiness, I will explore the usefulness of those ideas in addressing the complexity of women's social, cultural, and embodied experiences du during the late Soviet period and trying to see the modes of subject formation in relation to larger social processes of the era. Certainly, um, Dinner's novel, A Man from Scheherazade, was written between 1964 and 1970. According to author's daughter, artist uh, Lily Zene, it took seven years to publish the novel because of the censorship. Previously, Dinner's poetry was censored and criticized for displaying two pessimistic moods. Her lyricism, sensuality, and sad tonality did not correspond to what was expected from the Soviet literature at the time, where the dominance of certain emotions such as sadness, hopelessness, helplessness, pessimistic moods were seen as undesirable. In 1973, Literature and Art published a report of the open meeting of the Board of the Writers' Union discussing the latest contributions to prose. Literary scholar Vera Vavar is alarmed at the way in which the latest prose reveals moral issues and human relationships Pointing out especially to the female characters, she exclaims, everyone is so unhappy. Dinner's novel, The Man from Scheherazade, is given as an example to the unhappiness trend. When literary critic Astrid Skurbe writes about Dinner's novel, the opening paragraph of the review deals with question of happiness, emphasizing the idea of happiness as the human right associated with morals and strength. Skurbe harshly criticizes Dinner not only for choosing a weak and unhappy female character as the main protagonist of the novel, but also for author's choice not to distance from this unhappy character, but to identify with it. According to Skurve, it is already bad that Dinner portrays unhappiness or unhappy character 
but even worse is her acceptance of unhappiness as inevitable state in the portrayed situation. And indeed, Dina in her novel reveals a gloomy world with the main female character, a 32 year old poetess, Laura Martinson, who tends towards depression and exhaustion. Laura is divorced and cares alone for her daughter, Velga, and her disabled teenage sister, Diana. Earning her living by translating, she's poor and overworked and she longs for love. However, her chances of happiness are narrowed down as she has to struggle for bare survival. When a ballet dancer, Vadim, a man from Scheherazade, the prince of the tales of a thousand and one nights, one evening suddenly enters Lara's gray life, he makes it more colorful, cheerful, and brighter, evoking strong feelings that give impetus to Lara's creative activity, and thus also changes Lara's status quo. While Dina portrays a great unfulfilled love as a catalyst for understanding life and creativity, the impossibility of fulfillment of this love also sharpens the sense of Laura's unhappiness. Not only Vadim already has a family, but his son, like Laura's sister, is disabled and the shared burden that in the beginning brings them together also draws them apart. Morality and emotion are connected as Laura rely on her feelings to determine a moral course of action. Peter Brooks, thinking about melodramatic imagination, writes, Morality is ultimately in the nature of affect and strong emotion is in the realm of morality for good and evil are moral feelings. Lara exhibits tremendous fortitude when she insists upon following her ethical and moral convictions by refusing relationship with Vadims, saying yes to her desires in this situation would mean that Vadims would leave and neglect his family and his disabled child. Laura worries and wonders and agonizes over negotiating boundaries of physical intimacy, her desire and morals. Her struggle against her desire is revealed through bodily symptoms such as choked throat and shortness of breath, for example. Difficulty to breathe and a choked throat refers to protagonist's inability to speak and to express her feelings, but also to her anxiety, as well as the social and cultural isolation of the mother taking care alone of a small child and a disabled child. And the cruel optimist is symbolized by her affective isolation. She is trapped and isolated in her apartment, mostly because of her disabled sister who needs constant care. In several passages in the text, parallels are drawn between Laura's apartment and her body, raising the question, does she feel trapped in her body as well? But also revealing the impact the surroundings can have on a character's emotional life. When Vadim changes a burned out light bulb, and here I quote from the novel, the whole apartment became unusually bright. I was embarrassed by this unprecedented brilliance. The ugly cracks in the worn out floors and the greatness of the speckled walls became illuminated. I felt like standing in a ramp light that was revealing the shortcomings of my appearance, my body. End of quote. The apartment is seen as an extension of the narrator's body and it is depicted as run down. It needs renovation. However, there's neither time nor resources at hand to do that. Because of her gender and social position, Laura ex is excluded from happiness and she's well aware of that. Throughout the novel, she repeats that she has no way out, but, and I quote, Diane with her crippled legs and taking care of little Valga. Where is the place for happiness? Really funny. There is place for happiness in other homes and in other hearts." End of quote. Opportunities for stability for having a good life are foreclosed in Laura's situation, and Dinner shows that. Literary critic Skurba disagrees. She writes, quote, uh, Laura is healthy, her child is healthy and cheerful. She has a creative job. She is still young enough to have both energy and hope for happiness. Vadim's love is also a great gift, a great treasure in Laura's life, end of quote. Putting aside the fact that Laura cares for children alone and creative job that she really likes barely provides means for necessities, the promise of happiness that Vadim embodies points out at the, the cruel optimism, the affective relationship, which has the potential to make Laura happy, to provide feeling that she is living that good life, in fact, hinders the happiness even more. Lars melancholic coping with a given circumstances, literary criticism calls stubbornness to remain unhappy. 
expressing an opinion that certain characteristics such as strength associated with masculinity are more valuable than weakness and sad moods that Lara embodies. According to Ahmed, it is not as if she is disrupting the project of happiness, that she is disrupting her own happiness. When she refused to be happy, Lara is struggling against the very community at large in which she finds herself, and that is what disturbs also the literary critics. Sara Ahmed invites us to reread the stubbornly unhappy subjects whose refusal to give up unhappiness, refusing to put bad feelings aside, might kill joy, but also make room for life, for possibility, and for chance. If anything, writes Ahmed, we might want to reread melancholic subjects, the ones who refuse to let go of suffering, who are even prepared to kill some forms of joy as an alternative model of the social good. Not only Dinarak, but also uh, other authors during the time uh, are delving into the question of female happiness and its limitations. For example, uh, Daina Avotin, Ilze Indran, and among others, also Regine Azer, whose novel The Bell, Aka, published in 1972, ends with the question, why are we so all so unhappy? It could be argued that by exploring the inner crisis of educated women, who pursue careers but also value traditional heteronormative family life, these works to a varying degree also testify to the basic cultural discomfort around gender order and norms of femininity during the late Soviet era. In terms of style, Azar's novel Betrayal, published in 1984, differs from Dinner's. It is less lyrical and poetic, it avoids sentimentality and the melodramatic elements and is more openly invested in questioning the position of women in society, and in particular also in literary establishment. There are two main female characters in Betrayal, an experienced author and a young school teacher, Irene, who is also an aspiring young writer and who, like the author herself, has failed in her family life. Consisting of excerpts from the author's diaries and letters to Irene, the novel hints at the Irene's family drama in a fragmented way, complicating an otherwise simply simple storyline and deviating from the novel from the realism, searching for new forms of poetic expression. The novel exposes the impossibility of balancing a happy family and individual aspirations as a gendered problem. The experienced author finishing her novel remarks, I quote, it seemed to me that I had come up with a pretty typical modern woman, educated, independent, confident, and not very happy. End of quote. This characterization of a modern woman appears in other literary works of the 1980s as well. Literary critic Anne Plasm in the article Woman in 80s Prose concludes that in most of the books, woman is depicted as independent, successful in her career, mostly divorced and not very happy, pointing out to the common failure of a woman to achieve success both in work and family life and women who choose career are punished with failed relationships and ultimately with loneliness. In Azar's novel, Betrayal, a heteronormative family as a social practice has clearly failed. Irene's sister Undine raises the, her three illegitimate children with the help of her mother Janine, forming a family unit of women and children. It is mentioned that the author's family, her daughter's grandson and husband arrive at the weekends, but the family exists only nominally author lives and works as a complete loner, as if not related to anyone. And the crisis in Irene's relationship impacting her emotional and corporeal well-being is evoked by husband who does not favor the educated and at least partially emancipated wife who possesses a certain amount of self-esteem. The crisis in the end of the novel leads to the divorce. Thus in betrayal, like in many other Azar's works, in the absence of men, women form relationship with each other and with their children. In Betrayal, the intimacy exists between two writers, experienced author and aspiring young writer Irene, as they are sharing important aspects of their authorship, addressing the questions about dilemma between creative aspirations and family, as well as writing and publishing as women in the male-dominated literary field. In the novel, there are envisioned two available ways for women to achieve self-fulfillment through a professional career and through motherhood which are difficult to balance. Experiences of maternal body, pregnancy, childbirth, breastfeeding, and miscarriage 
also form an important part of the shared intimacy of the two main characters, revealing vulnerability as embodied, ethereal, and effective. When Irene discloses to the author her experience of her two miscarriages, her face grows thin and suddenly ages, showing the emotional burden in a bodily affective way. First miscarriage happens when Irene is hanging curtains. And I quote, I had climbed on the table and accidentally overturned the lamp. When the lamp fell, a shadow separated from the wall and also fell. A huge black shadow fell directly on me. When the light bulb shattered, something painfully tangled inside of me. I cannot tell if I felt it in the chest or abdomen. I was standing on the table, seeing nothing in the dark and something desperately beat inside of me. And again, I can't tell, was it my heart or the child? end of quote. The showing bodily experiences are strongly connected to the emotional ones. And the second time she is in the car together with her husband and they accidentally hit the deer that ran on the road in the dark. Although the blow is not very strong, Irene starts bleeding. As she recalls her experience, she says, in my mother's opinion, the blow is to blame, but I don't remember the blow. And that's not why it happened. No, not because of that. She recalls it differently. In the car, the deer with broken hind legs cried in a child's voice all the way home. And when at home, Gunther, her husband, kills the deer, Irene sees him, his hands are in blood up to his elbows. And she also notices two deer embryos in a bowl in the garage. And that's when the severe pain starts in her body, then bleeding and losing of a child. Irene's miscarriage has revealed the vulnerability of the body locating uh, the interrelations between the corporeal, subjective, and social aspects of life. Her unhappy marriage, failed relationship with her husband who despises and ridicules her intelligence and attempts at creative writing are revealed on a bodily level. However, it's one minute. Okay, I'm wrapping up. <laughs> However, her two miscarriages can also be interpreted as supporting the idea that vulnerability and body resistance are mutually constitutive. Because in the end of the novel, Irene is a single parent taking care of her daughter alone. And because of the burdens of everyday life, she has not published anything in two years. Thus her future activities in the literature are endangered or at least questioned. And um, finishing the novel, the author concludes, unfortunately, the end is a bit sad. Displaying the long-rooted cultural ideal of a heteronormative family life as unattainable, both authors, Diner and Ezra, also reveal the basic cultural discomfort around gender order and norms of femininity. Both Lars and Irene's situations reveal that the clash between what is desired, love and artistic fulfillment, romantic love and emancipation, and what's achievable, achievable makes happiness hardly reachable. Thank you. Thank you, Zita. And uh, this means that the presentation part of this panel is over. Now let's start the discussion. I think we had a really uh, rich and interesting panel. And I'm sure it's not only my impression, it's proved by the reaction and interest from the followers because all the speakers have received questions. So let's start with question to Eva. There are two questions, but probably they can be joined together. So the first question is, what are the main differences between diaries written by women, women and men? And a kind of similar question, how does environment of, uh, affect the writing of diaries? Are there any differences between diaries written in urban and rural areas, so gender and environmental perspective on diary writing. Okay, thanks for the questions. Um, of course, that the, uh, matters, what are we looking for? If we are looking at these women diaries, then we are looking for this uh, female voice. And I think we can find this uh, female voice and that's the uh, main difference between uh, male voice and a female voice. Um, about the, uh, this, um, if it's uh, written in um, 
uh, in a city or, or, or somewhere, somewhere else. Um, of course, this uh, environment matters. Um, um, this um, um, especially I think it matters at the beginning of the 20th century when um, when we look at these uh, women who are in this uh, in this urban environment and in rural, then um, um, I think there are differences in their in their feeling in their everyday life. Um, so I think yeah, this everyday life thing is the main difference between. Uh, uh, yeah, how, how this everyday life is organized, that's the main difference in these uh, diaries written uh, in rural or urban uh, environment. Yeah, and I will probably add my own question to Eva. So you had chosen this comparative perspective uh, uh, and talking about uh, Latvian, Estonian and Lithuanian uh, the, uh, women's diaries. So uh, was it productive and, and how accessible was the content of, of, of those diaries and uh, uh, were you able to um, make some conclusions about the similarities or differences? Uh, yeah, thank you. But I think it will become more and more productive because to answer your question right now, um, of course, I need this uh, Baltic Women's uh, Writing Study Group because uh, unfortunately, the language barrier prevents me from reading uh, everything I would like to read. But um, as we have seen uh, in this presentation, there are common uh, thematic lines uh, on women's activism or reflections of the 20th century uh, traumas as uh, deportations, Holocaust, wars, or Soviet regime, um, and, and also these uh, bodily experiences and borrowing this idea from Zita's presentation also we can think about this uh, balance or imbalance of uh, happiness and uh, and happiness, which I'm sure <laughs> is uh, in, in in every uh, diary written by the uh, women, and um, there is also uh, interesting parallels in this professional life, because there are many uh, diaries uh, from all the Baltic uh, states, uh, from actresses or teachers, and and also this motive of. Uh, wife who writes, uh, um, if we look at the diaries of wives of the famous uh, men. Um, so I think we just need to go deeper and uh, find uh, out more about whether it is also possible to talk about uh, a particular uh, autobiographical voice of Baltic women and how it fits into the overall field of women's writing. Thank you, Eva. And now a question to Solvega. Uh, how is literary canon institutionalized in Lithuania now? And are there any strategies of excluding women from it? I believe the strategies are the same everywhere, just not, not, not to see and not to value what, what they did. But uh, uh, the only um, visible um, list or, or, of, of the canon is, of course, school programs. No, 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 no other way uh, to, 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 to find out. Uh, and so the fight is per uh, and the fight uh, on for these programs and met for methodologies and. Uh, authors included is permanent uh, for uh, those uh, 30 uh, years and with no end. Unfortunately, women still are represented badly, poorly, to, say, to, to tell the truth. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you, Solveka. Your presentation uh, um, 
made me remember my study years when uh, we had, I studied during the Soviet times and we had a, a course on uh, literature of the Soviet republics. And my impression of that time was that Lithuanian literature is somehow more masculine than Latvian one. So it was very interesting, yes, to, uh, to, to hear your presentation about this. So uh, that was just a comment. Do you, do you want to comment upon it? Mm, well, it was right masculine. It was the prose itself was started by women because at the end of the 19th century, it was so unprestigious and the writers like Jamaica could enter the scene because they had no um, uh, rivals uh, from almost no rivals from uh, males. And later on, at the beginning of the 20th century and during Soviet time, when uh, the profession of a writer uh, became more prestigious, of course, women were uh, excluded from it. Mm -hmm. So now it's much, much more be be better situation, but although um, women still um, are considered as two popular writers, like in the case of Jurga Ivanovskaite, uh, who is still not analyzed by uh, literary critics because of being a popular writer. I believe that is gender biased uh, position. Thank you, Solvega. And now a question to Ella Marie. Mm. Uh, would you connect environmental concern to feminine writing? And there's a reference to Irigaray about feminist economy, including concern for ecological sustainability. Um, thank you for this question. Uh, I would say I'm very interested in this aspect uh, too. I think it, it is a bit uh, under research in Estonia. But just now my answer is yes and no. Uh, the way, for example, uh, the switch character Kunksmore solves the problems is maybe something we associate uh, with um, uh, feminine ways of action or uh, how um, this character thinks of such problems uh, like taking care of somebody or um, the problems affecting her home but uh, the environmental concerns in Soviet Estonian children literature um, appeared uh, in both male and female Offers writings in the 1960s and 1970s. And um, even in children's literature, there used to be more male offers. Um, and uh, I think that the environmental debate, as far as I know now, uh, was then started by a male offer. So the answer is yes and no. <laughs> mm -hmm. Thank you, Ella Marie. And the last question is to Zita. Uh, can one talk of specifically Soviet melancholia and regard the question of happiness in this context? Thank you for the question. I don't know how good can I answer it because I have not uh, thought about um, that actually before. And when I started uh, uh, writing this paper, I had uh, actually different uh, ideas in mind, uh, exploring more affect and um, bodily reactions. But then this uh, question of, of happiness, uh, it just came up. It's so important. It seems to be so important in the literary works by women authors of 70s and 80s. And also this uh, discussion uh, with literary criticism about uh, this unhappy and, and happy subjects and and I saw in that um, a possibility for also for female writers to to do this social criticism as well but uh, it would definitely be an interesting uh, thing to explore about uh, melancholic uh, Soviet subjects. 
-hmm. And uh, I also have my own question to you, which is probably also out of out of your focus. But uh, since uh, both protagonists of, of the works you were talking about were were writers, so I, I'm wondering about such an effect as writing shame, which was. Um, conceptualized by Elspeth Probin, uh, which means that um, um, shame, shame forces to reflect uh, uh, continually about the implications of our writing. And uh, well, yeah, um, how uh, the happiness or unhappiness of the both heroes how uh, is it linked to their being writers and being creative personalities? Uh, it would probably more apply to Dina's novel because uh, her main protagonist, um, all the time she criticizes her writing. She feels that uh, her writing is no good. And uh, I actually wanted to reuse this quotation, but did not, uh, that uh, she was uh, happy uh, when uh, the, her, ballet dancer asks um, to read her books of poetry and she blushes and she's very happy that she has hidden them before his visit because she is ashamed of her poetry she thinks that she does not have um, enough talent to to write uh, to write a good poetry but then she um, manages to write some good poems uh, because she's so unhappy in her relationship, this unhappiness makes her artistic uh, ability to grow stronger somehow. Yeah. Okay, Zita. So uh, I don't see any any more questions. So thank you again, all the presenters. So also uh, many thanks to our followers and and all uh, who asked asked uh, very substantial questions actually and i also have a message to all all the followers uh it concerns uh, the the uh, uh live video after the lunch break uh, uh, i have to warn you that uh, it will continue in a new live video and the link uh to it uh, can be found in the comments so thank you, and now it's lunch break till three o'clock. See you soon. Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome back. And we will start uh, the next session of the conference, which is titled Women Writing and Agency. And as the first speaker, I will introduce Dot Cebula, a cultural researcher. Her more recent uh, research addresses echo narratives in an ongoing study for the relationships between the people and urban environment as reflected in stories people tell. And uh, the title of Dot's uh, presentation today is Regina Azara's Nature Cultures, Interplay of Anthropomorphism and Zoomorphism in the Zoological Stories. Please, that's it. The screen is yours. Yeah, good afternoon, everyone. Um, from um, from Sanya's Bachon's keynote and the following discussion, I learned that I'll be dealing with one of the Cassandric lines of um, Azara's narrative. Uh, but um, Mm. Nature culture seemed uh, like an appropriate concept for discussing uh, Regina Azara's zoological stories for several reasons. The first is its currency in the contemporary attempts at the production of post-anthropocentric knowledge. The concept nature cultures uh, is believed to heal as Owen Jones puts it, uh, the crude and violent modern division between nature and culture and the epistemological ills uh, associated with it, such as the division of the social and natural sciences, the denial of agency in nature and the exclusion of nature from uh, dominant historical, political and ethical formulations. 
Secondly, uh, the concept has already proved to be fruitful in eco-criticism. I was particularly inspired by the Estonian scholars Mari Sormus' analysis of natural cultural hybridity in the famous Kiborex novel, the man, the man Who Spoke Sneakish, uh, which, as we know, has been translated into Latvian and recently stage, uh, staged at the National Theatre. In line with this analysis, my intention is also to look for various forms of blurring and dissolving the rigid separation of nature and culture in Azar's works. But, uh, but the main reason for choosing this natural cultural lens was an association that suggested itself to me. It was a parallel between two works of dog writing, namely Ezra's collection of stories, A Human Being Needs a Dog, and Donna Harvey's, um, The Com Companion Species Manifesto, Dogs, People, and Significant Otherness. As we know, Harvey came up with the concept of nature cultures in this book classified as a piece of dog writing by herself, while devoted to critical assessment to the co-history of people and dogs, the pathos of Harvey's book is in agreement with Azar's persuasion, a human being needs a dog whether he realizes it or not, which is expressed um, repeatedly throughout the book. Azar's five short stories deal with the fate of four puppies of an old dog called Grace. Puppies are sold on the market square on a cold and windy winter day. They arrive to poorly heated homes of Soviet Latvians to fulfill certain missions, very much like those Haraway um, names by saying that having a dog lowers one's blood pressure and ups one's chances of surviving childhood, surgery, and divorce. The buyers of Grace's puppies are cautious to protect them from freezing in the winter cold. At the same time, they cherish vague expectations regarding the ability of the small creatures to enhance warmth in human life, or to somehow settle relationships between an unfaithful drunkard and his mistress, between a son and his despotic mother, between a family and a father suffering from tooth pain. Uh, but let me now leave this parallel and shortly address the whole genre as a label zoological stories. 18 stories belonging to this group are included in two uh, volumes published in the 1970s. And I would like to link them to the second part of um, Bake Mosner's um, definition of eco narratives, implying that there is more to other stories than the foregrounding of ecological issues and uh, human nature relationships. Azera was not a merely nature writer, uh, fond of natural imagery. Uh, uh, neither she, in the first place, bothered herself with a poetic exercise of employing non-human narrators. She had an intention to bring about change, or at least to warn about the necessity of a change. It is both openly stated and communicated indirectly through various poetic means. Uh, the most explicit in this regard is her short story, The Song About the Last Sea Cow. Um, in the story, Ezra approaches the extinction of marine mammals, stellar sea cows dating back to the 18th century. The story starts with natural historical information, including the fact that an incomplete sea cow's carcass is stored at the Museum of Zoology in Leningrad. But the rest of the text is an elegy for a species whose imagined last representative is addressed by the author as her sister. Romanticized, simple-hearted animals with members of their habitat are said to have been unable to survive against human greed. They were killed, as Azara puts it, 
one after another on their father land and in their mother sea because of the juicy and pink meat and legendary fat. As a story to draw another parallel, <clears throat> uh, can be read as an inversion of the introductory chapter to Rachel Carson's Silent Spring, published about a decade earlier. As we know, the book by the American marine biologist is believed to be a, be, uh, a pioneering environmentalist writing warning against uh, the deadly effects of pesticides on the life on Earth. Both texts as a story in Carson's introduction entitled The Fable for Tomorrow are composed of two contrasting scenes, one full of life, another devoid of it. In Carson's case, it's an image of a town in American countryside famous for the abundance and variety of its bird life, which is juxtaposed with an imagined tragedy of the death of all birds due to people's passion for chemicals. As a to the contrary, imagines past abundance of life on the shores of the Bering Sea in June, the months of sea cow mating and juxtaposes it with the stark reality of extinction. Uh, the menace of silence as a result of people's environmentally responsible actions is a powerful image in both works. The last sea cup, so incredible and so real. Will there indeed be the last crane someday? The concluding sentences of the story echo uh, a question uh, as are addresses to each individual and the humanity as a whole in another story um, entitled The Elephant. How to live without leaving behind only bare bones, desert and ashes. And I would like to argue that as a zoological stories uh, can be read as an answer to this how or a part of the answer pointing to the necessity of a changed perspective on human, non-human relationships. The perspective she offers herself is a natural cultural perspective, as I will try to show. First, uh, Azara is openly, critic, openly critical about the assumption of human centrality in the world. She repeatedly and ironically uses phrases homo sapiens and the crown of creation to question the placement of a human being beyond and above environmental relations. Here heroes uh, experience encounters with the human world, with non-human world that highlight the illusionary character of their superiority. Like the protagonist of the story, the bitch, mm, whose self-esteem is threatened by the visual appearance of her dog, who turns out to be not purebred. Boundaries between culture and nature, human and no human, are dissolved by the reminders of the physiological similarity of human and animal bodies, by the idea of humans as only species among another species. Uh, the story about the wild boar called Ferdinand starts with an exclamation, a pig is almost a human being. And central to the story is the belief that one can find differentially endowed individuals among all species, among all living creatures, including humans, as Ezra says. Uh, within perspective developed in her zoological stories, uh, having a cat and having a daughter are not two totally different things. Um, in the remaining part of my presentation, I will focus on, on deeper layers of Ezra's text to see how poetic language she uses contributes to the building of natural cultural worlds. Uh, I would like to link this discussion to recent attempts toward um, a post-anthropocentric configuration of knowledge, to use Rossi Bredotti's expression, in art and literature, uh, these attempts are paralleled by a search for poetic means able to transmit a non-human perception of reality. 
for example, or a more biocentric poetry. Attempts like these, however, are accompanied, are accompanied by a recognition of human limits in mastering a mode of representation that would be free of human gaze. Inevitability of anthropomorphism in human authored texts is part of this debate. Um, Azara's texts reveal that she was reflexive about writer's ability to construct others and human perspectives. In the story, Risk Threshold, she describes the behavior of crows who are perplexed by the sight of a cat sitting dangerously high up in a pine tree. Azara interprets crows calling as a discussion about their thrilling experience. At the same time, she admits that her interpretation can be just a cheap anthropomorphism. Anthropomorphism, however, like, unlike anthropocentrism, in the recent posthumanist and new materialist debate has been treated ambivalently. It surely is a mode of looking at the world through human eyes. And to some extent, it's inseparably, inseparably wed to perception. At the same time, anthropomorphism does not necessarily nurture human narcissism the way anthropocentrism does. On the contrary, the projection of human characteristics onto the non-human is believed to blur the strict boundaries between the uh, two realms. As Jane Bennett in her <clears throat> often quoted appeal for a touch of anthropomorphism assures by revealing similarities across categorical divides and lighting up parallels between material forms in nature and those in culture, anthropomorphism can reveal isomorphism. Um, as zoological stories can be examined in the search for anthropomorphic means of exhibiting, uh, exhi exhibiting uh, natural cultural similarities or isomorphisms. Uh, they are really rich in this regard. At the same time, they can also be examined in order to look for the recognition of what Harvey calls a significant otherness. Yet I would like to shortly concentrate on one particular poetic way in which Azera creates her story words as natural cultural words. And I dare to use the concept of metaplasm uh, that originally denotes any kind of alteration in the pronunciation or, or the orthography of a word. Uh, I will apply um, it to the sudden twists, concluding some of Azera's stories, twists in which seemingly anthropomorphic portrayal of the animal world turns into a zoomorphic depiction of the human realm. And it is this swap that generates the true meaning of a story. Donna Haraway, again, is, a, is a, the source of inspiration. She admits that metaplasm is her favorite trope applicable to the remolding of the codes of life through which flesh and signifier, bodies and words, stories and worlds, are joined in nature cultures. Two other stories are most exemplary in this respect. The story Wild Dogs is narrated from a perspective of a male zebra chased and finally killed by a pack of savanna dogs. Human morality brought into play, a play creates an anthropomorphic scene in which the behavior of predatory animals is likened to human crime. The dogs are bandits whose visual appearance signals their killer intentions. They move in a military line and don't hesitate to use treacherous methods. Their prey becomes a victim escorted to the killing ground. But at the moment uh, of death, savanna scenery is replaced by that of the city of Rome. And the story ends with fragmentary international media reports about the assassination of Aldo Moro, Italian politician and ex-prime minister kidnapped and killed by a far left terrorist group in 1978. Poetically similar is the story, The Trap, uh, which has the same title as the book. Its protagonist is a trapped rat whose life history and lineage are being reviewed in the face of inescapable death. Everything in this life has been subordinated to the primary principle to get more. Her ancestry of travelers and robbers, 
her extraordinary physical skills um, of a sprinter, alpinist, and acrobat, her democratic tastelessness and fascistic uh, cruelty, the extended description of everything she has tried, edible and inedible, ends abruptly, abruptly uh, with the realization of being trapped. But the last paragraph of the story suddenly transfers the reader to an office of a bookkeeper or a warehouse manager who faces inevitable end of her fraudulent and greedy career because of an unexpected audit. Yeah. Uh, both stories, of course, have a negative and not particularly original message. As a crown of creation, human beings are in no ways better than wild beasts. They kill, hunt, and rob. And they do this unlike animals, not for the sake of existential survival, not for keeping oneself alive. But leaving this moral lesson aside, let me end with a conclusion that as a rest, natural cultural poetics consists in the interplay between anthropomorphism and zoomorphism. It is a reciprocal reading of nature through culture and culture through nature. That's it. Thank you. Thank you, Datsa. And um, I would like to encourage the listeners uh, to use the opportunity to ask uh, questions to the presenters, to the speakers. Uh, using the digital means, Facebook um, and the slide. And as the next speaker, I would like to introduce you to Artis Ostovs, who is a doctoral student at uh, Tartu University and a researcher at uh, the Institute of Literature, Folklore and Art, University of Latvia. And his research interests include modernist and postmodernist literature, trauma and memory studies. And the title of his uh, today's presentation is metonymy, presence, and ethical imagination in post-memorial post writing. Andre Mantel, the children of the dugout, and Katya Petrovskaya, maybe Esther. Please, Artis, the screen is yours. Thank you, Zita. So I will share my presentation. Can, can you see it now? Is it okay? It's not full screen. Okay. Uh, just a second. Yeah? Yeah, no, it's good. Okay, thank you. So uh, I'm one of the presenters in this conference who will not be uh, speaking about Azarus fiction. Instead, I will be focusing on other uh, and more contemporary uh, female writers from um, Eastern Europe and to use uh, Sanya's Bakun's phrase, which, which she used this morning, I will uh, focus on authors uh, who could be described as keepers of memory. Uh, and also <clears throat> I should note that um, my presentation perhaps compared to previous ones will be uh, more structurally oriented. So today my, my subject is the nexus between metonymy presence and ethical imagination in post-memorial writing. And I will be looking at two particular third generation narratives of totalitarian trauma. The first being Andre Manfeld's Children of the Dugout. And the second is by German writer Kati Petrovskaya, uh, maybe Esther. Uh, here's the structure of my presentation. First, I will uh, speak about uh, post memory and points of memory. Then I will switch to more philosophical account of metonymy and presence, uh, connect it to virtuality in narrative and, and proceed to my case studies. 
So first, uh, I should remind everyone, you probably have heard the notion of post-memory, but let's look at it again. Uh, post-memory was famously defined by Marianne Hirsch as the relationship that the generation after bears to the personal, collective, and cultural trauma of those who came before. To experiences they remember only by means of stories, images, and behaviors among which they grew up. Post-memory's connection to the past is thus actually mediated not by recall, not by direct memory, but by imaginative investment, projection, and creation. This is, of course, where uh, narrative comes in with its uh, creative uh, capacity. Uh, however, the, the existing research on post-memorial uh, writing has focused more on the role of the archive. Uh, and as uh, Alayid Asman infers, uh, since there's no possibility of prolonging, extending, or transferring existing memories, the only alternative is to recreate as memory what exists as data in a mediated form in the archives. So usually in post-memorial narratives, the protagonists, the narrators, they visit, visit different archives, including state archives or family archives, and they try to see what's there and, and, and then they <clears throat> try to reactivate the past by looking through different uh, photographs, documents, notes, diaries, and so on. Uh, what, I'm, what I want to do today is to switch the focus from the archive to something which could be called the presence of the past, which to my mind is an equally uh, uh, important aspiration by post-memorial uh, writers. And here I propose that metonymy is encountered by the narrator in the story world and integrated in the discourse serve the function of reviving the past particularly well. Manfeld and Petrovskaya in their respective works acknowledge that they are writing from a lack of knowledge. In the, in the introduction to the second edition of her book, Manfeld claims to have written the story of her family's deportation to Siberia, quote, from nothing, from faded childhood memories and brown photographs, unquote. Similarly, Petrovskaya, after the death of her aunt Lida, is left with only, quote, fragments of memory, notes of dubious value, and documents in distant archives. Instead of asking questions at the right time, I had choked on the word history. Unquote. Furthermore, both works bring the reader into what Philippe Lejeune called the autobiographical pact, by which readers understand writers to be asserting the, the identity of the work's author, narrator, and protagonist. Petrovsky's novel explores different archival materials and sites of historical suffering in hope of learning about the role of Holocaust in her family's history. Meanwhile, Manfeld is dealing with the trauma of Soviet deportation of Latvians. Petrovsky's writing differs from Manfeld's in terms of style and historical scope. Maybe Esther is less poetic and invested primarily in finding, finding out factual truths. Whereas Manfeld's prose is concerned more with reactivating the past emotionally. What makes these works comparable is their trust in metonymy's power to transcend the narrative and bring both the narrator and the reader closer to the traumatic past. And here I uh, revisit the notion of points of memory, which appears in one of uh, Marian Hirsch's essays. Uh, and she draws on Roland Barthes, a much discussed notion of the punctum. Uh, she is inspired by this notion to look at images, objects, and memorabilia inherited from the past as points of memory, points of intersection between past and present, memory and post-memory, personal remembrance and cultural recall. The, the sharpness of a point pierces 
or punctures like Bart's punctum, points of memory puncture through layers of oblivion, interpolating those who seek to know about the past. And what, what uh, interests me in this quote is that basically, uh, uh, Hirsch is talking about metonymies, and if we go back to Roland Barthes' uh, work, Camera Lucida, uh, he also speaks uh, about punctum as having a metonymical power of expansion. And one of the examples he gives is this uh, photograph, uh, which you can see on, on the screen. It's, uh, it's quite a well-known image by photographer Andrei Kertes uh, taken somewhere in uh, Romania, if I remember correctly. And uh, Bart looks at this image and feels that uh, it's, it's able to transcend or, or rather it's able to transport the viewer uh, to the scene itself, to, the, to, to, the, to this dirty street uh, somewhere in, in Romania. So, here we have uh, uh, here we have uh, a process where metonymy helps to transcend the representation. And what I'm interested in is in looking how this can operate not just in photographs but uh, in in verbal uh, narratives or in in literature. And. Uh, the, the second notion that is quite important and it's inspiring for me is the idea of presence put forth by a uh, Flemish uh, philosopher of history, Elko Arunia. Uh, and he, he writes that um, the key part in these two quotes is uh, where he says that it is a, uh, the need for presence is a symptom of the determination to account for the fact that our past, though gone, may feel more real than the world we inhabit. So he uses the notion of presence to speak about the experience, the particular experience of the past. Of when we feel that the past is somehow still present uh, uh, in our uh, uh, shared realities. And uh, the main trope uh, that he investigates um, when he uh, speaks about presence is actually metonymy. And metonymy for him is not just uh, uh, an, an element in linguistic expressions as, uh, as cognitive linguistics usually analyze metonymies. Uh, for Rooney, a metonymy is something much broader. He, he actually, uh, his, his examples include not just uh, uh, verbal and textual phenomena, but also uh, different uh, objects. Um, um, what, what, is, what is important here is that metonymy is able uh, to create a, a passageway between two different uh, topoi or two, two different uh, temporal uh, domains. And uh, one of the examples that Runia gives is uh, actually comes from uh, literature. And it is, uh, he, he, he revisits uh, the works by German writer W.G. Zebald. Uh, as you probably know, Zebald is famous for his multimodal novels where he uses not only words to express meaning but also uh, different uh, visual materials such as photogra photographs, uh, some, some kind of notes, diary entries, uh, documents and so on. And Runia sees these uh, illustrations as, as holes in which the past discharges into the present. Zebald's illustrations are a kind of leap in time through which presence wells up from the past into the present. And I would like to connect this idea to what is known in a narratological context as uh, virtuality. Uh, narratology recognizes uh, that uh, 
uh, the actual uh, or, the, or the level of, of, of narration can, can uh, include the different uh, virtual uh, re realms, different incomplete, gappy, or not easily accessible real realities that are implied in the narrative but not are but are not actually uh, fully uh, realized as independent world matrices and here um, i should uh, highlight the idea of embryonic alternative ontologies meaning that uh, in, in narrative we find uh, different uh, virtual uh, uh realities that are not that 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 could be expanded by by the narrative but not uh, but are not always expanded uh but sometimes they are and and in, and in these um uh and these and these instances metonymy functions as as a kind of a mediator between the actual and the virtual and uh, in, in my presentation, the virtual is not something that could happen in the future, as it is usually discussed by narratologists, but rather as something that uh, did happen and now returns to the uh, present. So now I turn to my case studies, and my first example comes from uh, Manfeld's uh, uh, poetic work, Children of the Dugout, published first in 2010. And at the beginning of this work, she, uh, the narrator looks at, 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 at this photograph that, this, that you can also see uh, on your screens. And she feels kind of transported uh, back into that, uh, historical uh, reality uh, and she writes uh, yes take me along grandpa i will be able to bend down as much as you i will manage to step over that log that serves for steps and pretensions to grandeur all thresholds here in the foreign land are high they are in fact traps instead of thresholds they capture heat and look the door opens just a little wider than a doghouse entrance. Yes, the door jump almost leans on your Anna's shoulders, and you keep bowing to the dugout doors. You are so bent over that your soldier that your shoulders have taken the shape of a plow. Only it's not the soil they are churning, the fertile black soil or the red soil of Kurzeme. No, it's time, time of surviving. And the narrator here imagines uh, what, it, what it would be like to be present back then in Siberia together with her grandparents by briefly overcoming the basic structure of pictures. That is, uh, she has a, as her start, starting point, as every other viewer, you, viewer will necessarily have, the experience of looking at something which oscillates between presence and absence. But what our narrator seems to do is uh, uh, to take a leap of imagination by ignoring the absence part of this structure, which is her way of responding to pictures affective power. The result is a particularly emotional narration of presence effects, almost a kind of epiphany in which the narrator obtains a virtual body capable of entering the frame. The virtuality of this body, to appropriate Marco Caracciolo's thesis on the reader's virtual body, quote, consists precisely in the fact that it can be detached from the here and now and projected into another here and now, unquote, or projected into the traumatic past. Here, the past is a virtual realm that opens up within an actually perceived metonymy. Uh, meaning that uh, in this narrative we have a, a narrator looking at, at holding in her hands a particular image and then she is transported into this image. 
um, crucially, when reading this specific passage, we are not just seeing another person having a virtual experience of presence, but we are also brought inside the picture. Since the passage has only one focalizer, the one who holds the image in her hands, we have a case of strict focalization, which encourages to anchor our own virtual body to the one entering the photograph. We are also bending our backs to pass through the low doors of that Siberian dugout. And this is how the narrator manages to endow her imagination with ethical dimension. More precisely, uh, the virtuality of presence affects via the narrator activates readers' empathy as part of the process discussed in trauma studies as secondary witnessing. Um, Uh, to, to sum up, um, um, no, sorry. Uh, Manfeld's work seems to respect the boundary between the victim and the narrator. For the narrator, um, here is rather like a ghost from the future, and its virtual body repeats certain painful movements without claiming to have experienced them intensively. The time of the visit is short, but the grandfather lives the time of surviving. To sum up, Manfeld's text illustrates how a visual metonymy can be imaginatively expanded through narrative embroidery to create an ethically meaningful encounter with the past, which touches not only the narrator, but by extension also the reader. And my, uh, how much time do I have? You have two minutes. Oh, <laughs> okay. I had two more examples, but I will share only one of them then with you. Uh, I guess this one. Um, so halfway, uh, uh, halfway through the Petrovskis novel, uh, we find a narrator in Kalish, uh, Western Poland in, in a small um, town in Western Poland where her grandfather's family lived until the Second World War, and where she now meets Pani Ania, who shows her letters of Jewish cemetery in the pavement of Kalish. Um, and uh, so, yeah, I guess I, I won't be reading the, the quote now, to save some time. I would just say that uh, in this uh, quote, we see that, uh, uh, the past in this fragment is not something that is reached through uncanny associations. Instead, it resurfaces in the present. Therefore, it could be interpreted as even more assertive uh, than in other metonymies found in this novel. Uh, this metonymy differs from others in that it uh, also in terms of how it is incorporated in the narrative. This metonymy is present in the discourse as an actual photograph, and it might emphasize the idea that post-memory is not just a matter of plunging into an archive, but that post-memory is a broader phenomenon at work, wherever there is a trace of the past, a trace which has to have a personal and effective meaning to a particular individual. It is evident that this metonymy, which occupies a specific place in the story world, feels more important, more effective, more confusing, and more real to the narrator. This heightened significance is signaled by the way that resurfaced metonymy triggers further explorative activity. Quote, someone connected to me had lived here, and the, mo and the movie theater, a print shop, a letter, again, drizzling, I added another letter to my collection, then another one, and yet another. I was undertaking a dubious restitution of vanished things, which I could neither appropriate nor, nor interpret. Petrovsky's autobiographical narrator experiences time in a spatial framework, which according to Runia, ensures the experience of presence since places are their, their, their repositories of time where the past suddenly pierces through the surface of the present. It does so from metonymy, which disturbs places and questions meanings. 
giving rise to an impulse to jump upon it, to investigate the reality behind it. The narrator, however, however, is also aware that those letters are not for everyone, that people strolling through Kalish streets do not see them and are thus completely protected from the grief which can be caused by the metonymic presence of the past. Wrapping up, I would uh, like to uh, say uh, that my departure point in this presentation was Marian's Hirsch theory of post memory, uh, uh, which deals with the re relationship between the past and the present and offers the intriguing concept of points of memory for understanding the relationship in question. But it has nevertheless been uh, under theorized. It has nevertheless under theorized the way the past is present here and now. And I hope that this uh, um, introduction of metonymy uh, helps to, uh, to, to, to encompass multiple various kinds of metonymies, not just photographs, but also uh, the, the texts. Thank you. Thank you, Artis. And um, our next speaker is uh, Eva Melgalve. Um, she's a PhD student at Art Academy of Latvia. She is also a fiction writer, editor, and translator. And her academic interests include queer theories and post humanism. And um, her today's presentation is uh, about the effect and agency of weather in Zemdegs by Regina Azer. Please, Eva, the screen is yours. Thank you. And uh, I am incredibly grateful to the uh, past speakers who have already introduced some of the themes I will be covering today. So uh, it hopefully will uh, make uh, sense in the context even more. Um, and thank you all for having this exciting conference. Um, so I am sharing my screen. I hope that everything is all right with that. Um, is it? Yes, it is. Um, so uh, whether in fiction as in life has carried different meanings for most of existence of humankind, uh, whether has been crucial in our survival and well-being. However, with the advance of the technology, the weather in our lives receded in the background, especially for urban populations. Weather gradually became a part of so-called nature, which was increasingly seen as separate from so-called culture. It is only recently that with the rapidly advancing global warming that uh, weather has again come to the fore. This concern with weather was my motivation to look at Sendegas or Smoldering Fires by Mregi in Azara, a book set in the countryside of Latvia and published in 1977, to look for the perception of weather in this book from a post-humanist perspective. Uh, and now, hopefully moving on to the next slide, <laughs> please. Yes, uh, uh, moving on to the weather tropes that are quite common in fiction. Uh, in the romantic fiction, weather was used to convey the sense of uh, beauty and sublime uh, which are the aesthetic categories uh, that were initially anthropocentric. Uh, they were set against the human ability to perceive and understand the world, as well as the sense of danger, which could nevertheless be overcome. In fiction, whether often expressed and deepened the characterization of people or situations, one could argue that uh, weather as a way of characterization is still prevalent in fiction, even when no other romantic tropes are present. In realist fiction, the weather sometimes serves as an inciting incident of the plot. However, as the story progresses, the weather events become an obstacle that should be overcome or exploited, things that uh, the characters should have foreseen and prepared for. The narrative solution rarely relies on the weather events as the agency to resolve the issues presented by the complications is the prerogative of the human characters. The so-called climate fiction is becoming increasingly popular today 
but its emergence can be located already in the environmentalist fantasy in 1950s, like works by Tolkien and Lewis would be most recognizable. Here, extreme weather serves as a reminder of the possible end of the world. Since this type of fiction critiqued the industrialization and militarization trends, as well as carried influence of Christianity, it was sadly not well known in the USSR, and uh, these subjects, uh, as um, mentioned before, were often uh, more explored in uh, children's fiction. However, none of these uh, weather tropes are dominant uh, when reading Zemdegas. In fact, it is enveloped by a setting where all the conventions of the weather are offset. At the beginning of the novel, the author is surprised by a sudden pain in her chest and enters the space where all the seasons seem to exist at the same time. Here she meets the characters of the story, and it becomes clear to her that this place is a kind of a limbo where the time does not exist. Soon she realizes that all the characters she encounters are in fact dead. After setting up the events of the time and space of unreality, the author returns to a seemingly realistic narrative. However, the book genre, Fata Morgana, and the enveloping unrealistic scene allows the novel to be read as postmodern fiction that is ostensibly set in the realm where the author is recognized as the creator of the novel. Moreover, the last part of the story concerns the death of the author herself, thus clearly examining and questioning her role. The main body of Zemdegas consists of interlinked stories set in Morgal, a small village in Soviet Latvia. Morgal itself is portrayed as idyllic but underdeveloped place, where only a small shop is present and most activities like school and work usually take place in the nearby town. Even though the narrative involves various love affairs and deep-seated tragedies that creates bitterness over generations, the plot seems to be rather loose. Each story focusing on a single household and the issues, longings, and troubles of individual characters. The weather, also present in many of the stories, is not the main focus of the novel. It seems to be presented, especially initially, as an idyllic backdrop. For example, right after the narrator returns from the limbo of, uh, to Murkala, she appreciates the quiet beauty of the Snowdin village. The first story, too, seems to be centered on the beauty and harshness of the winter. Here, a convenient interpretation of weather events is fully possible. Uh, the story is, deals with estranged parents who are unwilling to understand her teenage daughter, Lelbe. The harshness and coldness of the family life seems to be echoed in the harsh and cold winter conditions, but Lelda's ability to perceive the beauty of the winter could reflect her ability to find beauty and home, hope even in the oppressive environment. However, from then on, the weather events do not lend to such an easy symbolism, especially since the narrative is constructed around several people having very different reactions and perceptions of the same weather. The weather events do not necessarily predict or surround the main events of the novel or the moods of the characters. On the simplest level, several characters see weather as primarily an annoyance and a requirement for more work, while others are deeply sensitive of its uh, beauty. An ecofeminist reading would suggest seeing the first type, the people who see the weather as an obstacle to be overcome, to be linked with masculinity and patriarchy, and the second type, people who tend to accept and cherish the weather, finding ways to work around or even with it uh, to represent the feminist outlook. However, this division does not seem to be easily ap applicable here. I would tentatively suggest that the difference is linked with the systemic oppression of the regime, namely the characters who are subordinated to the schedules and plans of the authorities seem to be more irritated by the caprices of the weather while the characters who have found their pockets of autonomy within the domin dominant, <laughs> dominant regime seems to be more aware of the weather and able to live according to its changes. Sensitivity to weather on a mundane level seems to be also a, a source for deeply effective relationship with weather events. 
In some cases, it aligns with a character that is portrayed as thoughtful and contemplative, for example, Wojciechowski's. Uh, However, it is not necessarily always the case. For example, Ritma, the local shop assistant, is portrayed as likely flirtatious, impulsive, and dreamy. However, as is seen in this uh, quotation, she is oftentimes deeply struck by the beauty of the world. Curiously, even though the sunrise over the snowed in backyard makes her anticipate happiness, this anticipation does not predict positive events in her life. Indeed, her life and relationships get increasingly complicated and troubled. However, she seems to possess unusual resilience. Even a heavy snowfall that forces her to walk home on foot becomes a source of quiet pleasure for her. Similarly, other characters' uh, affective relationship with weather often comes as a surprise or a revelation. The emotions overwhelm them, uh, seemingly coming from nowhere and often leading nowhere. Even though the weather events can influence the plot directly, the effect of the weather on the character seems to be of value in and of itself. Significantly, the narrator takes care to describe the weather that the characters do not notice as they are too busy with their everyday life or relationships. The third main aspect of the weather in Zendegas is that it is often closely linked to what could be called chance or fate, a feature extremely important in Ezra's fiction. The stories in Zendegas, as foreshadowed in the beginning, tend to end with a factual or implied death of at least one character. This unexpected death is often brought on or at least assisted by weather, a snowfall where characters are lost or delayed, or a foggy road where a car crash takes place. Perhaps the most mysterious is the death of Alice. She is clearly denoted as being dead in the opening of the book, but the reasons of her death are not even hinted at. It seems to be simply called forth by a steady, ominous bell-like sound caused by wind beating the lid of the milk churn. Here we should examine a paragraph from the last story that describes the death of the author. It starts with a long uh, uh, interview given to a young uh, journalist. When asked about the scientific and technological revolution and also her anxieties, the author seemingly digresses expressing her anxiety over the fact that she is unable to save her fictional characters from death. The scientific and technological revolution the journalist refers to is based in the modernist uh, humanist notion of conquering and subjugating the natural world, repurposing it as a resource for human ascension. During the time the book was written, both USSR and the Global West were engaged in a technological race which included also attempts to control weather. However, it gradually became clear that the attempts to control weather led to unpredictable and disastrous atmospheric changes, and the programs were slowly and at least partly abandoned. This might have been among the first warning signs for the believers of an easy scientific and technological progress or even revolution. Even though the world seemed to belong to humankind, the only rational agents on Earth, it seems that they could not control their own world and the effects of their experiments. Currently, new materialist approaches stress the need to acknowledge the agency of non-human entities, which even though they cannot be necessarily said to have free will, uh, will or intent, still affects the world. If we allow for the agentive power of things, then our worldview becomes less hierarchical and the human beings and their culture is not seen as separated from nature. This allows us to better realize that global events, such as, uh, for example, global warming, are not simply reacting to human agency. One of the most interesting conceptualizations of global warming is done by Timothy Morton, who postulates that it is a hyper-object Say, uh, which is an object so large, both in, oh, sorry, both in terms of time and space, compared to the human perspective, that the vastly different scales makes it impossible for us to perceive it directly, we should rather consider ourselves to be immersed in it. One of the aspects of the global warming are the atmospheric changes that we can directly perceive only as weather events. One of the main implications of the existence of hyperobjects 
is that in encompassing a multitude of objects, they require us to rethink the reality as a complex structure of interlinked objects that are immersed in each other and affecting each other in multitude of ways. Aware of the global warming, we cannot think of a weather as a simple background anymore. It becomes an active agent in both physical and effective levels. This requires us to rethink the way that we perceive the world or several worlds. We tend to speak of, uh, quote, the inner world, unquote, quote, the outer world, unquote, or, uh, quote, unquote, the world of the book as self-contained, almost independent systems, awaiting the fact that these so-called worlds are not closed containers. They are so porous and interlinked that we should really think of a mesh of inter interconnected objects that are all affected by the higher objects stressing far across time and space. Um, so if I may recycle my slides again, uh, accord uh, so according uh, to Timothy Morton, the reality is uh, much stranger than we think, and perhaps more akin to the eerie realm described in the setting on the novel, where time itself is not linear or not grounded in the present. Even if we may feel stuck in the present moment, it is more an effect of the way our consciousness works instead of uh, a reflection of the reality. Our perception of everyday, everyday life tends to be more like this contained in the present moment and quite lost off. It is uh, quite similar to the way we think of books that they contain a separate world, uh, a real reality unaffected by the outside world and having little effect on it. Just like the writer is thought to be outside the book, even if she writes herself in the story as an author figure, the modernist project tended to think uh, of the world as something outside of humankind, something to be changed, used, and often abused. It would be tempting to set the ontological worlds in a binary opposition, the humanist view that sets the world apart and the post-humanist view that sees uh, it as interconnected and mutually dependent. However, in reality, as in the novel, the both views exist simultaneously. We are all sometimes annoyed by the inconvenient weather or the sunshine shining in our face during Zoom meeting, and we are somehow all overwhelmed by its sublime vastness. We tend to notice it and then let it slide into the background in different degrees of expression. We are now coming to realize that the changes in the environment that we have to a degree created are not necessarily something that we can easily reverse. Our position of authorship in the world we have created is upset. Our own creation or environment seems to assert her agency, often through weather events that uh, creates a sense not only of beauty, but also sublime fear. So the conversation between the young journalist and the writer gains a new, more direct meaning. In the context of our scientific and technological advance, we are now faced with a situation where we, as the authors of our worlds, should be able to save our characters, but we seem to be unable to do so. Moreover, as the final chapter of the novel reveals, the author, who is one of the characters in her book, is even unable to save herself. Despite her refusal to believe or accept it, she has to face her own death. In the interview, when the journalist asks her how she deals with this anxiety, even fear, the author replies simply, she drinks vodka. One must admit that sometimes the realization of the vast power of hyperobjects is so overwhelming that we tend to do the same. However, the ending of the novel is quite different. In an amazing reversal, the author wakes up from the dead. It turns out that she is saved by the inhabitants of Morgal, who turn out to be alive and well, and not only that, in their joint efforts, they save their own creator. Even though in our perception of reality, there is nothing less capable of agency as a character in a work of fiction, it is through granting this agency to her characters that the author is able to live. Perhaps through acknowledging and taking seriously the agency of the most fleeting and seemingly illusory uh, agents, even the weather, we might be able to find ways to coexist and prosper in this strange new reality 
where no world is closed off and even a fictional sunrise written 50 years ago can overwhelm us with anticipation of happiness. Thank you. Thank you, Eva. And I want to thank um, all the speakers of the session, Women Writing and Agency, for very interesting and thought-provoking um, presentations. And uh, now we move on to the questions. And um, a question uh, to Datsa. Assuming the intention was to have social impact and bringing about social change, do you see other stories having real societal consequences? Yeah, <clears throat> thank you, Ivars, for the question. Um, yeah, the first, uh, I think we should ask what can be societal consequences uh, from a literary work or for, um, from writing. And I think that um, probably the main uh, consequence could be some conceptual shift or modified ways of thinking and relating oneself to the world and, and environment. Um, with regard to Azera, I think Azera belongs to really early environmental thinkers uh, of the Soviet period. And uh, I would like to refer also to Eli, uh, Ella Mari uh, a paper and, uh, from which I learned that also in Estonia, um, contemporary uh, environmentalist consciousness dates back to the 19, uh, to the 1970s, the same time when Azra published her uh, zoological novels. And actually, I think that uh, Azra's writing was uh, in some way ahead of its time. Uh, its right place probably would be the contemporary context when people are really more open and more receptive to, the, to, to, to her invitation to uh, revisit the distance and the gap or the borderline between nature and culture, people and uh, animals. Yeah, thank you. That's it. And I will use um, an opportunity to ask a question myself. Uh, can you think of any contemporary writers um, working in Latvian literature who would attempt at um, some similar uh, similar kind of work as Azara uh, did in her blurring of boundaries between human and non-human with the intention of evoking change? Okay, Dita. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, actually, yes. Uh, now I see that I was wrong. Um, uh, not starting my presentation with a disclaimer that I am not a literary scholar. And this is actually the, the, the first attempt uh, to shift from oral econarratives to literary texts. So, and probably, yeah, um, uh, I, I, I would hesitate to, to answer to your question without making terrible mistakes, but uh, the, the question is interesting. And uh, if I continue, uh, continue um, examining uh, uh, also literary texts, so uh, this is a good program for this. Thank you. Thank you, that's it. And um, next question will be for Artis. Uh, and the question is, um, a trauma being about what cannot be represented is virtually effect of presence, not the actual presence, a way of dealing with it. Does that make post-memory narratives different, sometimes more outspoken, cruel, harder to read? Well, before I answer this question, I would just like to add that uh, uh, when we are when we are thinking about uh, human non-human relationships, uh, Paul Bonkowski's fiction comes to mind, and Christian Zaid's poetry from contemporary Latvian literature. Uh, so 
yeah, trauma. Well, actually, I have problems understanding this question, but I can maybe speak a little bit about the relationship between trauma and virtuality. Uh, I guess in uh, in post memorial narratives, trauma is something somewhere between the virtual and the actual. It is virtual in the sense that it 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 happened in the past but it is also actual because it, it, it the trauma returns in in form of symptoms and it, it, it actually directly affects visibly affects uh, people living in the present so uh, the, this question is quite uh, the, the the distinction between virtuality and actuality in trauma is kind of bl blurry Thank you. And there is another one for you from Ivars. <clears throat> and Ivars is asking, uh, is post-memorial writing necessarily related to trauma? Your case studies deal with the Holocaust and Soviet deportations, but can we apply your theoretical framework to, for example, celebrity autobiogra autobiography? Mm, well, then we would have to distort the theory of post-memory quite a bit. Uh, well, yes, uh, uh, post-memory is very much related to trauma and not only to trauma, but also to the trauma of the other. Uh, in post-memorial post -mem post -memorial narratives, we have uh, uh, people remembering sort of sort of remembering the trauma of, of the other, the trauma of their, say, parent or grandparent. So it's, it's, not, it's not their own trauma, but they kind of inherit the other's trauma. But in autobiography, uh, I, don't, I don't know what would, what would be the, the equivalent, because uh, I assume that in autobi celebrity autobiographies, uh, maybe the narrators remember their own traumas but if you remember your own trauma it's not really post memory thank you and um, i wanted to ask you um, if besides um, women as transmitters of oral history that uh, we have heard uh, about earlier have you noticed any other gender specific strategies in, in those texts that you analyze? Because I have noticed that uh, you in your research uh, analyze um, women writers somehow specifically. Well, not only women writers, but, but today I'm speaking about women writers, yeah. Uh, I actually didn't think about uh, something like let's say feminine writing or something like that. I'm not an expert on this, but uh, what I noticed is that uh, especially especially Manfeld uh, uh, uses a very, very poetic and very emotionally charged language. Meanwhile, Petrovsky is, is more, her, her language is kind of more, it's colder, <laughs> you know. It's more, uh, it, it is based more on uh, observations uh, while Manfeld is directly engaged with uh, the emotional side of memory. And, but I don't know if, if it's something that pertains only to women writers. Okay, thank you. And, um... And Dato wants to ask a question for Eva. Yeah, Eva, uh, thank you for your presentation. And I'm just curious, I, um, I know you are a doctoral student and uh, I am interested in your doctoral, the topic of your doctoral work or focus of it. Is it the literature, new materialist approach or agency of matter or? Yeah, uh, but where is the main main focus? Of it? I think that I will 
<laughs> I mean, my first year, okay. <laughs> so, um, but uh, it is of great interest of me is this uh, idea of uh, uh, what uh, Timothy Morton re uh, refers to as the end of the world. And uh, in this uh, regard, uh, we can try to see uh, artwork uh, as created, uh, not uh, in some closed off uh, small studio, but uh, in, as uh, enmeshed in uh, uh, very large events. And then sometimes uh, these large events uh, reverberate in the artwork uh, and uh, we as the viewers are probably not always uh, able to see this uh, unless we do something uh, like a very very close reading of a work of art uh, which would uh, mostly be installations or uh, paintings or uh, um, or graphic work uh, perhaps or uh, ceramics uh, uh, but anyhow, so the, uh, my interest is uh, this trying to feel uh, how uh, the world affects, uh, well, the, the big reality affects uh, this uh, tiny artwork, which uh, probably might seem very personal for the author, like in this reading of uh, Regine Caesar's very, very small piece of uh, dialogue. Uh, it, it looks uh, like uh, she simply does not want to talk about uh, science and technology, and perhaps she doesn't, but uh, when you examine it more closely, you can see how this anxiety spills over, still in uh, her answer, um, which is, of course, uh, interestingly fictional. So that basically she, she did intentionally uh, say this it was not an accident so these things are very very interesting to me and uh, i hope that i will have a lot of time to explore these issues before i arrive at so something more concrete but but it's definitely post-humanist uh, perspective because i i just think that we really need it in latvian science humanities art thank you Iela. Um, I have a very basic question, and maybe it's not um, something you have researched, but I will ask it again, uh, anyway. Uh, what kind of weather dominates in Azeros prose? Have you paid attention to that, maybe? Uh, actually, I did have uh, quite an issue of uh, trying to uh, find out what exactly uh, weather is. It's um, um, I, I would rather say that she is uh, incredibly aware of the very minute changes in uh, seasonality or in time of day, that she is incredibly aware of the moment when the light falls just so and then and suddenly everything glistens. Uh, so it's uh, not uh, when we are comparing uh, her, for example, to uh, climate fiction, then it's not a tornado. Or even if it's a snowstorm, it's uh, described as a normal thing that happens and then people just happen to die in it. Uh, so it's a kind of subdued uh, type of weather that we would normally even not know this. And, and uh, this is, uh, I think that uh, in this regard, she's uh, very. Um, interesting for us because uh, especially for urban people because for us uh, we don't and thankfully in Latvia we don't experience that much of tornadoes or, uh, or earthquakes so we need to be more aware of uh, these uh, fleeting unnoticeable uh, weather conditions so but uh, i'm not uh, i'm not uh, qualified to speak of uh, whether she uh, speaks of specific seasons or uh, specific times of day but I, I have a feeling that she just is very very hyper aware of uh, special moments thank you Eva. maybe somebody has some questions you would like to ask to other presenters I would uh, like to also give my contribution about uh, the current authors uh, speaking of um, from the perspective uh, of uh, 
non-human positions. I would uh, Arvis Vigul's uh, newest uh, poetry collection, Lusa Cirks, absolutely begs for a new materialist or uh, objectological um, approach. And I'm very, very sad that I don't have to do this, but it's such a field to explore. Thank you. Um, yes, uh, I would like to thank um, all the speakers again. And uh, now we'll have a pause and we will uh, come back uh, after 20 minutes for Laura Doyle's keynotes. So thank you again for the very interesting presentations. So dear colleagues, dear friends, it is a great pleasure to introduce our third keynote speaker, Laura Doyle, a professor of English at the University of Massachusetts Amherst and co-convener of the World Studies Interdisciplinary Project. Her books include Bordering on the Body, the Racial Matrix of Modern Fiction and Culture, published by Oxford University Press, awarded the Perkins Prize, and Freedom's Empire, Race and the Rise of the Novel in Atlantic Modernity by Duke, Duke University Press. She has also co-edited influential collections of articles, including Geomodernisms, Race, Modernism, Modernity, published by Indiana University Press, co-edited with Laura Vinkio. Doyle is currently co-editing a collection on decolonial global studies. She is the recipient of several awards and fellowships. Her latest book, Interimperiality, Buying Empires, Gender and Labor, and the Literary Arts of Alliance, published by Duke University Press in 2020, was awarded the Immanuel Wallerstein Prize. Professor Doyle's ideas about interimperiality fascinated both us graduate students and our professors at WashU even before the book was published. Her scholarly articles became a significant part of our debates in the classes of comparative literature as well as influenced our own understanding of the power dynamics in the regions of small states some of us come from. Professor Doyle calls those regions shutter zones and regards them not as peripheral territories, but as strategic inter-imperial zones, again and again wide over for their resources and their geopolitical location. I am truly happy to greet Professor Doyle in our inter-imperial zone, at least on its digital extension, and learn more about her current research. Her presentation is titled, Laboring in the House of Empire, Gender, Geopolitics, and the disordering powers of literature. Welcome, Professor Doyle, the screen is yours. Thank you, good evening, everyone. And thank you very much, Carlos, for all you've done to make the conference happen and for inviting me. I'm very honored to be here. Um, and thank you to everyone who, who has done, I'm sure, much work converting to online and all of the rest. So thank you again. Um, I wanna say quickly, I'm also very happy to be here with uh, Professor Sonia Bahun, um, who um, um, I know from past work together, but um, I wanna mention that I'm grateful to you, Sonia, still for your um, planting one of the seeds of this project with your word interpositionality, um, which you use in your article in the uh, Oxford Handbook of Global Modernisms. Um, and it, it, I was thinking about buying empires, but it helped me to crystallize some of what I ended up thinking about. So, so thank you, Sonia. Good to see you. <laughs> um, so, so I will today be drawing on the book um, and also weaving in some new material and we'll have some brief mention of the stories of Regina and Sarah as I go. Um, so. So um, I'm, I'm starting just with the beginning of the book. Uh, I tried a different beginning. I think this just says what I want to say better. So born into a world of mutual, uncertain and unequal conditions of relation, humans survive through labors of care pressured by energies of coercion and domination. Our life on earth might be described not strictly as competitive engagement over scarce resources as some thinkers have suggested, but rather as a microphysics of 
contingent survival and positioning that we enact with and against others at both intimate and macro political levels. I draw on dialectical and feminist decolonial theory to capture the degree to which relations span these interacting dimensions, that is of shifting attachments and co-formations among persons and communities amid interacting physical and geopolitical forces. I propose that these multilateral dynamics continuously transform all participants. This is in the dialectical tradition, even as the patterns accrue slowly over time into material determinations and ideological conditions that shape future interactions kept alive in memory and materiality. My approach rests on the observation that like persons, polities are co-constituted and thereafter co-formed despite all disavowals to the contrary. Life has taught me this and reading has helped me name it. We might recall that a state's claim to sovereignty must be recognized by other states to exist or have force. Moreover, most empires, nations, kingdoms, and villages depend materially on trade, a relational condition. Even an embargo expresses a negative relation. Therefore, neither persons nor polities have an original a priori independence to revive or defend. No pure origin, only fraught co-origination co requiring labor in every sense. That both humans and polities originate within this condition of entangled co-formation becomes clear when we recall, as so few philosophies do, that a person's physical survival depends from birth on another person who brings sustenance from the material world. Hegel's famous Lord and Bondsman arrived late on this scene. When Hegel positions the Lord and Bondsman's physical contest for control as the original intersubjective moment, much gets erased in one stroke. For his life or death story of labor has no women in it. Yet without women's labors, as well as men's, of course, there's neither Lord nor Bondsman in the first place. Alternatively, to include the labors of care in these struggles is to begin to craft a sound philosophy of dialectical relationality grounded in historical conditions. Doing so requires that we track the co-formations of gender and labor at the center of a long, wide history of interacting political economies. And I'll just say quickly here that um, my use of dialectical here um, is not exactly, uh, you know, Thesis, it's not at all thesis, antithesis, synthesis, nor the stadial sense of one era, then the opposite, then uh, the overthrow, et cetera, that Marx and Lenin sometimes invokes. Um, I, instead, I'm drawing on the more ancient sense of dialectical um, merging from Greek and also more so Buddhist notions of co-origination and of the ongoing constitution of all matter that unfolds over time. So just, uh, we can come back to that if you like. In the book, I argue that these dialectical relations take shape within a key historical formation, the millennial spanning co-formation co of vying empires. Human struggles have unfolded in relation to the organic and inorganic worlds that sustain us, yet in ways that have been pressured by interacting empires whose violent legacies persist over centuries to electrify visions of resistance, peace, and revenge. And as feminist scholars have long noted, ruling classes secure their power and ensure the productivity of the state in part by regulating sexuality and sexualized labors in ways that serve to reproduce race and class hierarchies. To oops, thus to focus on the full horizon of vying states is this to capture the workings of the traffic in women to invoke Gail Rubin's important analysis of many decades ago as an aspect of macro political economy. In this larger picture, both political leaders and everyday folks occupy what I call the condition of interimperiality, a fraught position lived all at once in the neighborhood, at the imperial court, on the road, in the body, and amid the invasive stream of political events and news. To indicate these intertwined dimensions, I'll begin today with the discussion of the dialectical co-constitution of states and economies, briefly touching on material infrastructures and knowledge formations, and then turning to the dynamics of rebellion and resistance. 
Finally, I'll focus in really the second half of the talk on aesthetic forms as they've played crucial structural and mediating parts in these dialectics. My main text will be A Thousand and One Nights, but I'll be making passing mention of other authors, including Azera. To begin with the concrete, so to speak, empires have built roads, ports, dams, and fortresses in order to conquer, and they have also conquered in order to seize control of, the of these infrastructures as built by others. Few quick examples, um, far ranging on purpose. In the 15th century, in the mountainous terrain of the Andes, the Incan Empire, long before the Spanish arrived, expanded to take control of the highly advanced um, roads, agricultural terracing, and mining systems of the Chimor Empire. In more recent centuries, empires have battled not only for land and labor, but also for control of transportation and communication technologies. We might think of the series of wars among the empires of Japan, China, and Russia, with coercive background pressures from France and Germany over the South Manchurian Railway on the um, Laodong Peninsula that connected the iron ore industries, so crucial to weaponry, to the seaport of the peninsula, from which point iron and weapons could then be transported. I won't go into the details. Um, these kinds of battles over material infrastructures, replete with shifting alliances and betrayals, constitute dialectical formations not in any neutral or stable way, but rather as driving forces of dialectical history. And this is so not least because they also typically involve forced relocation of laborers who themselves bring diverse languages, allegiances, and cultural practices. Lots of co-formations. Um, as a result, stations, ports, and trains have sometimes become material sites of battle or sabotage, as reflected, for instance, in the destruction of trains in India under the British or the dismantling of telegraph lines in the provinces of the Ottoman Empire. Like these material forms of capital as sites of contestation, forms of intellectual capital have also been co-constituted by buying states and thereafter have become sites of multiple kinds of competition and contestation. As Jonathan Bloom establishes in his book, Paper Before Print, empires have deliberately borrowed or stolen from their neighbors and rivals library collections. They've sought to understand the science, religion, and arts of other empires for strategic reasons. To allied empires, they sent delegations of scholars who were directed to bring home manuscripts as gifts. And to enemy empires, they sent officers with orders to capture manuscript collections as valuable booty, as in wars between the Byzantine and the Abbasid empires, which you know, involved these very specific directions. Scholars too were booty, kidnapped or conquered and thereafter choosing or forced to serve new masters. As with the Persianate scholars in Islamicate states, because Islamicate states conquered Persianate uh, empires, such intellectuals creolize knowledge while also maneuvering in ways that have undoubtedly shaped scholarly codes that we still work with. We might call this the inter-imperial construction of knowledge and culture. Translation projects were often central to these knowledge building endeavors, which as we'll see is thematized in 1001 Nights. In the eighth century Abbasid empire, Bloom notes, quote, the translation of Persian, Greek, and Indian works into Arabic became a regular state activity, just as the ambitious state supported translation of Buddhist manuscripts taken from India had at certain points helped China to consolidate power in Central Asia. Similarly, in seventh century Japan, the translation of Chinese and other Buddhist manuscripts made possible an island-wide hegemony for Japanese rulers. Translation of science and math texts facilitated imperial trade and engineering, while translation of legal, religious, philosophical, and literary texts helped to consolidate control over conquered territories and to manage relations with rival empires. Although empire's wielding of overwhelming power has made dissent and alliance difficult, peoples have nonetheless dissented at every turn. Their practices have also been primary catalysts in world history. There's much to say about this, but for the purposes of today's lecture, I'll just touch on the vectored manipulations through which revolutionary struggles often unfold. 
First empires have deliberately fomented minority dissent in the empires of their rivals for their own competitive and geopolitical ends, although often, as we know, under the pretense of protecting or liberating those communities. That is, as Eastern Europeans know much better than I and all too well, um, but which has been insufficiently understood as part of the dialectics of history, I believe, empires manipulate the aspirations of disenfranchised communities in order to destabilize or collapse their rivals, as was the case in Russia's sponsorship of client communities in the Polish and Swedish empires in the 18th century. Likewise, in their 18th and 19th century Atlantic world contests, the British, French, and Spanish each fostered insurgency in the other's empires, including among indigenous peoples and enslaved communities. Later, of course, US imperial and neocolonial policy in many parts of the world, notoriously, for instance, in Cuba and the Philippines, similarly supported independence fighters' efforts to oust the reigning empire and then afterward promptly jailed revolutionaries, dominated finance and trade, and reinforced the sub subordinate racialized status of many laborers and women. This cunning and classically imperialist strategy is widespread and long lived as is perfectly apparent today. Yet colonized, disenfranchised and other dominated communities have themselves shrewdly manipulated these inter-imperial rivalries. They have, for instance, regularly garnered support and weapons from one empire for resistance against, we might say, their own empire. Haitian revolutionaries courted British support for their struggle against France, while in the same period, the Irish, for their insurgencies against the British, successfully solicited troops and arms from the French, who were happy to help um, destabilize their enemies, the British. In the 19th century, the Serbian community played the Russians against the French and Austrian Habsburgs in order to win military support for their struggles in, in the Ottoman Empire. Uh, there are many more examples, which I, I, I won't go into, some more in the book. Um, it's so, um, um, oops, I think I cut a sentence, I didn't mean to, but anyway, um, it's clear that the inter-imperial maneuvers um, played by the colonized um, are very risky and they often end in betrayal by, um, by the putatively liberating empire. Yet sometimes this inter-imperial maneuvering from below and between has worked with world-changing effects, as in the struggle for Indian independence. During World War II, leaders of India's independence movements living in exile in Japan and building alliances there extracted concessions from the British under the threat of alliance between these leaders and the Japanese imperial government, which had its own ambitions in South Asia, as the British understood. Whatever the result, leaders of activist and resistance movements have understood that anti-colonial struggle is much more than a matter of us against them. It demands a horizontal alertness and it requires strategies and alliance that can grapple with the 360 degree surround of jockeying actors and states. Theorists and leaders of the newly independent states say in Africa and Indonesia and elsewhere um, in the 1960s name this inter-imperial condition when they cast themselves as third world actors. Yet, of course, the independent states that emerge from these struggles are not, uh, when successful, are not phoenixes rising from the ashes. Instead, neo-imperial debt and foreign ownership, as we know, became an albatross on their necks, along with the empire's installation of puppet rulers and the arming of factions that destabilize new states' efforts at justice and equity. Under these conditions, the embers of memory keep burning sometimes also feeding masculinist and civilizationist dreams of resurrecting past empires of their own among states that have been colonized, complicating things quite a bit. The long view of these dynamics also offers a fresh perspective on regions that have for many generations suffered in the force fields or shatter zones of um, inter-imperiality. Again, as you all know well, colonial invasions of Eastern European communities reaching from the ancient Celtic and Roman through the Ottoman and Habsburg to the Soviet Union and more covertly recently by Western European states and the US via neo-imperial practices. 
situated at strategic crossroads and along sea lanes, parts of the Middle East and North Africa have likewise been repeatedly invaded by empires, reaching from the Persianate and Macedonian through Roman and Byzantine to Ottoman and European empires. Similarly with Kashmir, it's been repeatedly invaded and claimed by vying states from the Chinese and the Mughals to the British, which in turn has influenced vying claims on the region today by India and Pakistan. Such inter-imperial regions are therefore best analyzed and honored, I argue, not strictly as peripheral territories, but as strategic inter-imperial zones. This long historical perspective also makes visible the extent to which each invading empire has left its sediments in infrastructural, linguistic, epistemological, symbolic, and political forms, a heady brew of en enmities and affiliations that then shape future conflicts. Having endured both successive and converging, contem uh, converging contemporary colonizations, the people of such regions are forced to grapple with a complex field of languages and religious or race divisions or ethnicized divisions, all within the 360 degree horizon of continuing pressures from competing empires. Um, yeah, skipping that. The struggles and creativity the struggles and creativity of, of everyone in such zones um, and including women and other non-normatively gendered persons likewise take shape within this troubled field. Their difficulties issue not merely from positions between, now I'm speaking of, of women particularly, between competing men in their community, nor only from their positions between colonizing and colonized men, but also from their positions in a terrain of men jockeying in and among empires, seeking control of women's labors both for both uh, seeking control of women's labors of both reproduction and household care. State building of any kind, of course, requires labor, but as feminist scholars have noted, the building and maintenance of stratified state economies requires the regulation of women's sexuality through marriage and property laws so as to reproduce race and class hierarchies. That is to distribute labor along kin lines and therefore maintain systems of slavery, caste and serfdom. While installing a racialized or ethnicized hierarchy for male laborers, these gendered regimes also ensure that half of the human race, the half we call women, will provide free labor in the household. Thus did Aristotelian political theory deem the control of women and slaves in the household, the basis of control of the polis. Positioned thus and often resisting or negotiating with this positioning, women have been cast as a dangerously uncertain element in the field of relations and Achilles heel in men's control of communities and states. And here we can just recall um, the, the well-known stories that blame women for the downfall of the state or for the colonization of it. Cleopatra, Helen of Troy, the whore of Babylon, blame for the ruin of empires, while women of colonized communities have in other narrative traditions been blamed for letting in the conquerors. And I won't go into details here. Joyce parodies this of, of, of the adulteress who brought the Saxon robbers here, for instance, in Ulysses. Literatures have also engendered and reflected on the position of me, positions of men, for instance, through succession narratives of vying and betraying brothers, which can be found in traditions as far flung as the Incan and the Islamicate. The familiar, familiarity of such gendered narratives of macropolitics remind us that inter-imperial legacies of, of relation occupy the habitus over long historical time, not only spatially in the built environment, but also psychically and bodily in art, memory, and feeling. Yet of course, these are not the only stories told or songs sung. Simultaneously, other tales and tropes have differently shaped the moral economies of human communities and critiqued the structures of domination. In a story such as Eyes, Regina, Regina Azera clearly has her eyes on this intersection of the gendered micropolitics of the household and the macropolitics of colonized states. So I will venture a brief reading here as a, an amateur, a newcomer. Uh, so please uh, tell me I'm wrong if you see it that way. 
First, early in the story, Eyes, when the young protagonist, Olivia, is scolded by her mother for, for tramping snow into the house, uh, the protagonist, Olivia, notes that her brother would not have been scolded or expected to clean up the snow if he had tramped it in. But then she decides that at this moment, she can't be bothered to feel resentment because she's too preoccupied with her memory of a photograph, which she has just seen in a magazine on her train ride home. Olivia, we learn, is an art student, although no one in her family thinks her pursuit of art is worthwhile. Yet the narration establishes that she lives through her eyes, keenly attuned to the colors and shapes of the physical world. The photograph that has her mesmerized is of a man who turns out to be a historical political figure. Although she knows nothing about him and doesn't know the politics, the picture has caught her eye. She is mesmerized by the look in his eyes, for she feels that, quote, his wonderfully living, powerful yet tender look was direct, directed straight at her. When she shows her brother the picture, he at first characteristically dismisses her interest, but then explains in a serious tone that, quote, it is Amalcar Cabral, one of the leaders of the liberation struggle in Africa, the one who was killed by the Portuguese colonists. Something quietly shifts in the relation between brother and sister at this moment. At, at Var, the brother gains a new respect for his sister because of her interest in politics. And she notices with pleasure that he has finally spoken to her as an equal instead of mocking her. At the end of the story, Olivia steps back out into the snowy night with a feeling, the narrator comments of quote, aching grief not yet knowing that the years would bring tender luminescence to this heartache, that this first timid emotion awakened by the eyes of a dead man would remain a lifelong wonder. While there's much to say about this story, for now, I mainly wish to notice that Azera has created a kind of political allegory for the structure of her apparently simple story. And oops, has created a kind of political allegory for the structure of her apparently simple story implies that a change of gendered brother-sister relations within the household can form the basis for a larger awakening of solidarities between one dominated community and another. In the long history of the world, it seems, many other storytellers have intervened in these intertwined dialectics of sexuality and state, household and empire, art and politics. They've embarked on what Theodore Adorno call, would call negative dialectical projects, sometimes encoding their own fraught inter-imperial conditions of production, as perhaps Ezra does. Probably the most influential of these texts is A Thousand and One Nights, or at least most well-known. I propose that A Thousand One Nights offers a deeply embedded structural critique of all of the elements of inter-imperial power. In some sense, it even predicts its own circulation among empires and the ways that it would again and again be instrumentalized by both empires' rulers and their coerced denizens. And I'll just say briefly here that um, Ezra's story, The Swing, I guess the title story of her collection, that collection brought to mind um, Thousand and One Nights, um, because of the witnessing and listening structure between the man and woman on the train, which then sort of entangles her. Um, so that's just a side, um, a side note, especially insofar as it's, uh, it centers on a sort of sexual betrayal by the man who tells the story. So now I'm gonna just turn to uh, Thousand and One Nights, um, thinking about time. How much time would you say I have left, Carlos? I would say like uh, 15 minutes. 15? Yeah. Okay. All right. Let me make a note for myself. Okay. Okay. The framing story of Thousand and One Nights is familiar. Night after night, Shahrazad tells tales to her husband, Shahriyar, the Sassanid Persian emperor, in order to defer his plan to execute her the next morning. The Shah's murderous behavior predates his marriage to Shahrazad, 
beginning when he discovered an earlier wife's infidelity and concluded that women could not be trusted to remain faithful beyond one night. Therefore, he has vowed to marry a new wife each day, consummate that marriage that night, and have her executed the next morning. Before his marriage to Shahrazad, we learn that he has already married and executed the daughters of many princes and army officers, and then moved down the social hierarchy until, quote, it became King Shahrazad's custom to take every night the daughter of a merchant or commoner, spend the night with her, and have her put to death the next morning. After many women have died, as the framed storyteller of the nights records, quote, there arose a clamor among the fathers and mothers of the realm. The state is in crisis, and the crisis is sexual. Enter Shahrazad. She has a plan to end the state killing, and to carry it out, she tells her father that she must marry the emperor Shahryar. Although her father tries to deter her through storytelling of his own, she spurns his effort. In the end, her nightly tales so impress Shahryar that he finally agrees to spare her life and end the state killing. Shahryar's literary cunning has been rightly appreciated by feminist readers as a tale of women's artistry and sisterhood, especially since she brings her sister Dinarzar into her plan. So I draw on many, many of these uh, scholars and the you know, rich body of criticism on this, um, particularly to consider how the intersectional dimensions of her art are geopolitically situated. In presenting a world of ruling brothers and mediating vis visors, the frame allegorizes the ways that these men instrumentalize tale-telling translation and Aristotelian political theory to enforce the captive conditions of women and laborers on whom their power depends. To appreciate the full import of Shahrazad's intervention, it's therefore necessary to, to, uh, for me to talk a little bit about history, the inter-imperial context of the Knights' formation, and the role of, of viziers in these states. In Arabic and Persian literatures, the genre of framed tales belongs to a long-standing tradition of statecraft literature, in which such tales served as mirrors for magistrates. In Muslim political thought, furthermore, such tales often creatively reworked the Aristotelian political model, which deemed the household a subunit and microcosm of the state. We'll see in the story how this works. Contemporaneous and later audiences would have understood that the vizier's two-part tale, all within the frame before we get into Shahrazad's story, about what he calls good management of home and laborers, is also an allegory of state management. This fact should in turn alert 21st century readers to the state implications of both the frame and the subsequent tales. To follow these implications is to see how literary forms intervene in geopolitics, sometimes articulating alternative political philosophies. In the opening sentences of the frame, the anonymous storyteller may insinuate as much when he or she, they, insert a parenthetical remark about, quote, what lies hidden in the old accounts of bygone peoples and times. And then he proceeds in this same sentence, she, she, they, to explain that, quote, long ago in the time of the Sassanid dynasty, there lived two kings who were brothers, end quote. We further learn that the invincible older brother, the emperor Shariar, held power that, quote, reached the remotest corners of the land, quote, end quote, and that, quote, to his brother, he gave the land of Samarkand to rule as king. Although typically passed over by readers, the story of two brothers within the Persian empire forms the conditions under which the empire's sexual crisis transpires. The trope of ruling brothers re also recurs in several tales that follow, reinforcing its importance. Typically in these tales, the two brothers are secretly anxious about or jealous of each other's power, especially since one brother has inherited the mantle of emperor while the other holds a lesser role. Such scenarios were not merely fictional. In fact, history is replete with the wars of succession and rivalries or betrayals among brothers competing for the roles of king or emperor. Ancient battles between Etiocles and Palenices for Thebes to Incan battles between Hasquar and Atahualpa, I'm sure I'm not saying these names correctly, in the 16th century. Within ancient Persian history, wars between Adipzerses and his brother Cyrus the Younger for the uh, Persian Achaemenid Acham Empire 
famously recounted by Xenophon, um, would have been well known to the early audiences of the Knights. For Muslim listeners, the tale of brothers would likely call to mind the succession battles among the sons of the Abbasid Caliph Harun al-Rashid, which hastened the decline of the empire. Thus neutral as the division of power between two brothers is made to sound here, the history and discourse of ruling brothers tells otherwise. In the Knights, brotherly tension emerges when the older brother, the Emperor Shahriyar, invites his younger brother, Shah Zaman, to visit the imperial center. First, after organizing his retinue for his journey to the imperial center, the younger brother returns to his palace for a last farewell to his wife. But he discovers her in bed with the palace cook. He specifically, de specifically decrying the fact that she sleeps with, quote, some cook, some kitchen boy. He sees the incident as a loss of control over his household and by extension, his state, a worrying development for him in relationship to his older brother. Accordingly, he arrives at Shahar, Shariar's palace and keeps this crisis to himself. During his stay, the elder brother Shariar goes out hunting and the younger brother, <coughs> excuse me, with, discovers with notable relief that Shariar, the emperor, suffers the same trouble as he does and indeed worse. The emperor's wife has slept not just with one man, she has orchestrated orgies between herself, the courtier women, and quote, 10 white and 10 black slaves, with their own lover specifically racialized as a black slave, quote unquote. <clears throat> when the emperor returns, his younger brother reports the news to him, now safely revealing their shared predicament. The emperor expresses astonishment that, quote, such doings are going on in my kingdom and in my very palace. They're briefly tempted to leave our royal state, but the brothers instead conclude that women are simply faithless. And so instead the Shah vows to kill all future wives after the wedding night. It's important that these wifely troubles which provoke a gendered crisis of state involve rank and, and race as well as sexuality. For what's threatened is the brothers control over labor as well as women. Insofar as these dimensions work together to reproduce state power along the proper lines, the very structures of empire are at stake, and by extension, so is the men's status in the larger field of inter-imperial relations. In this light, Shaharazad's aim to marry the Shah to stop the killing of women can be understood as a challenge to the geopolitical economy of empire that rests on women, laborers, and racialized slaves. The centering of the second half of the frame on a vizier and his daughter points toward another kind of hidden political implication in this case, the literary cultural dimensions of imper imperial control. This implication becomes clearer when we consider the place of vizier families in early Islamic states. Um, this has been closely analyzed by a scholar, um, Saeed Amir Arjomand, um, who looks at the way that the powers of culture, state, and economy um, intersect powerfully in the visitor, a vizier. The vizier, a learned man descended from a line of scholars typically, and also a wealthy man with extensive, um, extensive political, sorry, extensive provincial land holdings. Um, so there's much to say here, um, but Arjuman concludes that the, um, the um, after noting the ways that viziers have created networks of colleges throughout the empire, um, that these educational structures came to serve as, quote, the institutional mechanism for the social reproduction of medieval civil society, securing the reproduction of a subordinate class. Um, so I'm just trying to move a little bit quickly through this. Um, in this sense, the vizier played a hinge role in the co-formations of inter-imperial political economy. It's also worth mentioning that Women of vizier, vizier families were often learned. Um, Shahrazad talks about how she's read the books of literature, philosophy, and medicine. She says knew poetry by heart, had studied historical reports, and was acquainted with the sayings of men and the maxim of sages and kings. Historically, such women also themselves sometimes founded colleges. Um, all this worth keeping in mind when we think about Shahrazad's bold face-off with her father in the practice of statecraft wisdom tales. In other words, historically, such daughters could indeed assert their power to participate in or challenge straight powers. 
Many vizier families in early Islamic states were also originally of Persian or origin, worth keeping in mind um, after uh, being conquered by um, Islamic states. Um, among the many Persian forms absorbed and retooled into Arabic language literature was the genre of framed tales. So this, thank you, um, this, um, this form itself is in, in, in effect inter-imperially produced. Um, the, the torque in these relations is further registered when we notice that Shahrazad's seventh century Persian narrator begins to relate tales set in Baghdad, Baghdad in the eighth century. In other words, the famous tales that she tells are embedded in an anachronistic structure, one that envelops the events of a later empire within the prior but now conquered empire. So that I hope gives you a sense of what I'm trying to get at. Um, so Shahrazad herself, this highly educated Persian woman is occupying a position between empires temporally and politically. And from that position, she quietly embodies a political situation shared with many. The situation of living dangerously among contemporaneous empires and amid their persisting afterlives. Once these hidden elements become visible, the political implications of the frame encounter between Shahrazad and her father, the vizier, become more vivid. When Shahrazad proposes that she marry the emperor, her father tells two animal fables in his effort to prevent her, the tale of the ox and the donkey and the tale of the merchant and his wife. The tale of the ox and the donkey tells of a wealthy merchant who owned, quote unquote, many camels and herds of cattle and employed, employed many men and who, quote, was taught the language of the beasts. The drama begins with a dialogue between two of the merchants laboring animals, the ox and the donkey. The ox complains to the donkey that the donkey lives an easier life than the ox does. They clamp on my neck something they call yoke and plow and push me all day under the whip to plow the field and they work me from nighttime to nighttime. The donkey sympathetically advises the ox about how to gain better treatment. First, by butting and beating with your horns and next by pretending to fall ill. If you do this, says the donkey, life will be better and kinder to you and you will find relief. The ox follows the donkey's advice and, su and it succeeds. Yet when the ox reports the good news to the donkey, the merchant listens in, tapping his knowledge of the language of the beasts. The merchant immediately impl implements a divide and conquer tactic. He orders his plowman to place the yoke on the donkey's neck instead of the ox's and to, quote, drive him with blows until his sides were lacerated and his neck flayed. At the tale's close, the donkey concludes that if I don't, quote, if I don't find a way to return the ox to his former situation, I will perish. The merchant combines his bilinguality with brutality and surveillance so as to undercut the animal's impulse toward solidarity. In a corollary to the owner's use of his knowledge of the tongues of every kind of animal, so too does Shahrazad's father hope his tale of translation will discourage his daughter's solidarity with women and other laborers. As he closes his tale, the vizier turns to Shahrazad and urges her to, quote, desist, sit quietly, and don't expose yourself to peril. Yet Shahrazad insists, and then he threatens, if you don't desist, I will do to you what the merchant did to his wife. In this sequel story, the merchant's wife demands that her husband share his powers of translation with her. The husband confesses he's a, a quote, afraid to disclose the secret conversation of the animals, unquote, because he's been told that, quote, if he revealed a secret, he would die. With wry wit, the tale has uh, resignedly, the, uh, the merchant prepares to share his knowledge until he overhears the rooster laughing at him. No, it's a rooster. Apparently wielding his own powers of translation and counter surveillance, this rooster encourages the merchant to reassert his mastery over the wife. He advises the merchant to take his wife, quote, push her into a room, lock the door, and fall on her with a stick, beating her mercilessly until he breaks her arms and legs. And she cries out, I no longer want you to tell me or explain anything. The merchant prop promptly follows this advice until, quote, the wife emerged penitent the husband learned good management and everybody was happy. But Sarazad simply replies when he finishes, such tales do not deter me. 
I can tell you many such tales. In the end, of course, she does exactly that. She wields this political tale-telling tradition against her father and then against the emperor. She brings in Din Arzad, which is very important, but I'm going to go quickly through this and just say that with this counterstructure of alliance between two sisters, the text challenges the pattern of fraternally forged sovereignty that has been recently resealed by the two brothers exactly in the face of the, uh, <clears throat> Shahrazad establishes the stakes of her intervention when she shares her plan with Danarzad. Quote, I will begin to tell a story and it will cause the king to stop his practice, save myself and deliver the people. In the very chambers of the emperor, the sisters Shahrazad and Dinarzad will model an alternative political model, model for all listeners and readers founded on sisterly witnessing. Rounding off all the inter-imperial intersectional implications of the frame, Shahrazad begins her nightly storytelling with a story called The Merchant and the Demon. As she explains, this story is about a man who, quote, had abundant wealth and investments and commitments in every country, as well as many women and children and kept many servants and slaves. I think um, the point is made without me spelling it out. When we keep in mind, I'm getting there, when we, keep, um, when we also keep in mind that this Arabic language text features a Persian Sassanid woman as narrator, who in turn tells stories of an Arabic Islamic state, we see how Shahrazad and her many recreators over centuries have operated as cunning mediators of those geopolitical relations in which owners, backed by so sovereign powers, beat women and laborers with a stick until they submit. Shahrazad and Dinarzad step forward to counteract this coercion by appropriating the state's literary and translation tools. In short, the text offers a condensed allegory of the operations of aesthetic culture and the dialectics of inter-imperial economy. By placing readers in the position of witnesses, it invites us to join these op operations. Many, many readers and authors since have taken up their pens and done exactly this. I might say it is these writers who constitute what has been called world literature. We can think of lots of writers. I mentioned here Ulysses James Joyce, servant of two masters um, is Stephen Dedalus. Um, and he also talks about the brother motive that is part of the problem. Um, Aikwe Arma's 2000 Seasons traces millennium of successive col colonizations by both Arab and European invasions. Um, and, and there's more. Um, I'll just quote the um, God of Small Things in which Arundhati Roy um, has her narrator remark, quote, actually um, the problem that all of her characters face began thousands of years ago before the British took Malabar, before the Dutch ascendancy, before Vasco da Gama arrived, before the Zamorin's conquest of Calicut. It begins with the state imposed love laws, she says. So to conclude, this approach to the constitutive place of literature and translation in the dialectics of history, not only might deepen our comprehension of the persisting force of androcentric inter-imperial economy today, although I believe it does that helpfully, it may also make visible the persistently sustaining alliances, dissent and alternative visions that have been cultivated for centuries, carrying both sustaining values and defensive attachments to gendered forms of empire. <laughs> These long accruing legacies and multi-vector dynamics comprise the field of difficult relations in which we are called on to act. I might go so far as to say they are the world. These are the kinds of world shaping dynamics and determinations in any case that an interdisciplinary inter-imperial method can capture. Thank you very much. That's it. Thank you, Professor Doyle for your fascinating presentation. I think it was a very good example, uh, both about what, 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 what is in your book and what, uh, what further developments uh, uh, can you uh, make of it? And uh, 
I'll start with this rather general question or a comment. I mean, what I find uh, uh, a very fascinating thing about your book is your is the re relationship between like sweeping generalizations and particular case studies. Uh, and uh, I just wonder how how you move uh, between these these regimes of zoom in and zoom out. Mm -hmm. And uh, mm -hmm. I mean, we remember Eric Auerbachs uh, with his uh, departure points in his mimesis. So, uh, what, if I may ask, what is your methodology? Uh, how how do you travel between times and uh, these <laughs> all these things scattered in the long durée? One sentence by one sentence. Um, no, um, I, um, you know, I, it started with reading and it moved back and forth to writing. I, um, I guess, you know, part of me does just want to acknowledge that it's, it took me over 10 years to write this book. Um, and um, at one level, I do it just by doing that careful thing that all of us do at, at various scales. Um, but I, I would say more substantively that um, I think that the, the, the logic of that method of moving far out and then close in um, comes from just life observation. That's how it works, right? Um, that is, um, you know, so just to, to be concrete for a moment, um, I grew up on the south side of Chicago, Irish America, Richard Daly. It was the 60s um, that protesters were being beaten on the streets during the Democratic Convention. Um, there was violence in every space I went into. My, the nuns were violent, my father was violent. The other fathers were violent. There was alcoholism. So, so that was that was my world. Um, happily, not all of it, but um, thank you, mom. Uh, but meanwhile, so there was the television, and I had that sense, like, what's the relationship? I mean, of course, I didn't ask myself then, but I think that's that's really what underlies that method is is. Uh, ever since a, a, a sense of how do I understand this? You know, really everyone in my family was a good person, but it was a mess. Um, so how do I understand that mess? And it has something to do with what's going on out there. And so that's all I can really say, you know, it's sort of sentence by sentence and none that underlying question of the personal is political, how, how does that work? Um, and learning more about the British in relationship to Ireland and all that, you know, so it is personal and it has also became an intellectual project. Um, so I think that's the best way I can answer that question. You know, there was no decision I made, you know, or anything like that. And I just realized I had to keep moving between. And I guess in the end, I would say, it's it's the, the dialectical life we live, you know, it's always all of them, you know, interacting in each of us and then with all of us. So, yeah. Uh, uh, thank you very much. And I see Professor Bachun is having uh, a question too. So please, you're very welcome. Please unmute you. Thank you very much, uh, Kalis. Thank you, Laura, for, for fascinating, inspiring talk. Um, my question will come from potentially unpredictable side of, of your argument. Um, you talked a lot about the labor, the, the state management of labor in particular, but also about the, the labor of care at one point. And um, it resonated with me because this morning I spent some time thinking through the position of a woman writer as a laborer uh, who, uh, among other pursuits, um, pursues labor of care for society. So labor of care at multiple levels, you know, we can talk about, and, and their care, I acknowledge, is a very fraught term here. So 
child care, disabled, elderly care. There's a lot of right. aspects of it. But what I'm interested is in the fashion, in a Laura Doyle fashion, moving from this singular instance to, to a great knowledge of a, of a care for society, not social care, but the care for well-being of society. Um, and, and I was wondering whether you had any observations on, on such position of writing, maybe writing more generally um, as a form of labor of care. Um, or women writing in particular um, um, in the context, in interimperial context or other contexts? Mm -hmm. I yes, thank you for the question. Um, I, I do think of writing that way. Um, at, at one level, and this is also a term that gets overstretched and overused, but um, you know, writing is, is, a, is a building of a relationship <laughs> with a reader. Um, and that, that is done carefully by writers. Um, it, it isn't always a relationship that we like, um, but it, it's, it, it often is. And so, um, so there's that. But if um, your question also um, leads me to mention something I was noticing in, in the Azera stories that I read. Um, and I'm thinking here, um, and I, I'm not, of, I think it's Professor Mishkova who um, talks about the onlooking heroine, um, the structure of the onlooking heroine. And forgive me if I've gotten that wrong. I was reading through uh, many things kind of quickly, but, um, and as I read through the stories in the swing, um, I was thinking, yes, you know, I'm seeing that and I'm also seeing the onlooking mother. Um, and, I'm trying to remember which story it is in. Um, the one that begins with the young woman taking a swim and then the young man who, who you know, they, they're, they're falling in love apparently. And she goes back home and she's supposed to do chores. And the mother is watching her and she's worried about this relationship. And at one point the mother, you, you know, the narrator has her thinking to herself, you know, Shall I intervene? Shall, what, how far should I go to put down boundaries around my daughter, basically, and, and to have, make, ensure that she will pray, play her proper role as a daughter? Um, and so I, I was thinking, well, here's, this is an interestingly um, um, uh, sort of benevolently, uh, uh, benevolent, a mother reflecting thoughtfully about the dilemma she faces in the, in the controls she is expected to put on her daughter. And um, I, so I, I was just grateful to Azera for creating this kind of mother, you know, not the, the totally controlling one or uh, the one who could care less or whatever, but this mother going through rumination on how she should be a mother and do the best for her daughter. So that just comes to mind um, when you ask that question. I think in other words, in the structure of storytelling, um, as well as often within the story and what stories it's choosing to tell, um, there are just many kinds of, of care making being featured and um, enacted through, through, uh, through stories. And, you know, of course, why are so many of us why is maybe the majority of people anyway in this conference literary scholars? You know, something the writers have have done something, to, told something that we needed told, or um, or showed a tenderness that we sought. And so, in all those many many ways, I think writers are enacting labors of care. And women, of course, uh, women writers are, or any, really, I would almost, you know, non-normatized uh, genders, et cetera, are, are going to be attuned to uh, the, the need for certain kinds of, of care and of certain kinds of stories to be told that are about a different kind of care. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Bachun. And, uh... I have one more question. Empire is such an influential concept for your book. Uh, I mean, in our region, we are used to think of empire as something 
bad, something oppressive, something that is mm -hmm. like invading other lands and subjecting other people. At the same at the same time, we still see signs of imperial glory everywhere and in some in a way we still uh, we are all like um, imperial thinking is something that is still mm -hmm. present in in many ways uh, how do you think should we erase everything uh, connected with empires is it something that uh, is, uh, is is making our life hard or is there something good about empire as such? Um, let's see. Um, I think I would, I would want to, um, to just challenge the form of that question. And I understand it to be um, not just your question, Carlos, but the question people want to ask. And I think that question comes from a, a defensiveness on the part of those who are benefiting from empire. Um, so Ferguson and these other scholars, you know, well, look everything that empires have brought the world, la la la. Um, and look where it has landed us, um, even if you're comfortable. Um, so, but I, but I think more importantly, the sort of good or bad question obscures so much. Um, it, it's, it's, not, it's not a question of, oh, but they also brought good, so we just need to you know, accept it. I think it's, it's, it's more um, you know, a matter of simply just the way in living a life, you have to kind of come back and ask, ask the hard questions of yourself. Um, the, the, to live a life is to, is to, is to look at the, 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 the violence, the damage, the loss, the cruelty, um, and, and to wonder, okay, what, are we, what, what do we need to do? Um, how do we need to change to, to address this? Um, I think that also uh, it's important to say that, um, as I also try to suggest in the book, you know, there's this, well, I, you know, I invoke Jameson and the political unconscious, and I talk about an imperial unconscious and an inter-imperial unconscious. And it's very mixed with a masculinist unconscious. Um, and um, that is uh, in civilization, civilizationist um, attachments. Um, so I don't know if you know um, Michelle Stevens' book, Black Empire. And, uh, you know, there was an incredible burst of literary production uh, late 19th and early 20th century of um, um, Schuyler and these other authors who were imagining Black Empire. Um, and we too, we had empires that were just as good and probably yours learned from ours and we're gonna have another one, so watch out. I mean, they were playing to some degree, but it was, it, it, it's kind of, okay, well, you're colonizing us, we're gonna conquer you. That, that whole logic of, um, uh, of competition, really, it just comes down to that rather than to understand, well, if you do that, you know, there's going to be violence on all sides. Hello. <laughs> um, so, you know, I think that um, we're also grappling, when we grapple with, grapple with empire, we're grappling with gendered assumptions and attachments. And, um, and so I would just want to sort of move through all those levels that you were saying I'm, I'm kind of writing across in the book and, and, and check in at each point. Who, who is benefiting from these attachments? Um, and who's doing the labor that's keeping everybody alive while all this violence is being done? I mean, men are doing it too. I certainly am not, uh, don't want to overgeneralize. Um, I'm, yeah. Absolutely not. Um, my brother was very good to me, and I have I live with three men as part of as my family. So I love many men. I just want to be clear about that. But I and I appreciate the difficulties. I, I learned to appreciate of being a man in this world because you're expected to step up to that plate. Um, so, um, but I I 
you know, when that question arises, I do say, well, let's step way out from that question and wonder why we're asking the question that way. <laughs> Thank you for very much for your presentation and uh, this discussion. Uh, I think we don't have other questions. People are right. scared to ask you questions. Oh. So, <laughs> so now, now there is the very last moment when you still can ask something, something very urgent. If not, something about Azera would be wonderful if anyone in in the space uh, has suggestions or questions about the connection between what I'm saying and her work. And if not, yeah. that's fine. Yeah. Send me emails. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so thank you. Thank you very much for being with us today, uh, at least in this online uh, format. Uh, I hope uh, people will check out your new book. It's thank you. really worth reading it's a thick book a lot of for thought uh, <laughs> so we wish you a very productive day and thank it you. was a pleasure to be with you thank you very much thank you the pleasure is mutual take care everyone have a good rest of conference bye carlos bye Viewers and participants, welcome back to the conference Regina Azar and Eastern European Literature. My name is Ivar Steinbergs and I will be the chair of today's final session, which is devoted to gender in Soviet literary culture. So I remind everyone who is watching us that you may post your questions to the presenters through the platforms by which you're joining us, uh, Facebook or YouTube, or by going to the Slido platform and entering the event code, or by scanning the QR code you see on the screen. I also remind the presenters that each of you has 20 minutes for your presentation and that I will invite you to wrap up if you exceed your time. Our first speaker is Tuoms Tjensis, who has been a researcher at the Archives of Latvian Literature, uh, Latvian Folklore, for uh, more than a decade. He is interested in disciplinary histories of Baltic uh, folkloristics and mythology, Soviet heritage, cultural nationalism, and creative interpretations of folklore in visual art. His presentation is entitled simply, Soviet Latvian woman. So I give over the floor to you, Tuoms, please. Good evening. Uh, so I will start with uh, my screen. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, so um, currently I'm researching uh, Baltic artists in late late socialism period and um, especially printmaking. Artists making prints, or as we call them here, graphic artists. And uh, trying to reconstruct their uh, life borrowed of that time, one of resources uh, I looked up was uh, post-socialist fiction on Soviet times. And that was a spectacular failure. See, um, because of uh, worst Soviet experience or anything that was banned in Soviet times or that was marginal in Soviet discourse, uh, all of that became the most valuable currency for many of post-socialist writers depicting this time in the uh, 90s and um, still today, I think. And uh, the novel of Soviet Latvian woman um, has it all. There are the most wretched subjects, they are alienated, confused, and uh, there is violence and murder. And the uh, women in this novel, uh, protagonists are lost and without any agency. And apart from similarities of titles uh, between the novel and the most popular magazine, uh, the author confronted the Soviet official narrative of women's magazines in the novel's text too. Here, the protagonist sleeping in her in the prison uh, muses about her cellmates. I will read quote. 20 Soviet Latvian women, 
Do we have something in common? Maybe it's an invented ideal, fairy tale character. Maybe such a woman used to appear only in pages of magazines. Next to advice on housekeeping, raising children and gardening. They do not sleep on a narrow bunk in a shared cell. They do not sew bag alike coveralls all day long. They do not smoke the cheapest fags. Their husbands are not dead, drunkards or imprisoned. But now, what, what was the magazine he was talking about and I will be? Uh, let's take a look. Uh, the magazine Soviet Latvian Woman uh, was an embodiment in, of Soviet public discourse of, uh, on women and womanhood in Soviet Latvia. And uh, in 20 years, it has become the most popular, the most printed magazine in whole Latvia, in whole Soviet Latvia, that is. And uh, paradoxically, it both pro promoted uh, this uh, socially active, politically engaged, um, and uh, professionally successful so socialist woman in her public life, but at the same time uh, enforced many existing gender stereotypes reg regarding private life. And uh, the magazine uh, hosted all female staff, and, uh, but its exceptional status is well illustrated by two anecdotes. Uh, one was that the uh, staff photographer, uh, Alice Ilyina, was the only female staff photographer in all Soviet Latvia. And um, also another curiosity, as uh, Latvian language features gendered nouns, if, if that's correct term, uh, the staff called uh, their female editor-in-chief in the masculine known redactors. Well, um, and uh, my hero, the artist, uh, Zid Razerga, spent in Soviet Latvian woman her whole working life from graduation of Academy of Arts until pension. And uh, one could say, why also it's a very interesting research subject for me, uh, that her career there covered whole period of uh, late socialism and was as stable as the later two. And uh, this stability both enabled her artistic freedom and provided many publishing opportunities in the same journal and um, other press. And uh, yet her position was um, constituted by this general Soviet gender order that magazine promoted. Uh, Soviet Latvian woman was a local version of a global franchise that aimed to spread the communist ideology and particular construction of uh, woman uh, and its role within it. And uh, by um, 1918, 1985, this um, colorful monthly was exported to 148 countries, uh, printed in a dozen of in languages, and that was just this central edition we see below. Uh, also, as there is Estonian example, there was uh, localized versions uh, in uh, all, perhaps all Soviet republics and uh, also other socialist countries, socialist bloc countries. And uh, these magazines um, were um, instrumental to socialist gender policy, which was uh, realized within uh, a broader um, social dispositive, what I call in this presentation here, uh, reality. And first of all, uh, it was this master image of working mother, uh, in reality signifying uh, a woman working in two shifts, which is this well-known image from feminist writing, or actually three shifts, because the uh, day labor was so poorly paid that uh, she had to, to, to take up two, two jobs. 
And uh, there I'd like to borrow from Jana Kuka in the statement that the uh, capitalist patriarchy of dependence on um, brothers, father and uh, husband was replaced by a uh, socialist patriarchy of dependence on state and party and state and party was mostly represented by uh, men. And uh, despite the official ideology of um, equality, we see a significant misbalance between uh, in women's access to power and uh, leading positions in society and uh, various industries. And uh, this misbalance, um, as we see in data there below, it doesn't correlate with uh, education or employment in specific industries. It could be that a uh, whole factory of workers are uh, women, but uh, the uh, chief of the factory, the head of the factory will be a man anyway. And uh, so one could say that women hit the proverbial glass ceiling um, in Soviet Union rather soon in their careers. And speaking on that, uh, Another source of my research uh, was autobiographies of Soviet Latvian artists and uh, intellectuals, uh, journalists, and so on. And uh, here I came upon a hypothesis that this glass ceiling was also a proverbial ceiling of glasses, in a way, because uh, drinking in uh, Soviet Union was rather gendered practice that heavily reinforced the patriarchal social hierarchy. And uh, because ritualized alcohol consumption was an important part of hegemonic masculinity as a cultural norm, and uh, also it formed networks of uh, influence within uh, both formal and informal structures of power. Uh, and um, those rituals more than often excluded women. And some women, like my hero here, excluded themselves too. So, who was she? Um, at the Academy of Arts, Cesar Gaio majored in posters, uh, but still chose not to work in this genre because it was too heavily involved in uh, propaganda. propaganda. Uh, in, instead, uh, she chose more intimate forms of printmaking, um, like um, especially book plates, so called ex libris. Um, she was very active participant uh, in local and international exhibitions, uh, mostly within the socialist bloc, and regularly went on creative trips abroad through the um, whole region uh, to those like creative houses uh, in different republics. And uh, she rarely did book illustrations, but often published her works in periodicals in the same uh, Soviet Latvian woman and um, also other. And uh, her creative path was recognized and promoted by Central Professional Association, um, that's Soviet Latvian Artists Union, and uh, where she held also a position that is illustrative to gender order I just described. Um, so uh, why I'm so interested in her? In her. Uh, Azergail was one of the main interpreters of Latvian folklore in Soviet printmaking. Um, on the right, uh, that's um, one of her most iconic prints from the series Latvian folklore. And uh, there we see this uh, kind of ethnographic traditional thrashing barn or kiln house. And uh, her signature, this geometry of rays from multiple suns in the sky. And uh, on the left, there are those two folk maidens. And, um, and that's also a frequent character in her works. Uh, but what's interesting, the same character on the, um, on the small picture is drawn in uh, 1943, that is during the Nazi occupation and uh, before Soviets. And, uh, but the bigger picture is uh, from 
late 60s, if I'm not mistaken. And uh, it's a full page in uh, one of daily newspapers and uh, red letters here, here below says uh, long live Soviet Latvia. There is also the title, official title of the picture and it is uh, in um, family of brothers like repairing the brotherly Soviet republics. And uh, this um, very um, strict similarity uh, through different contexts uh, leads me of thinking about a flexible creative strategy that is compliant with political power or different political powers, but not determined by it. And, uh, Folklore and uh, landscape also uh, were closely intertwined subjects in her work and as and constituted part of this strategy. And uh, both by choice of subject matter and uh, lens of interpretation, uh, she remained a rather conservative artist uh, through her whole life. It's especially well visible if we see um, catalog catalogs of Tallinn Print Triennale, that was uh, kind of most contemporary context for her works, where he, she was participating uh, several times. And um, I believe that in um, this regard, in, in um, choice of this stylistic choices and choices of subject matter, uh, she was strongly influenced by her path of education. Uh, first, she was studying architecture in, uh, from 57 to 50, uh, and that was a kind of uh, arch reactionary field in um, Stalin's time. And uh, later, when she was studying uh, printmaking in uh, the um, academy, uh, she was a student of uh, very um, realist, conservative, teachers like um, Apinis and Upitis. Uh, also, she recalls later that she was very influenced by them and uh, continued relationship uh, long, long after the uh, graduating academy. Uh, and uh, those two distinguished professors uh, in their turn were students of Latvian national romanticist printmaking, gram printmaking grandmaster Richard Zarin. So we can see some kind of uh, continuity or artistic tradition that stretches like from the um, end of 19th century to the beginning of the 21st. And uh, during Soviet times, her work drew legitimacy from the principle of national form in socialist context. Uh, but What's uh, very interesting, uh, interpretations of folklore in this Soviet dispositive often stood for national form or replaced the national form by the reference that this was a kind of national culture, national folklore. And uh, by so replacing form with content and reversing the principle in the, uh, and uh, by that kind of leaving this actual socialist content uh, outside of it or in the brackets. So in conclusion, we see artist who was neither victim of the regime nor dissident uh, nor active collaborator and uh, who worked for socialist state, but at the same time did whatever she liked to do in her uh, creative life, um, following her artist's calling, and uh, who worked for the Soviet gender ideology for magazine, but didn't represent it uh, fully at least, and uh, who was a socialist artist, but upheld Latvian national identity in um, very traditional long-lasting forms, and uh, also with her works powerfully resonated with uh, global folklore revival from like late 60s to 1990s. And uh, last, 
her life and work bridge late socialism and post socialism but what's interesting uh, does not present rapture between both eras it's kind of very seamless continuity so that will be all for a moment thank you Thank you, Tums, uh, for your presentation. We're moving on uh, with our next speaker and we will have a discussion at the end of uh, all three presentations. And so uh, our next uh, presenter is Janis Uzvolinch, representing both the Art Academy of Latvia and the Institute of Literature, Folklore and Art of the University of Latvia. Uh, <clears throat> Uzo Lynch is the editor or co-editor of different books related to literature and queer studies and is interested in queer representation and masculinities in contemporary art and Soviet cinema, as well as the historical development of narrative theories and the literary heritage of Andra Neiburga. And his presentation is on the late Soviet masculinity and violence in the short stories of Andra Neiburga. Janis, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you, Ivars. Uh, I will start with a, a short epigraph from Andre Neiburg, published, uh, taken from an interview that was published in 1994 in the uh, magazine Riga's Likes, Riga Times, and that inspired me to do this research in violent masculinities in her short stories. And I'm quoting, I'm afraid of pain, of violence, of illness. So literary critics have described the characters created by Andra Neiburga as freaks and losers, but she has managed to capture significant societal changes through literary text using a dialogical approach that balances between notional and concrete, grotesque and real. This paper will contribute to analyzing how violent masculinities are constructed in particular historical circumstances. The close reading, and this time for only one uh, short story because of the time limitation, The Hill Climber provides uh, an insight into a broader range of issues related to the reflection of violence in the late Soviet prose. The paper will highlight how violent masculinity is deconstructed using a female viewpoint and what techniques are used to analyze such subjectivity. The story, The Hill Climber by Andre Neiburg is designed as a short uh, chronological chain uh, of events uh, arranged in four uh, thematic blocks. The first is dedicated to Maria, Jakob's mother, describing the events before her son was born. From the very first sentence, the narr narrator hints at the flourishing of Maria's sexuality, but the grandmother's witch prophecies warn of a hot apocalyptic summer with unexpected twists and turns. Maria's suitor, the tractor driver Jaseps, is described as helpful and there's a quote, in heavy clay clad boots and red eyes in the wind. End of the quote, he affirms his manhood by being helpful and his feelings can be understood only by the brief phrases when he looks at Maria and uh, sometimes at the permission to lay uh, quoting uh, Andre Neibor, Gale, his hand on Maria's hand, end of the quote. The reader is given the impression that Yazeps is a simple, cumbersome and hardworking man who, and there's a quote, had the palms of his hands like the scrapers of a horse and smelled of the earth and the barn, end of the quote, just like his intended bride. However, Maria does not want to settle for a predictable life in the countryside, so she decides to go to Riga. The reader is not exposed to the events in the city. They can only be guessed at in a short episode at the end of the first part of the story when Maria returns home. Accepting Yazeb's temptation, she reveals that she is pregnant. He perceives this fact emotionally, not only as an insult to self-esteem, but also as an insult to his manhood. And here's a quote, Yazeb's grabbed Maria by the palm of her hand, but immediately released her. He could not raise his hand against the child of love. End of the quote. The fragile line of mutual trust is currently being broken, pointing to the first signs of violence that have been stifled in this conflict situation. As the structure of the story shows, the first manifestation of domestic violence seem invisible and are known only to the abuser and the victim. It is possible to distinguish several levels which show the expanding circle of people who learn about what is happening. The first eyewitnesses are children, 
The next circle includes relatives and friends who notice the physical effects on the victim's body and the psychological changes. When violence transcends the boundaries of private space, confrontational situations are experienced by colleagues and those involved by chance. And this is the last moment well, when social workers and police are involved in resolving conflicts if one of the um, immediate circles has not uh, facilitated it before. Some men use violence to maintain a dominant position. Tools of violence against women include verbal harassment and teasing, physical assaults, including rape and bodily harm that causes not only psychological, but also physical trauma, which is not possible to forget. Violent masculinity does not apply to most men, but those who attack women believe that they have such rights based on ideology of superiority inherent in hegemonic masculinity. Starting with the second part of the story, when the reader is introduced to the main character named Jacobs and the most significant scenes from his childhood and early adolescence, Jacobs is depicted in several episodes as an eyewitness to the violence against his mother. And here is, here is a quote. Father sights, mother pants, the room sways. Who was he? Who was he? Father's choked voice. Jacobs hears the beats. They alternate with other incomprehensible sounds who he was, who he was all night. At the, at, at the age of eight, when Jacobs uh, begins to go to school, he already has four sisters. However, his mother loves him the most. When the father raises his hand against his mother during the day, Jacobs falls in the middle. The father never beats him, only throws him aside like a bundle of beans." End of the quote. Focalizing these events through the eyes of Jacobs, the reader experiences physical violence against Maria, including beatings, rape, and psychological terror. Jacob seeks not only to establish the identity of Jacobs' father, but also to break uh, Maria's opposition in order to have his authority recognized. Violent sexual relations between spouses are not an obligation that would be justified in any way by the certain uh, by the creation of offspring. In the relatively recent past, has sexual violence in marriage has been recognized as existing and condemned. Conflict is often denied by those involved unless the limits of privacy are violated when the general public becomes aware of it. However, it should be noted that a wife's infidelity is often used as an excuse to justify her husband's violence. Alcoholism, like any other form of addiction, only exacerbates the conditions for violence, but is ra rarely the actual cause. The perpetrators justify their actions based on a patriarchal view of gender roles, where the wife is subjected to a husband who is entitled to punish his wife for disobedience and transgression. Research in sociology and psychology has shown that women are often blamed for failing to do their homework correctly. Children are witnesses to parental conflicts and often become victims of violence themselves. Tyranny affects family members physically and psychologically, and in such circumstances, violence often becomes a learned pattern of behavior. As will be seen later in the analysis, this is also the case with Jacobs. Domestic violence is also exacerbated by the condemnation of the surrounding community with no less cruel manifestations, ridicule, slander, and questioning of Yazeb's masculinity. The fact that Yazeb's, in the opinion of the villagers, is unable to prevail over his wife calls into question his manhood, not only socially, but also in terms of sexual performance. Significantly, Jacob's teacher's article published in a local newspaper emphasizes family alcoholism, theft, and the resulting disadvantages for growing children Often when a person is accused of alcoholism, a person is deprived of part of the responsibility, thus writing of the causes of the violence at the expense of addiction. A violent alcoholic uh, has, been, has long been part of the social landscape. The violence is concealed, although Maria's body testifies to it. It is also the norm for the surrounding men who turn against Yazeps as a cuckold to raise their hands against Maria, mainly because he has become a cuckold several times, which is evident in the episode where the story is again focalized um, through Jacob's eyes. And here's a quote, go Maria, someone shouts and whistles. The mother stops and slowly turns her head back. The father broke 
her mouth yesterday. Her lips were swollen and scaly, but she looked beautiful. The mother stops and slowly turns her head back, and Jakob sees no shame or anger on her face. The eyes, wavy and burning, turn into the big laughter, the swearing words over her lips even rougher than he has just heard. The end of what is being said stifles in the roar of the boy's laughter. End of the quote. Jakob's violence is directed not only against Maria, but also against the people who have been involved in the family drama by the village gossip. Although the narrator does not say this in words, it becomes clear to the reader that the teacher's windows with stones were most likely broken by Jaseps and also the stabbing of Antons, a man with whom Maria have had sexual intercourse and the subsequent disappearance of Jaseps are interrelated events. The violence against the mother practiced by the foster father and the alcoholism of both parents undoubtedly influenced the formation of Jakob's personality. The mother is the closest person in the family, but he is taught ethical values and craftsmanship by a carpenter who is not involved in the hegemonic masculinity practiced by the surrounding man and performs the function of a missing father in the story. The carpenter's physical disability is compensated by his humanity and restraint. And here's a quote, strange, all small but strong. The left hand is missing two fingers up to the left bone. Lately, he's starting to lose the brightness of his eyes, relying on touch. End of the quote. As a teenager, stereotypes of masculinity are echoed in Jakob's possession. He smokes to become more masculine, falls in love with an older girl and tries to get closer to the village society, which has pushed him away from birth. The story's culmination is when Jakob raises his hand against his mother. Significantly, in this episode, he is first called Jakob by the narrator and the violence against his mother is described as a testimony to his growth. And here's the quote, Jakob takes his mother home and beats her. He's already 16 years old. Without realizing it, he has become a man. End of the quote. There are differences about, among social science researchers in interpreting the cause of violence. Psychologists point to the importance of individual pathologies that view violent behavior in the context of impaired personality processes. Sociologists, for their part, emphasize the importance of the social context and in particular hegemonic masculinity. However, the two approaches are not mutually exclusive and their interactions provide even broader interpretations. If at the beginning of psychoanalysis, according to Michael Kimmel, one of the dangers of masculinity was the boy's close connection with his mother, then the, represent, uh, the representatives of modern feminist psychoanalysis believe that boys' upbringing often goes to the other end, Boys are separated from their mother so much that they do not acquire emotional skills like sensitivity, caring, responsibility, emotional responsiveness, which are particularly important not only in the context of relationship, but also in the context of gender equality. Moreover, the boy's identification with his mother is usually interrupted by himself. An example of this is the widespread objection in culture, boys do not cry. If the father's image was necessary for Freud's psychoanalysis, then representatives of feminist psychoanalysis since the mid-70s have drawn attention to the mother, writing about the separation of boys from femininity in the pre-disciplinary phase that characterizes the close relationship between mother and child. In the third part of the story, the events take place in Riga, focusing on the years of Jakob's studies, he diligently attends evening school, works as a carpenter, lives frugally to save money and helps Anna's grandmother to do the homework. The changes also affect Jacob's appearance. And here's a quote. He had become shouldered and masculine, inherited broad bones of his mother, shaved his beard and grew a mustache. No more smoking. It is too expensive. End of the quote. Anna takes over Jakob's upbringing, emphasizing the importance of material values in life. Jakob feels proud and satisfied about his sexual performance as well. However, joining the city's youth possesses other challenges. And here's the quote. With those who came from the countryside, Jakob did not want to interact, but the others did not want to interact with him. 
There was also a clothing problem. Jacobs noticed that most of the students were divided in two parts, one wearing the brand and the other in suits with communist badges. Jacobs uh, chose a suit. It seemed cheaper and more respectable. Furthermore, he learned to think every word. End of the quote. This episode shows that inclusion in the cities associated with a different kind of masculinity constituted by material values and social status. As a result, Jacobs is becoming more and more estranged from his family, not attending his grandmother's funeral instead of sending money, and letters from his mother are less frequent, and Jacobs notices that they are, and he is a quote, full of grammatical errors. Unbeknownst to himself, he learns the manners and befriends Andres, a talented, lazy guy dressed in jeans, whose family's well-being Jacobs finds admirable. The life story of a country boy seems unusual to Jacobs' new acquaintances. He constructs convincingly, and the improved narration seems exciting even to the snobbery new friends, and is summarized in Andre's sister's ilga statement that, and I'm quoting, there is something in that hick, end of the quote. Jacobs manages to integrate into the new society, which both the surrounding students and the teachers appreciate. He also tries to control the manifestations of rural masculinity, spitting and fighting, but this does not apply to his sexuality. Jacobs prefers Ilga, a girl with a higher social status than Magda, whom Jacobs describes as silly and vulgar. Magda's attachment to Jacobs and her unplanned pregnancy is a burden. I'm uh, quoting him, the bitch was not careful, end of the quote, that Anna undertakes to solve. His treatment of the young woman replicates the foster father's treatment of his mother. Jacobs himself is also a child of an unplanned pregnancy. And at this point, the story becomes didactic as illusions about Rika as an opportunity city shatter, providing how much the city changes the lives of young people who have come from the countryside. This motive reappears in Neiburg's uh, short prose later as well. Moreover, as seen uh, in this story, Maria is in a similar situation, and Anna says to Jacobs, and I'm quoting, your mother was a fool. It would have been a lot smarter than if she had listened to me. She would have lived in Riga with a four-room apartment and a car. However, she ran back, fool. End of the quote. After Magda's abortion, Jacobs maintains a relationship with both young women, but it does not last long, as the foster father has always treated his mother as an abuser. Jacobs has mastered the same model, unable to rule himself when Ilga does not allow to be sexually harassed. Contrary to Magda's submissiveness, Ilga defends herself with an ashtray. The reaction to the refusal fully replicates the circumstances in Jacob's family. The manners learned are abandoned and an unprecedented and a repressed resentment breaks out. And here's a quote. Jacob slammed and left her rudely, slammed the door and left her rudely and with pleasure, slamming the door loudly. The cursing had, uh, had calmed down, but not completely. As he walked home, he knocked on Magda's window. Someone has to pay. End of the quote. The incident with Ilga becomes an excuse that her brother Andres uses to oust Jacobs from the circles of newly acquainted friends. This leads to an exacerbation of the illness, which is caused not only by mental, but also physical exertion. And the quote, everything was disturbing. Steps on the street, dripping water from the tap, Sewing firewood somewhere on the side of the street, Anna's sewing presence in the second room, and the, the quote. Although the illness is not named, Jacob's perceptual and cognitive disorders indicate schizophrenia. Difficulty concentrating increases the anger and desire to distance oneself from surrounding society. He leaves university and the city. Jacob's return to his native village after eight years of absence is a recognition of defeat. If the village has developed during Jacob's absence, then the family house has been demolished during these years because, as the narrator emphasizes, a man's hand was lacking to maintain them. Returning arouses both curiosity and ridicule of the surrounding people, and the mental illness progresses. Jacob isolates himself from society and his family, his mother and Magda. 
In Jacob's eyes, both women seem as frayed and untidy as the family house. The tragic finale of the story in which the mother understands the son, son's madness is shaped as a resemblance to the way of Christ's Calvary, thus substantiating, substantiating the semantics of personal names associated with the biblical myth, if we, if we translate Mary, Jacob, Joseph, and so on in English. In his review of Neighbor's debut collection, and I'm wrapping up, uh, Stuffed Birds and Birds in Cages, literary critic and writer Guntis Berelis described the short story as failure, criticizing the illustrative use of the Bible myth. And here is the uh, longer quote. It is just a myth play at the level of its external attributes. The allusions are too ambiguous and transparent. The story illustrates the technique and diluting the evangelical allusions with the harsh realities seems more naive and comical than the comic grotesque of other stories by Neiburga. There is a rift between the ethical saturation of biblical legends and the empty message of the story, which could otherwise be closed by irony, but it is missing there, saved by metaphors, saved by the formation of a phrase, which has not been endured to the end. And the author writes with a tremendous scope, if summer is hot, then as hot as never before, if Yazeb loves Maria, then as closely as anyone, if the grandmother went mad, then as effectively as in the melodrama nor can a successful composition be denied. However, the story lacks the essential grain of truth without which the narrative does not turn into literature." End of the quote. And here the conclusion. For better, this literary notionality, uh, notional, uh, notionality was more critical in evaluate, evaluating the story than the pictured reality. Violence is neither naive nor comical. Neiburga has solved it uh, complicatedly enough, focusing on both the influence of the social environment and the influential pathology of the main character, while, while not getting bogged down in long and descriptive depictions of the psyche of the image. The value of the narrative is to be found in the hints, default events and image experiences in the composition. Nevertheless, there is a grain of truth when Berelis writes that the biblical myth has not been fully reconciled with the portrayal of a disadvantaged family. This, the particular value of the story can be found in the depiction of the masculine crisis of the period of stagnation, and it can be assessed only by the distance of time. Nevertheless, Another fact is significant. Neiburg's short stories often burst at the moment when the scream should follow. Instead, the readers find silence. <clears throat> this has, she has used this technique in later stories published in periodicals in the early 90s and the collection Storm Storm or Push Push, showing its inexhaustible possibilities. Thank you. Thank you, Janis, for your uh, in-depth analysis of Neiburg's short fiction. Now, before we go on to our next speaker, uh, I would like to remind the viewers once more to post your questions to the presenters uh, through Facebook or YouTube or by going to the Slido platform and entering the event code. Uh, Karlis Verdinsch is our final speaker today, concluding the first day uh, of the conference. Verdinsch is a poet and a PhD candidate at Washington University in St. Louis and a researcher at the Institute of Literature, Folklore and Art, University of Latvia. His scholarly interests include literature of Central and East Europe, modernism, gender and sexuality studies. Today, he will be presenting a paper called Women Writer as Horizontal Collaborator, the first Soviet Latvian novel, The Empty Pearl Oyster by Elga Bitte. Karli, the digital floor is yours. Thank you, Ivar. Um, good evening, everybody. In June 1940, when Regin Azer was nine years old, Baltic republics were invaded by the Soviet army. Pro-Soviet puppet governments replaced autocratic presidential regimes and the three countries became a part of the USSR. As Ep Annos points out, in the Baltic states, the Soviet takeover brought the destruction of a well-established national cultural sphere, unquote. After the occupation, drastic changes took place in the literary field, 
that was seen by the communists as an important tool to control the consciousness of the masses and spread the Marxist Leninist ideas. Private publishing houses and existing literary journals were shut down, pro Soviet literary editions were established, and Latin Writers Union was established as well to recruit the writers for working for communist purposes. The content of the fiction published in the mainstream editions changed drastically. The novels that often focused on love stories set in the countryside were replaced by early attempts in socialist realism by Latin writers, as well as translations of Soviet literature that told about fight for the rights of the working class in establishing Soviet power as the ultimate goal. On November 8, the most popular weekly magazine, Output, famous for its serialized fiction, started to run installments of a brand new novel titled The Empty Pearl Oyster by an unknown author, El Gabite. The work ran for 15 installments and ended rather abruptly on February 21. The protagonist of the novel, Aldoana, has become a part of the high society after her marriage to a high-ranking general of the Latvian army who was loyal to the president. The novel follows her wealthy lifestyle. It consists of opera premieres, luxurious dinners and visits to Paris for shopping. She is shown as a selfish schemer. However, her schemes are often quite irrational. For some reason, it is important to her to assault the president in public more than once, trying to hit his most vulnerable spot. Aldoan makes fun of his supposed queerness by provoking remarks upon meeting him in social situations and causing embarrassing moments. The author does not explain why the scheming social climber would need such confrontations if her and her husband's well-being depends on the president's benevolence. The president, who is constantly referred to as fatty, that's nice, gets characterized as queer. His, enter his entourage consists of conformist advisors who are de depicted as cruel villains who work hard to oppress people and always prepare new schemes to add to their personal material wealth. There is also a young, bespectacled assistant who is inseparable from the president also in his free time. He is depicted as an effeminate young man wearing a sky blue silk night dress. As both historical pieces of evidence and the public published text show, the author reworked the novel in the course of publication. To conform to the demands of Bolshevik ruler, rulers of literature, she had to balance, balance the scenes of her protagonist Aldona's luxurious lifestyle with chapters dedicated to the life of workers and farmhands, as well as the torture of political prisoners. According to the demands, simple people were depicted as leading miserable life under the wealthy bourgeoisie and farmers overseen by the ruthless authoritarian plutocratic regime. The novel ends with a triumphant scene of the Soviet occupation when the plutocratic government runs away in terror. At the same time, the people gather in the Riga city center to celebrate the appearance of Soviet tanks. The published text of the novel is fragmented and lacks narrative coherence. Most likely this effect is caused both by the author's lack of skills and also editorial cuts that skip the questionable scenes and made the novel much shorter. The unknown writer El Gabita was a pen name. Her real name was Vera Banag, and she was known as a journalist who wrote about fashion, romantic relationship and celebrity gossip for the newspaper Peda Yabridi, as well as magazines, Ice Coulisses and Magazine. In the years of the Great Depression, she supported herself by translations of popular literature including Edgar Wallace and Hedwig Kurtz Mahler. Her debut as a novelist was a surprise for literary Riga because of its pro-Bolshevik inclination. She stayed in Riga during the Nazi German occupation and the years of Soviet Latvia and worked as a translator from Russian in, and German. The translated authors included Soviet Russian writers Nikolai Zadorno and Vera Ketlinskaya, as well as the German writer Hans Fallada. As the writer Willis Lars registered in his diary in 1961, 
where Ivana has become mentally ill. She was not active until her death in 1982. In the interwar years, Vanag was known by her pen name Lady Diana, taken from the protagonist of the popular novel by the French writer Maurice de Cabra, The Madonna of the Sleeping Cars. She contributed articles and fictional stories for illustrated magazines and tabloid newspapers. Her first novel contained many elements she was familiar with, including the life of high society and fashion. She was rumored to be a close friend of Mrs. Balwadis, the wife of the high-ranking general uh, of the Latvian army. So her novel became an impossible mixture of cosmopolitan popular, popular fiction and socialist realism, where characters from different worlds and genres were lumped together against the background of the last years of the Republic of Latvia. In her attitude towards queerness, Bitta follows the traditional path of attributing it to the ruling classes employed by authors of different ideological leanings. What used to be the characterization of spoiled German aristocracy before the First World War now is seen as a feature of the authoritarian president of the country, characterized as plutocratic. As the novel's optimistic final scene of Soviet occupation of Riga city implies, workers and peasants will swipe away humanists and his perverted bourgeois government and replace their supposed queerness with the healthy morals and simple sexual politics of communists. After all, the novel was condemned by all involved sides. Pro-Bolshevik writers and critics were not convinced by the portrayal of the workers' class and were bored by the extended scenes of the bourgeois lifestyle. Nationalist writers were repelled by the treatment of humanists and his entourage as well as the Bolshevik pathos of the novel. The presence of queerness seems to bewilder all readers to the point that almost nobody dared to express any opinion about it, except some elusive comments. Some examples of queering the authoritarian president and his entourage. As Beta slash Vanaga writes, with a noble nonchalance, Aldona freely gave her hand to the president with a big, with a capital P. And then she made one more step higher. She did not give her hand to the secretary of president, a pale worn out boy with glasses. No, she just nodded lightly and looked in the space when the boy bowed. But he was introduced to her by the president himself. Aldona was so close to the president that without casting down her eyes, she could say smiling, what concerns the general, you ask him to get engaged first. It seemed to Alduana that the president is going to faint. So pale he became, but all that lasted only for a couple of seconds. She was one to turn away first and to go on with greetings. So on more than one occasion, she establishes relationship between president and his assistant as uh, like a man and his wife or a prostitute or something like that to make the president feel uncomfortable. This scene seems to be intended as proof of the protagonist's sharp and witty nature. However, it becomes one of the awkward scenes where the president gets humiliated in public. Another one scene. Uh, one of the characters uh, goes to some government institution for some paperwork to be done. At the secretariat, an official, sleek like a calf, in a pink shirt, perfumed like a high school girl, with a ring on his finger, decorated by a huge topaz, raised his eyebrows with spleen and looked again at Ivar's application form. Quote. So, and this novel is illustrated, so you can see those queer characters also uh, in pictures like this flamboyant official. And when the end is near and the president with his assistant are trying to hide their gold somewhere in the basement and dark aisles of the presidential castle, then uh, the scene is following. Also, Fatih himself and his private secretary, dressed in blue silk, 
walked around the newly renovated idols and chambers several times. The bespectacled secretary recited the late poet's verses, Edward Tvirza, on the magic of the night. It felt gloomy and extraordinary. Upstairs, Fatty was busy arranging dahlias and chrysanthemums in vases in the bedroom. When I'm among the flowers, I forget everything, he sighed sentimentally. So, Beta slash Vanaga renders her plutocratic president as physically robust and at the same time sentimental. The absence of women, women in his life is compensated with his effeminate entourage. And some contrasting scene at the end of the novel when plutocracy is crashed and the Soviet tanks have arrived, then we have this very short ending of the novel. Indeed, the power of the plutocracy was crushed. The grey blue red army tanks moved calmly but definitely and irresistibly, one after another from Padoga over the Iron Bridge, along the building of the prefecture, which, has, which was red as if stained with workers' blood, and past the station. They dispersed in the streets and boulevards of Riga and took their guard positions. Working people rejoiced. The crowds that filled the streets praised their liberators. Songs were here. Flowers appeared. The police with their horseshoes and their beating of the rubber sticks could no longer do anything. The city and the whole land were like an open prison. Fighters for freedom and happiness of the people suffocated in prisons for years were released and given to the new life. The working people greeted their liberators with exultation. This is the end of the novel, how it was printed in Atul. Vita's interpretation of the recent history of Latvia was aligned to the official explanations provided by the puppet government of Soviet Latvia. Writer Bill Slats, the Minister of the Interior of the Latvi La Soviet Latvia spoke at the sitting of the newly elected Saima on July 21, declaring the need for Latvia to be become a Soviet Republic. I quote him, for many years, the Latvian people were subject to a corrupt government. The clique of the enemies, oppressors and exploiters of the people relied on brute force and hiding behind false nationalism, wanted to rule against the will of the people leading the country to starvation and physical and economic destruction." Unquote. Characterizations in Bites slash Vanagas novel are faithful to this official standpoint of the Bolsheviks. The name of Vilks Lats appears in Vanagas biography several times. Lugwans Bersons in 19, uh, 2016 even suggested that the similarities between the empty pearl oyster and the storm but uh, the novel by Bill Slats are striking, especially their scenes of the Soviet occupation of Riga in 1940. Uh, so basically, uh, he suggests that Bill Slats and Vita Slashvanaga could be somehow collaborating, but he, he doesn't say how exactly. Um, an article published in 1951 in the Latvian exam newspaper Latvivarts tells about the unknown struggles behind the publication of the novel. Some comrade Wiltzing has threatened to stop the publication of the text uh, after the first installments, and the author has responded with a long letter taking pain explaining her political stand. The article quotes the letter's full text, including the author's explanation of her artistic choices and her readiness to edit her novel to satisfy the Bolshevik demands. And I quote the article uh, published in the Exile newspaper. It was precisely the first of the sad anniversaries of our state independence, November 18, 1940, when each Latvian deeply suffered the humiliation brought upon our nation, that saw this woman running to literary administration to boast about giving herself to the great comrades. I am at your service. She was eager to commit her pen to all kinds of snaring she would be asked to. Immediately after the expulsion of the Bolsheviks from Riga, this explanation by the author of Pearl Oyster, along with some other Cheka documents, 
was intercepted by Latvian soldiers and given to a Latvian security institution. The rider turned out to have remained in the rig. What to do with her? Transferring her to the relevant German authorities would subject her to their short process, uh, death penalty. That would be firstly against general principles of this Latvian institution, and secondly, what, who, what would have been achieved then? Because who was this woman? No matter how we call her, just an opportunist communist. She is the victim of her weakness and the calamity that has fallen up, upon our nation. The Latvian institution confined itself to calling the woman to, to their office and re releasing her after shaming. Let her become a better person, if she can. Later, we hear that she was getting along with the new Soviet order very well." Unquote. The article is full of coprophilic and sexualized characterizations of Dita. It associates her writing with excrements, thus projecting the dirty content of her novel on the other. The woman who wrote about her former government as a bunch of filthy homosexuals could be only a dirtbag herself. The employment of imagery of dirt echoes the first widely publicized homosexual scandal in Germany before the First World War. Latvian periodicals treated it as a dirty story and saw its exposure to the whole world as even worse than queer practices at Wilhelm's court themselves. This act of collabor collaborationism is interpreted as giving herself to communists, which means an act of deliberate and explainable prostitution. Horizontal collaborators or sentimental collaborators are terms used to accuse French women who had intimate relations with the Nazi German army members. This derogatory term referred mainly to those who in groups had socialized with the Germans or had publicly consorted with them or whose relations with, with them had been of a professional or commercial nature. After the liberation of France, the purge of horizontal collaborators took place when their public slut shaming included the head shaving of their heads. No similar actions took place in Latvia after the first Soviet occupation year. However, the publication of the empty pearl oyster and the consequences its author felt can be viewed as symbolic horizontal collaboration and the punishment for it was also symbolic. Bites Vanagas novel did get some publicity in other exile publications by her, her contemporaries in the West. Symbolic punishment continued in several autobiographical works published in exile during the Cold War with references to the novel. And here you see uh, covers of the books by Alfred Zilliums, uh, Anschlaus Eglitz, uh, uh, Alders Liepinch and Egils Hermansons and also a uh, cover of uh, the book by Adolf Staltz, a uh, Soviet Latvian writer. In Soviet Latvia, the mentions of the novel were scarce and did not extend to lengthy characterizations of the text or its author. As Beatus' case shows, the figure of a woman collaborator enters the cultural memory on different terms than her male counter counterparts. For example, Latvian writers Vilis Slats and Andres Upitz were well-known fiction authors before the Soviet occupation and became influential representatives of socialist realism under Stalin. Their collaboration is usually explained by their leftist leaning before the occupation, careerism or fear of repression. Upitis' novel Zindi Riga, which succeeded Tuksha Perlana in Atputa, and Lazis' novel Vatra addressed the same historical period as Bita's novel and their view on the Republic of Latvia was equally condemning. However, their moral purity, sanity or sexuality was not questioned the same way as the amateurish bit, whose unlikely debut as a novelist was conceptualized as an assemblage of crimes ranging from high treason to prostitution and defamation of her nation. The novel was published at the very beginning of the Soviet era in Latvia and it played by the rules that all sides were still learning to obey. The depictions of high society, fashion, and queerness were su supported in the literature, were still, I'm sorry, were supported in the literature, neither under the authoritarian regime of Ulmanis, 
nor under Stalinist totalitarianism in the USSR. Speculations about women's homosexuality were taking place at least from the 1920s. However, Bites Vanagas' novel was the first literary work in a major popular magazine that made those speculations public. And it happened only a few months after Ulman's arrest and deportation to Russia, where he died in 1942. The novel is an intersection of the cosmopolitan popular novel and socialist realism. Its conception was changed in the course of the publication and the result did not satisfy anybody. At the same time, the, the novel is evidence of a historical moment when queerness was suddenly exposed to the general public of the new Soviet Republic of Latvia, becoming the metaphor of the 60-year-long authoritarian regime of Karls Ullmanns. Thank you very much. Thank you, Karls, for your uh, engaging paper. Uh, now, at this point, we turn to see if there are any uh, questions posted for our presenters. And the first one uh, I see that came up was for Tums, uh, dealing with how we translate the glass ceiling and ceiling of glasses. So the question is in Latvian. So how would you comment the hmm. difference between the glass ceiling and the ceiling of glasses? Tums, please. The glass is made of glasses. <laughs> Uh, or glass, yes, glass is made of glass. Uh, I especially use this word play that's in English, uh, where you see um, uh, both meanings. One meaning is this uh, traditional proverbial meaning about glass ceiling that women cannot cross to, to higher ranks. And the other one is uh, about glasses, about this um, drinking culture, cultural norms that reinforces this proverbial glass ceilings because of the ways how uh, society was organized and how was uh, exchange of uh, influence and uh, information and solidarities organized. Thank you, Tom. So I guess the wordplay gets lost if we translate it uh, into Latvian because uh, glass and glasses uh, do not... Uh, resonate with each other the same way in Latvian as they do in English. It, it would go well in late 19th century where it was the same board. Oh, okay. <laughs> now, uh, the next question we have uh, is for Janis. Could you comment on the link between masculine violence and or fragility and possible mental disability in this or other Neiborga stories? Uh, yes, thank you for the question. Uh, I would say that I came upon this idea to uh, analyze masculinity in uh, Andra Neiborg's short stories because of the male um, critics uh, yeah, that, that wrote quite a harsh critique about her male characters in her short stories, especially Arno Jund and Dinis Evans, and also actually Guntis Berelis in some cases as well. And, uh, and I thought, well, it's very interesting why, do, why they uh, don't like these characters. And I, and I found out that they are not like representing stereotypes, what is to be a man, because part of these characters, um, some of these characters, or I would say even half of them is very sensitive disabled, um, a lot of like, and uh, have some feminine qualities. And then I understood that actually those are very complicated cases where uh, the author herself includes something from her femininity and thinks of the, uh, you know, some fragile masculine uh, models as well. Um, so this would be the one, um, I would say uh, one block uh, that I, I discovered is very interesting, and I would this uh, I would say that this is why this fragility and and um, comes into that because she she looks uh, on these characters from her point of view, and then uh, of course she have uh, she has a lot of um, stories where the, the female characters are uh, in the very center and. Um, there are quite a lot of articles about them. So I thought that I, would, I won't take this part. I will look at this um, 
masculinity part. And then I understood uh, while reading this, um, what I quoted, a uh, critique from um, Guntis Berlis. Actually, it's, I, I would say, one of the best reviews uh, on her uh, books. And it, it was about a, a debut collection. Uh, actually, of uh, about the other stories, he had said a lot of good things. It's just this one particular story that he didn't like. And I thought, well, it's interesting why you don't like this story. Uh, and, and I started to dig in. And of course, he sees this um, first layer of the biblical myth and, and doesn't look on this social reality because Berelis, as a postmodern writer, he's more interested into Neiburga's stories that are on the same side, so not the social reality. So that, that's why this critique maybe is um, a bit harsh. Um, yeah, and, this, and the third line is when we see female characters and male characters, and there is also female masculinity in her short stories as well. So, I mean, I lately found out that actually the masculinity is a perspective uh, that shows the complexity of Neiborg's characters, and, and it's more interesting to look at them from this side. And Yes, this is why where this fragility, uh, fragility comes into from her side. And I would say this um, violence side, it, it comes from her fear. She usually says uh, in her diaries as well that she fears something. And I quote it, she fears violence, she fears illness. And so she writes about that. She writes about her dreams. She uses also when she has a, a dream and then she writes a short story using that. So I would say it's uh, it's fear and and femininity, let's say like that at this point. Right, and also to continue the question, uh, I understand from your work that it is also interesting to look at Neiburg's short stories, not only from, not only in terms of masculinity, but also in terms of disability studies. Would that would... Uh, yes, I, I actually, this is uh, uh, a topic I uh, should elaborate more. I have done some analysis, but within the framework of masculinity. But actually, this is a, se a separate topic because there are a lot of characters with disability and they are almost all of them are men. And even in the first, uh, her debut story, uh, The Sun Was Shining, let me translate it like that. Uh, this is the first time where already in the first uh, short story, there is a disabled character appearing. And, and it's interesting that it goes through her, through her work till the very end. Yeah, so, th so, so this is a topic I will still work on, definitely. Thank you, Yanis. Now we have two questions uh, that are addressed to all speakers. The first question is, did the st stereotypes and notions of femininity and masculinity change over the Soviet period? If yes, what contributed to it? So we may perhaps start this time with Carlis. Uh, what would be your answer? Yeah. Thank you for this question. I think we could uh, write a doctoral thesis on it. I mean, there were very many uh, factors uh, that influenced uh, these uh, receptions of uh, femininity and masculinity. For example, uh, abortions were prohibited for some period in Stalin's time because the Soviet state needed new citizens and after some years uh, they were permitted again uh, in the in the late uh, 60s uh, people started to talk about the crisis of masculinity and started to think what should be done and paradoxically uh, many articles uh, that addressed the problem uh, concluded that actually women are to blame for this crisis of masculinity because women are probably not very good mothers, not very good wives. They try to dominate, they work too much, they are too, you know, too pushy, whatever. So, uh, uh, man was the problematic sex, but all the responsibility was imagined to to like women were somehow responsible for 
everything. Um, yeah, but uh, I mean, this is a really, really wide question, and I, I'm, I'm, I cannot answer all of it, unfortunately. Right, I absolutely agree. So perhaps we could rephrase the question uh, to sh um, uh, not widen, but but uh, do the opposite, uh, and ask. Uh, perhaps you could give us an example of of a stereotype that did go through a, a significant change during the uh, Soviet period. Uh, could you think of some kind of uh, uh, a notion about femininity or masculinity that changed uh, significantly um, and, and, and give us an example? Uh, does anything come uh, to mind? Uh, it, it comes to my mind that I think Jan Buchholz um, several years ago had an interesting article on the Soviet Latvian masculinity. I think uh, there were some particular types of men valorized as the best kinds of men, like uh, the soldier in the Soviet army or uh, what else, like working class man or these types, they were like, they were pretty persistent, but they were also changing. And this masculinity gradually shifted from more tough uh, to like more kind of mild, milder intellectual type of masculinity. But it took uh, several decades to change. Thank you, Carlos Janis and Tuoms. Do you have anything to add at this point? Maybe Tuoms and then I will add something. Okay. I think uh, Carlos is very wrong. Uh, one doctoral dissertation wouldn't cover this uh, change. Uh, uh, I'd say that the, um, this hegemonic image of female and male um, prototypes changed in, uh, in de every decade or even uh, in shorter periods of time. And uh, the factors contributing to it were uh, very... Um, let's say um, many factors were contributing to it. Uh, changes in economy, in structure of society, in uh, level of education and so on and so on. Uh, I think uh, I've, I've been most researching masculinity of Soviet times and uh, there I think we can see very uh, clear this um, mm evolution, not evolution, but change from um, soldier in 40s and early 50s uh, to uh, worker or let's say modern worker, not just a Canavite in uh, 50s, 60s and then uh, in 60s, 70s it became uh, intellectual or educated worker or uh, maybe young consumer member and then in uh, 70s 80s there are um, let's say competing uh, hegemonic masculinities of, of different kinds for uh, different social strata where one is this uh, nomenclature driving in vogue and uh, one is still worker, one is a polar explorer in this Soviet romanticist paradigm, and uh, also appear some alternative masculinities like uh, hippies who were ex excluded from, from the main discourse. So it's going on and on, and there are both uh, large structural factors impacting it and also uh, cultural flows and uh, ebbs and so. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Tom's and uh, Janis, you want uh, to? Yes, I will, um, I will just add that actually we can't talk about like masculinity as in one thing as from Raven Kono, as, as she noted, we have s several masculinities exi existing at once. Um, uh, but uh, actually, I could um, answer to the speaker that there is there are some good articles about this uh, topic, and uh, one of them that uh, came for, as a first to my mind is an article by Elena Zdramovislova and Anna Tjomkina, 
uh, that is published in Russian Studies and History, and it is called The Crisis of Masculinity in Late Soviet Discourse. It, it's quite a good article. It's very uh, much quoted in uh, almost everywhere where it's written about the Soviet uh, masculinity, and they just divide uh, like four big groups, four big types, let's say like that, of masculinity starting from this uh, veteran, soldier, veteran, and then going till the uh, collapse of the Soviet Union. And uh, so it's not only about this, um, as the title of the article says, late Soviet discourse, it's actually covering almost like 50 years. And uh, I think there are some uh, some good ideas about the stereotypes that changes through the time. And of course, at the end, the collapse uh, happens because when the um, capitalist uh, uh, ideas come in um, uh, after the collapse of Soviet Union, it's like uh, the men are not ready to accept them. And it, this is one of the things that Neiburg writes about as well, that they are not like ready to accept, they're just confused. What is next? Well, that these values that have been for so many years are like disappeared somehow. Thank you, Yanis. Yes, I hope that uh, your uh, you, the the article you mentioned uh, will uh, illuminate uh, some of the aspects that uh, the person who asked the question wanted to know. Um, before we wrap up, uh, because we're running out of time, uh, one final question from the public, uh, which was uh, about. Uh, giving a concrete example of a literary text or a work of art that exemplifies the discourse of feminism in Soviet Latvia. So could you think of some literary work or, or just a, a, a text of art that exemplifies the discourse of feminism in Soviet Latvia? What would be your examples? Does anything come to mind? Yes, please. Um, I see it as a very loaded question uh, because of this. Uh, was there a feminism in Soviet Latvia? And was this the official version of uh, gender order, which stated equality or some alternative version or uh, reception of Western feminism or so? Uh, it's uh, perhaps too complicated. Uh, but if we can reduce it uh, to artwork of a woman in um, a leading uh, position, woman holding authority and using for uh, inspiration for images of her artwork, um, also a woman, then uh, I would say those are works of um, Gemma Skolme especially uh, the folk song, uh, it's 1968 or 1969, with, uh, with a folk maiden, which comments on um, kind of global issues on uh, Prague, uh, Prague, spring of, uh, of 1968 and the uh, intervention of Soviet Union in Czechoslovakia through uh, this ethnographic national female imagery. Thank you, Tums. Yes, and let's hear uh, from uh, Carlos and Yanis uh, before before we say goodbye. Um, yeah, thank you, Tuom. I think it was a very good choice for some reason. Uh, some women in Latvian national folk costumes uh, come to mind when we speak about uh, femininity in that period because Ethnography was one field where people try to escape from the everyday life uh, in the Soviet Union and uh, imagining herself as a Tautumaita national folk maid. That was one scenario for the Soviet Latvian woman how to cope with the reality. I thought that Carlos will tell something about um, feminism without feminism idea uh, during the Soviet period. But I, I would actually mention the, our, he, our hero of this conference, Regina Azara. Of course, it's not like a direct feminism, not at all. 
But there are a lot of uh, issues going on in her in her novels, and uh, uh, I suppose that she could do that as being a notable writer. Uh, write about that. Some of them um, making some social critique, not like it's the main thing she wants to do that in her work. But anyway, it it just happened, and. Um, I would I would stay with Regi Nazar at the moment uh, from the writers if if Tom's chosen and visual artist that I would mention Regi Nazar. Thank you very much, Yanis, and I think that is a very well moment to end our discussion. We are we have been talking for twenty uh, minutes, which was the time allotted uh, to us for uh, our discussion. Uh, mentioning Regina Azara then uh, should be our conclusion to the conference Regina Azara and uh, Eastern European Literature for the first day of the conference. Everyone who's tuning in, remember to join us tomorrow when the conference uh, will go on uh, virtually, digitally on the same platforms uh, as today. Uh, all that is left uh, now is for me to thank Janis Rosolinch, Karl Svedinch and Tuam Stensis for uh, our final session. Uh, thank you to everyone who's organizing uh, the conference and uh, from us uh, at this moment. Uh, that is it. Have a good evening. Thank you. Thank you. Peace.